Section 13 of Woman in Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ralph Kerwin. Woman in Science by John Augustine Zom. Chapter 5 Women in Physics. Physics being one of the inductive sciences, received little attention until modern times. True, the Greeks were familiar with some of the fundamental facts of the mechanics of solids and fluids, and had some notions respecting the various physical forces, but their knowledge of what until recently was known as natural philosophy was extremely limited. Aristotle, Pythagoras, and Archimedes were among the most successful investigators of their time, respecting the laws and properties of matter, and contributed materially to the advancement of knowledge regarding the phenomena of the material universe. But the sum total of their information of what we now know as physics could be embodied in a few pages. In view of the foregoing facts, we should not expect to find women engaged in the study, much less in the teaching, of physical science during ancient times. And yet, if we are to credit Boccaccio, who bases his statements on those of early Greek writers, there was at least one woman that won distinction by her knowledge of natural philosophy as early as the days of Socrates. In his work, De Laudibus Mulierum, which treats of the achievements of some of the illustrious representatives of the gentler sex, the genial author of the Decameron gives special praise to one Arete of Cyrene for the breadth and variety of her attainments. She was the daughter of Aristippus, the founder of the Cyrenaic school of philosophy, and is represented as being a veritable prodigy of learning. For among her many claims to distinction, she is said to have publicly taught natural and moral philosophy in the schools and academies of Attica for thirty-five years, to have written forty books, and to have counted among her pupils one hundred and ten philosophers. She was so highly esteemed by her countrymen that they inscribed on her tomb an epitaph which declared that she was the splendor of Greece and possessed the beauty of Helen, the virtue of Terma, the pen of Aristippus, the soul of Socrates, and the tongue of Homer. This is high praise indeed, but when we recollect that Arete lived during the golden age of Greek learning and culture that she had exceptional opportunities of acquiring knowledge in every department of intellectual effort. When we recall the large number of women who in their time distinguished themselves by their learning and accomplishment, and reflect on the advantages they enjoyed as pupils of the ablest teachers of the Lyceum, the Portico, and the Academy, when we remember further that they lived in an atmosphere of intelligence such as has since been unknown, when we call to mind the signal success that rewarded the pursuit of knowledge by the scores of women mentioned in Ateneus and other Greek writers, when we peruse the fragmentary notices of their achievements as recorded in the pages of more recent investigators regarding the educational facilities of a certain class of women living in Athens and the eminence which they attained in science, philosophy, and literature, we can realize that the character and amount of Arete's work as an author and as a teacher have not been overestimated. Living in an age of prodigious mental activity, when women as well as men were actuated by an abiding love of knowledge for its own sake, there is nothing surprising in finding a woman like Arete commanding the admiration of her countrymen by her learning and eloquence. For was not the learned and eloquent Aspasia her contemporary, and did not Teano, the wife of Pythagoras, take charge of her husband's school after his death? And does not antiquity credit her with being not only a successful teacher of philosophy, but also a writer of books of recognized value? Such being the case, what is there incredible in the statements made by ancient writers regarding the literary activity of Arete, and about her eminence as a teacher of science and philosophy? She was but one of many of the Greek women of her age that won renown by their gifts of intellect and by their contributions to the educational work of their time and country better known than Arete, but probably not superior to her as a teacher or writer, was the illustrious Hypatia of Alexandria. She too, like her distinguished predecessor in Athens, was an instructor in natural philosophy as well as in other branches of science. 
Of her we know more than we do of the daughter of Aristippus, but even our knowledge of the acquisitions and achievements of Hypatia is, unfortunately, extremely meager. We do, however, know from the historian Socrates, and from Synesius, bishop of Ptolemaeus, who was her pupil, that she was one of the most richly dowered women of all time. Born and educated in Alexandria when its schools and scholars were the most celebrated in the world, she was even at an early age regarded as a marvel of learning, for, not satisfied with excelling her father Theon in mathematics, of which he was a distinguished professor, she, as Suidas informs us, devoted herself to the study of philosophy with such success that she was soon regarded as the ablest living exponent of the doctrines of Plato and Aristotle. Her knowledge, writes the historian Socrates, was so great that she far surpassed all the philosophers of her time, and succeeding Plotinus in the Platonic school which he had founded in the city of Alexandria, she taught all of the branches of philosophy with such signal success that students flocked to her in crowds from all parts. Her home, as well as her lecture room, was the resort of the most noted scholars of the day, and was, with the exception of the library and the museum, the most frequented intellectual center of the great city of learning and culture. Small wonder, then, that her contemporaries lauded her as an oracle, and as the most brilliant luminary in Alexandria's splendid galaxy of thinkers and scholars. Sapientis artis sidus integerimum. Among the many inventions attributed to Hypatia, besides the planisphere and the astrolabe, which she designed for the use of astronomers, are several employed in the study of natural philosophy. Probably the most useful of these is an areometer mentioned by her pupil Synesius. He calls it a hydroscope and describes it as having the form and size of a flute and graduated in such wise that it can be used for determining the density of liquids. That Hypatia was thoroughly familiar with the science of natural philosophy as then known, there can be no doubt. That she also contributed materially to its advancement, as well as to that of astronomy, in which she always exhibited a special interest, there is every reason to believe. After the death of Hypatia, the study of natural philosophy was almost entirely neglected for more than a thousand years. The first woman in modern times to attract attention by her discussion of physical problems was the famous Marquise du Chatelet, although she was better known as a mathematician and as the translator into French of Newton's Principia. In her chateau at Cirey, she had a well-equipped physical cabinet in which she took special delight. But in her time, as in that of Hypatia, natural philosophy was far from being the broad experimental science which it has become through the marvelous discoveries made in heat, light, electricity, and magnetism during the last hundred years, as well as through those countless brilliant investigations which have led up to our present doctrine of the correlation and conservation of the various physical forces. There was then no occasion for those delicate instruments of precision which are now found in every physical laboratory by means of which the man of science is able to investigate phenomena and determine laws that were quite unknown until a few years ago. In the time of Madame du Châtelet, as during the century following, natural philosophy consisted rather in the mechanical and mathematical than in the physical study of nature. This is illustrated by the title of the great work on the translation of which she spent the best years of her life, Newton's immortal Philosophioi Naturales Principia Mathematica. The Marquise's first scientific work was an investigation regarding the nature of fire. The French Academy of Sciences had offered a prize for the best memoir on the subject. Among the contestants for the coveted honor were the Châtelaine of Cire and the celebrated Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. The Marquise was unsuccessful in the contest, but her paper was of such value that the eminent physicist and astronomer, Arago, was able to characterize it as an elegant piece of work, embracing all the facts relating to the subject then known to science, and containing among the experiments suggested one which proved so fecund in the hands of Herschel. In this remarkable memoir sur le feu, which is printed in the collections of the Academy, the Marquise anticipates the results of subsequent researches of others, 
by maintaining that both heat and light have the same cause, or, as we should now say, are both modes of motion. The second book written by this remarkable woman is entitled Institution de Physique, and was dedicated to her son, for whose benefit it was primarily written. It deals specifically with the philosophy of Leibniz and discusses such questions as force, time, and space. Her views respecting the nature of the force, called vis viva, which was much discussed in her time, are of particular interest, as they are not only opposed to those which were held by Descartes and Newton, but also because they are in essential accord with those now accepted in the world of science. All things considered, the Marquise du Châtelet deservedly takes high rank in the history of mathematical physics. In this department of science she has had few, if any, superiors among her own sex. And when we recollect that she labored while the foundations of dynamics were still being laid, we shall more readily appreciate the difficulties she had to contend with and the distinct service which her researches and writings rendered to the cause of natural philosophy among her contemporaries. The first woman to occupy a chair of physics in a university was the famous daughter of Italy, Laura Maria Caterina Bassi. She was born in Bologna in 1711, but five years after the birth of Madame du Châtelet, and from her most tender years she exhibited an exceptional facility for the acquisition of knowledge. After she had, through the assistance of excellent masters, become proficient in French and Latin, she took up the study of logic, metaphysics, and natural philosophy. In all these branches of learning her progress was so rapid that it far exceeded the fondest expectations of her parents and teachers. Thanks to a wonderful memory and a highly developed reasoning faculty, she was able, while still a young maiden, to prove herself the possessor of knowledge that is ordinarily obtained only in the maturity of age and after long years of systematic study. When she had attained the twenty-first year of her age, she was induced by her family and friends, much against her own inclination, however, to take part in a public disputation on philosophy. Her entering the lists against some of the most distinguished scholars of the time was made the occasion for an unusual demonstration in her honor. The hall of the university in which such intellectual jousts were generally held was too small for the multitude that was eager to witness the young girl's formal appearance among the scholars and the notables of the old university city. It was accordingly arranged that the disputation should be held in the great hall of the public palace of the senators. Among the vast assemblage present at the disputation were Cardinal Grimaldi, the papal legate, Cardinal Archbishop Lambertini, afterwards Pope Benedict XIV, the Gonfalonier, senators, literati from far and near, leading members of the nobility, and representatives of all the religious orders. When the argumentation began, the young girl found herself pitted against five of the most distinguished scholars of Bologna, but she was fully equal to the occasion and passed the ordeal to which she was subjected in a manner that excited the admiration and won the plaudits of all present. Cardinal Lambertini was so impressed with the brilliant defense which she had made against the five trained dialecticians and the evidence she gave of varied and profound learning that he paid her a special visit the next day in her own home to renew his congratulations on her signal triumph and to encourage her to continue the prosecution of her studies. In less than a month after this interesting event, Laura Bassi, in response to the express desire of the whole of Bologna, presented herself as a candidate for the doctorate in philosophy. This was the occasion for a still more brilliant and imposing ceremony. It was held in the spacious Hall of Hercules in the communal palace, which was magnificently decorated for the splendid function. In addition to the distinguished personages who had been spectators of the fair student's triumph a few weeks before, there was present in the vast audience the noted French ecclesiastic, Cardinal Polignac, who was on his way from Rome to France. The heroine of the hour, dressed in a black gown, was ushered into the great hall, preceded by two college beadles, and accompanied by two of the most prominent ladies of the Bolognese nobility. She was given a seat between the chancellor and the prior of the university, 
who, in turn, were flanked by the professors and officials of the institution. After the usual preliminaries of the function were over, the prior of the university, Dr. Bazzani, rose and pronounced an eloquent discourse in Latin, to which Laura made a suitable response in the same language. She was then crowned with a laurel wreath exquisitely wrought in silver, and had thrown round her the huayo, or university gown, both symbols of the doctorate. After this, the young doctor proceeded to where the three cardinals were seated, and, in delicately chosen words, also in Latin, expressed to them her thanks for the honor of their presence. All then withdrew to the apartments of the gonfalonier, where refreshments were served in sumptuous style, after which the young laureata, accompanied by a numerous cortege and applauded by the entire city, was escorted to her home. So profound was the impression made on the university senate by the deep erudition of Laura Bassi that it was eager to secure her services in its teaching body. But before she could be offered a chair in that institution, long-established custom required that she should pass a public examination on the subject matter which she was to teach. Five examiners were chosen by lot, and all of them proved to be men whose names, says Fantuzzi, will always be held by our university in glorious remembrance. They had all to promise under oath that the candidate for the chair should have no knowledge before the examination of the questions which were to be asked, and that the test of the aspirant's qualifications to fill the position sought should be absolutely free from any suspicion of favoritism or partiality. Notwithstanding the difficulties she had to confront, Laura acquitted herself with even greater credit than on former occasions of a similar character. There was no question in the mind of anyone present at the examination of the candidate's ability to fill the chair of physics, and it was, accordingly, offered her by acclamation. The first public lecture of the gifted young dottoressa was made the occasion of a demonstration such as the old walls of the university had rarely witnessed. Her lecture room was thronged by the elite of the city, as well as by a large class of enthusiastic students. All were charmed by her eloquence and amazed at the complete mastery she evinced of the subject she had selected for discussion. From that day forth, her reputation as a scholar and a teacher was established, and her lectures were attended by appreciative students from all parts of Europe. She was especially popular with the students from Greece, Germany, and Poland, and her popularity, far from waning, waxed greater with the passing years. At the time of Laura's entering upon her professional career, the Senate of Bologna had a medal coined in her honor, on the obverse of which was her name and effigy, while on the reverse there was an image of Minerva, with the inscription, Soli qui fas vidice Minervam. Far from interrupting her studies, which had hitherto been the joy of her life, Laura's university work gave new zest to the literary and scientific pursuits which had always such a fascination for her. Among the subjects that specially engaged her attention were studies so diverse as Greek and the higher mathematics. She was particularly interested in the great physico-mathematical work of Newton, and did not rest until she had thoroughly mastered the contents of his epic-making Principia. A few years after she had become a member of the university faculty, Laura was a European celebrity and no one eminent by learning or birth passed through Bologna without availing himself of the opportunity of making the acquaintance of so extraordinary a woman. Men of science and letters vied with princes and emperors in doing honor to one who was looked upon by many as being, like Arete of old, endowed with a soul and a genius far above that of ordinary mortals, and as being the possessor of a talent that indicated something superhuman. Laura Bassi was in constant correspondence with the most celebrated scholars of Europe, and more especially with those who had attained eminence in her special line of work. Among the letters received from her illustrious correspondence were two from Voltaire. They were written shortly after the author had been refused admittance into the French Academy. He then bethought himself of securing membership in the Academy of Sciences of Bologna. This, he reasoned, would be a splendid tribute to the versatility of his genius, and would at the same time be a biting satire on the demigods of French literature, who had dared to exclude him from their society. That he might not meet the same refusal on the part of the Academy of Bologna as he had experienced in Paris, 
Voltaire determined not to rely entirely on the goodwill of the male members of the Bolognese Academy. He accordingly resolved to enlist the services of Laura Bassi, who was one of the leading members of this distinguished body, and to trust to her influence on his behalf on the hearts of her colleagues. The first letter, written in Italian, is so characteristic of the writer that it will bear reproduction. Most illustrious lady, he writes from Paris, the 23rd of November, 1744, I have been wishing to journey to Bologna in order to be able one day to tell my countrymen I have seen Signora Bassi, but being deprived of this honor, let it at least be permitted me to place at your feet this philosophic homage, and to salute the honor of her age and of women. There is not a Bassi in London, and I should be more happy to be a member of the Academy of Bologna than that of the English, although it has produced a Newton. If your protection should obtain for me this title, of which I am so ambitious, the gratitude of my heart will be equal to my admiration for yourself. I beg you to excuse the style of a foreigner who presumes to write you in Italian, but who is as great an admirer of yours as if you were born in Bologna. The second letter of Voltaire is in response to one received from Laura Bassi, announcing that he had been elected to membership in the Bologna Academy. The first sentence of it suffices to indicate its tenor. Nothing, he writes, was ever more grateful to me than to receive from your hand the first advice that I had the honor, by means of your favor, of being united by this new link to one who has already bound me to her car by all the chains of esteem and admiration. Like so many of her gifted sisters of sunny Italy, Laura was in every way a perfect woman nobly planned. Of a deeply religious nature, she was as pious as she was intelligent, and was throughout her life the devoted friend of the poor and the afflicted. The mother of twelve children, she never permitted her scientific and literary work to conflict with her domestic duties, or to detract in the least from the singular affection which so closely united her to her husband and children. She was as much at home with the needle and the spindle as she was with her books and the apparatus of her laboratory, and she was equally admirable whether superintending her household, looking after her children, entertaining the great and the learned of the world, or in holding the rapt attention of her students in the lecture room. She was indeed a living proof that higher education is not incompatible with woman's natural avocations, and that cerebral development does not lead to race suicide, and all the other dire results attributed to it by a certain class of our modern sociologists and anti-feminists. Considering her manifold duties as a professor in the university and the mother of a large family, it was scarcely to be expected that Laura Bossi would have much time for writing for the press. She was, however, able to devote some of her leisure moments to the cultivation of the muses, of whom, Fantuzzi informs us, she was a favorite. Her verses, as well as her contributions to the science of physics, are scattered through various publications, but they suffice to show that the accounts of her transmitted to us by her contemporaries are not exaggerated. Two of her Latin dissertations on certain physical problems were published in the commentaries of the Bologna Institute. One of them is entitled De Problemate Quodam Mechanico, the other De Problemate Quodam Hydrometrico. Many of her lectures on physics still exist in manuscript, and it is to be hoped that at least the titles of them may be given in a biography of the learned author, which has been long desired and long promised. A learned French traveler who visited Laura in Bologna describes her as having a face that was sweet, serious, and modest. Her eyes were dark and sparkling, and she was blessed with a powerful memory, a solid judgment, and a ready imagination. She conversed fluently with me in Latin for an hour with grace and precision. She is very proficient in metaphysics, but she prefers modern physics, particularly that of Newton. How many of our college women of today could readily carry on a conversation in Latin, if this were the sole medium of communication, or discuss the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle in the tongue of Cicero, or give public lectures on the physico-mathematical discoveries of Descartes and Newton in what was the universal language of the learned world? 
even less than a century ago. It must not, however, be inferred from the foregoing statements regarding the great intellectual capacity of Laura Bossi or the enthusiastic demonstrations that were so frequently made in her honor that she was unique in this respect among her countrywomen. Special attention has been called to her as a type of the larger number of her sex who, by their learning and culture, graced the courts and honored the universities of her country for full ten centuries. Scarcely had death removed Laura Bassi from a career in which for twenty-eight years she had won the plaudits of the whole of Europe when the University of Bologna welcomed to its learned halls two other women who, in their respective lines of research, were fully as eminent as their departed countrywoman. These were Maria Dalla Donna, for whom Napoleon established a chair of obstetrics, and Clotilde Tambroni, a famous professor of Greek of whom a noted Hellenist declared, only three persons in Europe are able to write Greek as well as she does, and not more than fifteen are able to understand her. Burckhardt, in his thoughtful work on the culture of the Italian Renaissance, has a paragraph which expresses in a few words what was always the attitude of the Italian father toward the education of his daughter. The education of the woman of the upper class was absolutely the same as that of the man. The Italian of the Renaissance did not for a moment hesitate to give his son and daughter the same literary and philosophical training. He considered the knowledge of the works of antiquity life's greatest good, and he could not, therefore, deny to woman participation in such knowledge. Hence the perfection attained by the daughters of noble families in writing and speaking Latin. This attitude of the members of the nobility toward the education of their daughters was essentially the same as that of the universities of Italy toward women who had a thirst for knowledge. For from the dawn of learning in Salerno to the present, there never was a time when women were not as cordially welcomed to the universities as students and professors as were the men, and never a time when the merit of intellectual work was not determined without regard to sex. In Bologna, where were passed the sixty-seven years of her mortal life, the name of Laura Bassi, like that of her illustrious colleague, Luigi Galvani, is one to conjure with, and a name that is still pronounced with respect and reverence. Her last resting place is the Church of Corpus Domini, the same sacred shrine in which were deposited all that was mortal of the renowned discoverer of galvanic electricity. Two years after Signora Bassi was gathered to her father's, there was born near Edinburgh to a Scotch admiral, Sir William George Fairfax, an infant daughter who was destined to shed as much luster on her sex in the British Isles as the incomparable Laura Bassi had diffused on womankind in Italy during her brilliant career in Bologna, the learned. She is known in the annals of science as Mary Somerville, and was in every way a worthy successor of her famous sister in Italy, both as a woman and as a votary of science. Although her chief title to fame is her notable work in mathematical astronomy, especially her translation of Laplace's Mécanique Celeste, she is likewise to be accorded a prominent place among scientific investigators for her contributions to physics and cognate branches of knowledge. Chief among these are her works on the connection of the physical sciences, and physical geography. As to the last production, no less an authority than Alexander von Humboldt pronounced it an exact and admirable treatise, and wrote of it as that excellent work which has charmed and instructed me since its first appearance. In a letter from the illustrious German savant to the gifted authoress of the last two named volumes occurs the following paragraph. To the great superiority you possess and which has so nobly illustrated your name on the high regions of mathematical analysis, you add, madam, a variety of information in all parts of physics and descriptive natural history. After the mechanism of the heavens, the philosophical connection of the physical sciences has been the object of my profoundest admiration. The author of the vast cosmos should more than anyone else salute the physical geography of Mary Somerville. I know of no work on physical geography in any language that can compare with yours. Among the other subjects by Mrs. Somerville, treating of physical subjects or of subjects intimately related to the physics are 
the form and rotation of the earth, the tides of the ocean and atmosphere, and an abstruse investigation on molecular and microscopic science. The last volume was published in 1869, when its author was near her ninetieth year, and bore as its motto St. Augustine's sublime words, Deus magnus in magnus, maximus in minimus. God is great in great things, greatest in the least. After Mrs. Somerville's death in 1872, at the advanced age of 92, the number of women who devoted themselves to the study and teaching of physics was greatly augmented. The brilliant success of Laura Bassi and Mary Somerville had not been without results, and their notable achievements as authors and teachers had the effect of stimulating women everywhere to emulate their example and encouraging them to devote more attention to a branch of science which, until then, had been more regarded by the general public as beyond the sphere and capacity of what was assumed to be the intellectually weaker sex. One of the most eminent scientific women of the present day in England is Mrs. Ayrton, the wife of the late Professor W. E. Ayrton, the well-known electrician. Her chosen field of study, like that of her husband, has been electricity, in which she has achieved marked distinction. Her investigations on the electric arc and on the sand ripples of the seashore won for her the first medal ever awarded to a woman by the Royal Society. When, however, in 1902, she was formally nominated for fellowship in this same society, she failed of election because the Council of the Society discovered that it had no legal power to elect a married woman to this distinction. How different it was in the case of Laura Bassi, who was an active member of all leading scientific and literary societies of Italy, where from time immemorial women have been as cordially welcomed to membership in its learned societies as to the chairs of its great universities. The list of the women who in Europe and America are now engaged in physical research and in teaching physics in schools and colleges is a long one and the work accomplished by them is in many cases of a high order of merit. It is only indeed during the present generation that such work has been made generally accessible to them. And considering the success which has already attended their efforts in this branch of science, we have every reason to believe that the future will bring forth many others of their sex who will take rank with such intellectual luminaries as Hypatia, Madame du Châtelet, Laura Bassi, and Mary Somerville. End of section 13, chapter 5. Recorded by Ralph Kerwin, Belmont, California. Section 14 of Woman in Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman in Science by John Augustine Zalm Chapter 6 Women in Chemistry The first woman deserving special mention in the history of chemistry is the wife of the immortal Lavoisier, the most famous of the founders of modern chemical science. While yet in her teens, this remarkable woman gave evidence of exceptional intelligence and willpower. She was thoroughly devoted to her husband, and had the greatest admiration for his genius. Her highest ambition was to prove herself worthy of him, and to render herself competent to assist him in those investigations that have given him such imperishable renown. With this end in view, she learned Latin and English, and she thus became an accomplished translator from these languages of any chemical works which might aid her spouse in his epoch-making researches. It was she who translated for him the chemical memoirs of Cavendish, Henry, Kerwin, Priestley, and other noted English scientific investigators. Arthur Young, well known in his day as a traveler and author, who in 1787 made the acquaintance of Madame Lavoisier, describes her as a woman full of animation, good sense, and knowledge. In referring to a breakfast she had given him, he declares that, unquestionably the best part of the repast was her conversation on Kerwin's essay on Phlogiston, which she was then translating and on other subjects which a woman of sense, working in the laboratory of her husband, 
know so well how to make interesting. She was an ardent co-worker with her husband in his laboratory, and materially aided him in his labors. Under his direction she wrote the results of the experiments that were made, as is evidenced by the records of his work. As a pupil of the illustrious painter David, she was naturally skillful in drawing. Besides this, she was a good engraver, and it is to her that are due the illustrations in Lavoisier's great Traité de Chimie, which contributed so much toward revolutionizing the science of chemistry. It was, indeed, the first work that deserved to be regarded as a textbook of modern chemistry. Among her drawings are two of special interest. They represent her as seated at a table in the laboratory, taking notes, while her husband and his assistant, Sequin, are making an experiment on the phenomena of respiration. All Madame Lavoisier's writings testify to her great admiration of the genius of her husband. Intimately associated with him in his work, she combated for the triumph of his ideas and sought to make converts to them. One of her most notable converts was the Swiss chemist de Saussure. You have, Madame, he writes her, triumphed over my doubts, at least in the matter of phlogiston which is the principal object of the interesting work of which you have done me the honor of sending me a copy. After Lavoisier's tragic death on the guillotine, it was his devoted wife who edited his Memoirs on Chemistry, of which Lavoisier had himself projected the publication. The two volumes constituting this work were not for sale, but were gratuitously distributed by the bereaved widow among the most eminent scientific men of the epoch. Cuvier, in acknowledging the receipt of these precious memoirs, declares, all the friends of science are under obligations to you for your sorrowful determination to publish this collection of papers and to publish them as they were written, a melancholy monument of your loss and theirs, a loss which humanity will feel for centuries. To realize the importance of the work in which Madame Lavoisier participated, it suffices to recall the fact that her husband, as one of the creators of modern chemistry, was the first to demonstrate the existence of the law of the conservation of matter, which declares that in all chemical changes nothing is lost and nothing is created. The co-discoverer with Scheele and Priestley of oxygen, he was the first one to exhibit the role of this important element in the phenomena of combustion and respiration, and the first also to lay the foundations of a chemical nomenclature. We are not then surprised to learn that Madame Lavoisier's salon, even long after her lamented husband's death, was frequented by the most eminent savants of the time, for here were gathered such scientific luminaries as Cuvier, Laplace, Arago, Lagrange, Prony, Berthollet, Delambre, Biot, Humboldt, and others scarcely less brilliant. After the conclusion of Madame Lavoisier's work in the laboratory of her husband, little was accomplished by women in chemistry for more than half a century. The reason was simple. Chemistry was not part of a curriculum of studies for girls, either in Europe or America. Even during the sixties, writes a teacher of one of the prominent female seminaries of the United States, the study of chemistry was mostly confined to the textbook, supplemented once a year by a course of lectures from an itinerant expert, who, with his tanks of various gases, produced highly spectacular effects. When one recollects that the first institution in America, Vassar, for the higher education of women, was not opened until 1865, one will understand that there were previously to this date few opportunities for women to study either chemistry or any of the other sciences. The first scientific institution to open its doors to women was the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This was on May 11, 1876, when the governing board of the institute declared that, hereafter, special students in chemistry shall be admitted without regard to sex. In less than a year after this event, every department of this institution was open to women, and any one who could pass the requisite examination was admitted as a student. Five years, however, before women were formally admitted to the courses of chemistry, an energetic young graduate from Vassar, eager to devote her life to the pursuit of science, had, as an exceptional favor, been allowed to enter the Institute as a special student in chemistry. As she was the first woman in the United States to enter a strictly professional scientific school, her entrance marks the beginning of a new epoch in the history of female education. The name of this ardent votary of science was Miss Ellen Swallow, better known to the world as Mrs. Ellen H. Richards. Mrs. Richards had not devoted herself long to the study of her favorite science before she resolved to apply the knowledge thus gained to the problems of daily life. She saw, among other things, the necessity of a complete reform in domestic economy, 
and resolutely set to work to have her views adopted and put in practice. She was, in consequence, one of the first leaders of the crusade in behalf of pure food, and her lectures and books on this all-important subject contributed greatly toward the diffusion of exact knowledge respecting the dangers lurking in unwholesome food. She was likewise one of the first to apply the science of chemistry to an exhaustive study of the science of nutrition, to the study of food, and the proper preparation of food materials. In this she was eminently successful, and was able to achieve for home economics what the illustrious Liebig had many years before accomplished for agricultural chemistry, put it on a firm and lasting basis. To her, the kitchen was the center and source of political economy. The facts of science, indeed, were to Mrs. Richards more than mere uncorrelated facts. They are potential agencies of service, and their chief value consists in their enabling us to control our environment in such wise as to secure the maximum of physical well-being. Hence her constant insistence on personal cleanliness, on the cleanliness of food, of the house we live in, and, above all, of the kitchen. Hence also her preaching, in season and out of season, on the necessity of pure air, pure water, and abundance of vitalizing sunshine. We cannot then wonder that sanitary chemistry eventually became the life work of Mrs. Richards, and that, when the course of sanitary engineering was inaugurated in the Institute of Technology, the first course of its kind in the world, she became an important agent in its development and contributed immensely to its popularity and prestige. She held the position of instructor of sanitary chemistry in the Institute for twenty-seven years. During this time she trained a large number of young men in her chosen specialty, and these, after graduating, engaged in similar work in various parts of the new and the old world. The branch of sanitary chemistry to which Mrs. Richards devoted most attention was air, water, and sewage analysis. In this she was recognized expert, and her advice and services were sought in all parts of the country. During the last three years of her life she acted, according to her own testimony, as a general sanitary adviser to no fewer than two score corporations and schools. In addition to this, she was also during this brief period consulted on the subject of foods by nearly two hundred educational and other institutions. What, however, constituted the greatest contribution of Mrs. Richards to the public health was the part she took in the great sanitary survey of the waters of the state of Massachusetts. During this long and laborious investigation she analyzed more than forty thousand samples of water. These analyses exhibited the condition of the water from all parts of the state during all seasons of the year, and were of the greatest value in solving a number of important problems in state sanitation. But notwithstanding the drafts made on her time and energy by her classwork in the laboratory, and her occupation as sanitary engineer for scores of public and private institutions, she still found leisure to engage in many important movements which had in view the public health and the betterment of sanitary conditions in city and country. It is safe to say that no one ever put her knowledge of chemical science to more practical use or made it more perfectly subserve the public wheel than did Mrs. Richards. To spread among the masses a knowledge of the principles of sanitation, to make them realize how indispensable to health are pure food, pure water, pure air, and life-giving sunshine, was her great mission in life, and in this she displayed an energy and a tireless zeal which were an inspiration to all with whom she came into contact. This indefatigable woman, it is proper to record here, might have distinguished herself as a discoverer in chemical science had she elected to devote her life to original research rather than to utilizing the knowledge already available for the welfare of her fellows. Thus, after a careful analysis of the rare mineral samarskite, she found an insoluble residue which led her to believe might contain unknown elements. This view she repeatedly expressed to her co-workers in the laboratory, but she was unwilling to take from what she regarded more important work the time necessary for making investigations which might have given her undying fame as a discoverer. For not long afterward this insoluble residue, in the hands of two French chemists, yielded the exceedingly rare elements samarium and gadolinium. Another chemist of a less altruistic nature than Mrs. Richards would not have resisted the temptation to achieve distinction in the domain of original research. But where there was so much suffering to be relieved, and so much ignorance to be removed, regarding the most fundamental principles of sanitation, this philanthropic woman preferred to put to practical use what she called 
the considerable body of useful knowledge now lying on our shelves. Her duty, as she conceived it, is well indicated in the following paragraph, taken from a thoughtful discussion by her of the subject of home economics a short time before her death in 1911. The sanitary research worker in the laboratory and field, she declares, has gone nearly to the limit of his value. He will soon be smothered in his own work, if no one takes it. Meanwhile, children die by the thousands. Contagious diseases take toll of hundreds. Back alleys remain foul, and the streets are unswept. Schoolhouses are unwashed, and dangers lurk in the drinking cups and about the towels. Dust is stirred up each morning with the feather duster to greet the warm, moist noses and throats of the children. To the watchful expert it seems like the old cities dancing and making merry on the eve of a volcanic outbreak. From the day in 1873 when Mrs. Richards received from the Institute of Technology the degree of Bachelor of Science, a degree which made her not only the first woman graduate of this institution, but also the first graduate in the United States of a strictly scientific seat of learning, the number of women who have devoted themselves to chemical pursuits is legion. They are now found in every civilized country in both hemispheres, and their number is daily increasing. They are everywhere doing excellent work as teachers in classrooms and laboratories, and holding their own with men as chemical experts in manufacturing establishments and government institutions. Many of them have done original work of a high order, and distinguish themselves by their valuable contributions to contemporary chemical literature. Space, however, precludes more than a general reference to their achievements, for the names only of those who have done meritorious work in chemistry would make a very long list. Passing over, then, all the lesser feminine lights in chemistry who, in various fields of activity, have rendered such distinct service during the past generation, we come to one who for nearly two decades has stood in the forefront of the great chemists of the world. This is the renowned daughter of Poland, Madame Marie Koldowska Curie, whose name will always be identified with some of the most remarkable discoveries which have ever been made in the long-continued study of the material universe. Marie Klodowska was born in Warsaw in 1868. Her father was a professor of chemistry in the university of the former Polish capital, and it is undoubtedly from him that his brilliantly dowered daughter has inherited her love of chemistry and her extraordinary genius for scientific research. Owing to the paltry salary he received, Professor Klodowska was obliged to make little Marie his laboratory assistant while she was quite a young girl. Instead, then, of playing with tops and dolls, her time was occupied in cleaning evaporating dishes and test tubes, and in assisting her father to prepare for his lectures and experiments. And it was thus that, at an early age, she acquired a taste for that science in which she was subsequently to achieve such worldwide fame. While still a young woman, her love of science drew her to Paris, where she arrived with only fifty francs in her purse. But possessed of dauntless courage and unfaltering perseverance, she was prepared to make any sacrifice in the pursuit of knowledge. Her first home in the gay French metropolis was a poorly furnished garret in an obscure part of the city, and her diet was for so long a time restricted to black bread and skimmed milk that she afterward avowed that she had to cultivate a taste for wine and meat. And so intensely cold was her cheerless room in winter that the little bottle of milk which was daily left at her door was speedily congealed. At this time the poor girl was living on less than ten cents a day, but still cherishing all the while the fond hope that she might eventually secure a position as a student assistant in some good chemical laboratory. After a long struggle with poverty and after countless disappointments in quest of a position where she could gratify her ambition as a student of chemistry, she finally found occupation as a poorly paid assistant in the laboratory conducted by Professor Lippmann. She was not, however, at work a week before this distinguished investigator recognized in the young woman one whose knowledge of chemistry and faculty for original research were far above the average. She was accordingly transferred without delay from the menial employment in which she had been engaged and given every possible facility for prosecuting work as an original investigator. It was shortly after this event that Marie Klodowska met the noted savant Pierre Curie. He was not long in discovering in her a kindred spirit, one who, besides having exceptional talent in experimental chemistry, was actuated by an ardent love of science. It was then that he determined to make her his wife, 
a single sentence in a letter he wrote at this time to the object of his admiration and affection reveals better than anything else the devotion of this matchless pair in the cause of science what a great thing it would be he exclaims to unite our lives and work together for the sake of science and humanity these simple words were the keynote to the ideal life led by this incomparable couple during the eleven years they worked together in perfect unity of thought and aspiration before the sudden and premature extinction of the husband's life gave such a shock to the entire scientific world after her marriage the gifted young polish woman had reached the goal of her ambition she was able to devote herself exclusively to what was henceforth to constitute her life work in one of the best laboratories of paris that of the Ecole de Physique et de Chemie, and that, too, in collaboration with her husband, from whom she was never separated during the entire period of their married life for even a single day. It was about this time that Madame Curie had her interest aroused by the brilliant discoveries of Röntgen and Becquerel regarding radiant matter. After a long series of carefully conducted experiments on compounds of uranium and thorium, she, with the intuition of genius, opened up to the world of science an entirely new field of research. But she soon realized that the labor involved in the investigations which she had planned was entirely beyond the capacity of any one person. It was then that she succeeded in enlisting her husband's interest in the undertaking, which was to lead to such marvelous results. Confining their work to a careful analytical study of the residue of the famous bohemian pitchblende, an extremely complex mineral, largely composed of oxide of uranium, they soon found themselves confronted by most extraordinary radioactive phenomena. Continuing their researches, their labor was rewarded by the discovery of a new element, which Madame Curie, in her enthusiasm, named in honor of the land of her birth, polonium. As their investigations progressed, they became correspondingly difficult. They were dealing with substances, which exist in pitch-blend residue, only in infinitesimal quantities, not more than three troy grams to the ton. The difficulties they had to contend with were enough to discourage the stoutest heart. Few believed in their theories, while the majority of those who had some intimation of the character of their work were persuaded that they were pursuing a phantom. But the indefatigable pair toiled on day and night and continued their experiments through long years of poverty and deferred hopes. Considering the Herculean task in which they were engaged for so many years, we scarcely know which to admire most, their clearness of vision, which made them divine success, their profound knowledge which guided them in the choice of reagents, or the indomitable perseverance which characterized them in their laborious task, and in the countless sacrifices which they were obliged to make before their efforts were crowned with success. During this long search into the inner heart of nature, Pierre Curie was often so discouraged and depressed that, had he not been sustained by his more sanguine wife, he would time and again have given up his investigations in despair. But Marie Curie never faltered. She never lost faith in their theories or confidence in the outcome of their great undertaking. Before her deft hands and fertile brain, difficulties vanished, as if under the magic wand of Prospero. At length, after countless experiments of the most delicate character, after bringing to bear on the solution of the problem before them the most refined methods of chemical analysis, they were rewarded by one of the most extraordinary discoveries recorded in the annals of science. With the announcement of the discovery of radium, the Curies sprang into worldwide fame, and the name of the wonderful woman who had been the prime mover in the supreme achievement was on every lip. Pierre Curie himself declared that more than half of the epical discovery belonged to his wife, it was she who began the work, it was she who, after her marriage, enlisted in it the cooperation of her husband. It was she whose invincible patience and persistence, typical of the noblest representatives of her race, supported him during periods of doubt and despondency, and fanned his flagging spirits to new endeavor. It can indeed be truthfully asserted that had it not been for her penetrating intelligence, her tenacity of purpose, and her keenness of vision, which were never at fault, the great victory which crowned their efforts would never have been achieved. Footnote. Madame Curie, in an article which she wrote shortly after her discovery of radium, shows that she possesses a genius for inductive science of the highest type. It was at the close of the year 1897, she writes, that I began to study the compounds of uranium, the properties of which had greatly attracted my interest. 
Here was a substance emitting spontaneously and continually radiation similar to Röntgen rays, whereas ordinarily Röntgen rays can be produced only in a vacuum tube with the expenditure of electrical energy. By what process can uranium furnish the same rays without expenditure of energy and without undergoing apparent modification? Is uranium the only body whose compounds emit similar rays? Such were the questions I asked myself, and it was while seeking to answer them that I entered into the researches which have led to the discovery of radium. End footnote. Compare their work with that which was accomplished by their illustrious predecessors, Antoine Laurent Lavoisier and his wife, a century earlier. The latter, by their discovery of and experiments with oxygen, were able to explain the until then mysterious phenomena of combustion and respiration, and to coordinate numberless facts which had before stood isolated and enigmatic. But the reverse was the case in the discovery of that extraordinary and uncanny element, radium. It completely subverted many long-established theories, and necessitated an entirely new view of the nature of energy and of the constitution of matter. A substance that seemed capable of emitting light and heat indefinitely, with little or no appreciable change or transformation, appeared to sap the very foundations of the fundamental principle of the conservation of energy. Subsequent investigations seemed only to render confusion worse confounded. They appeared to justify the dreams of the alchemists of old, not only regarding the transmutation of metals, but also respecting the elixir of life. For was not this apparently absurd idea vindicated by the observed curative properties bordering almost on the miraculous this marvellous element was reputed to possess? Its virtues, it was averred, transcended the fabled properties of the famous red tincture and the philosopher's stone combined, and many were prepared to find in it a panacea for the most distressing of human ailments, from lupus and rodent ulcer to cancer and other frightful forms of morbid degeneration. And the end is not yet. Continued investigations, made in all parts of the world since the discovery of radium by the curés, have but emphasized its mysterious properties, and compelled a revision of many of our most cherished theories in chemistry, physics, and astronomy. No one single discovery, not even Pasteur's far-reaching discovery of microbic life, it may safely be asserted, has ever been more subversive of long-accepted views in certain domains of science, or given rise to more perplexing problems regarding matters which were previously thought to be thoroughly understood. Never in the entire history of science have the results of a woman's scientific researches been so stupendous or so revolutionary, and never has any one achievement in science reflected more glory on womankind than that which is so largely due to the genius and perseverance of Madame Curie. After their startling discovery, honors and tributes to their genius came in rapid succession to the gifted couple. On the recommendation of the venerable British savant Lord Kelvin, they were awarded the Davy Gold Medal by the Royal Society. Shortly after this, they shared with M. H. Becquerel in the Nobel Prize for Physics, bestowed on them by Sweden. Then came laggard France, with its decoration of the Legion of Honor. But it was offered only to the man. There was nothing for the woman. Pierre Curie showed his spirit and chivalry by declining to accept the proffered honor unless his wife could share it with him. His answer was simple, but its meaning could not be mistaken. This decoration, he said, has no bearing on my work. Footnote. The day following Pierre Curie's refusal of the decoration offered by the government, the elder of his two daughters, little Irene, climbed upon her father's knee and put a red geranium in the lapel of his coat. Now, papa, she gravely remarked, you are decorated with the Legion of Honor. In this case, the fond father replied, I make no objection. End footnote. Shortly after her husband's death, Madame Curie was appointed as his successor as special lecturer in the Sorbonne. This was the first time that this conservative old university ever invited a woman to a full professorship, but she soon showed that she was thoroughly competent to fill the position with honor and éclat. She has the élite of society and the world's most noted men of science among her auditors. The crowned heads of the old world eagerly seek an opportunity to witness her experiments and hear her discourse on what is by all odds the most marvelous element in nature. Madame Curie has not allowed her lectures in the Sorbonne to interfere with the continuation of the researches which have won for her such worldwide renown. Since the sudden taking off of her husband by a passing truck on a Paris bridge, 
she has succeeded in isolating both radium and polonium. Only the chlorides and bromides of these elements were previously known. Besides doing other work, scarcely less remarkable. And besides all this, she has also found time to write a connected account of her investigations under the title of Traité de Radioactivité, a work that reflects as much honor on her sex as did the Institutione Analytiche of Maria Gaetana Agnesi, which won for her, through that celebrated patron of learning, Benedict the Fourteenth, the chair of higher mathematics in the University of Bologna. The list of learned societies to which Madame Curie belongs is an extended one. To mention only a few, she is an honorary or foreign member of the London Chemical Society, the Royal Institution of Great Britain, the Royal Swedish Academy, the American Chemical Society, the American Philosophical Society, and the Imperial Academy of Sciences of St. Petersburg. From the Universities of Geneva and Edinburgh, she has received the honorary degree of doctor. In 1898, she received the Gainer Prize from the French Academy of Sciences for her elaborate researches on the magnetic properties of iron and steel, as also for her investigations related to radioactivity. The same prize was again awarded to her in 1900, and still again in 1903. With her husband, she received in 1901 the Lacaze Prize of 10,000 francs, and in 1903 she received a part of the Osiris Prize of 60,000 francs. Since her husband's death in 1906, Madame Curie has been awarded the coveted Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which was placed in her hand by the King of Sweden on December 11, 1911, a prize which increased the exchequer of the fair recipient by nearly 200,000 francs. Having before been the beneficiary of the Nobel Prize for Physics, in conjunction with her husband and M. H. Becquerel, Madame Curie is thus the first person to be twice singled out for the world's highest financial recognition of scientific research. It would take too long to enumerate all the medals and prizes and honors which have come to this remarkable woman from foreign countries, but she has doubtless been the recipient of more trophies of undying fame during the last decade and a half than any other one person during the same brief period of intellectual activity. And all these tokens of recognition of genius were showered upon her, not because she was a woman, but in spite of this fact. Had she been a man, she would have been honored with the other distinctions which tradition and prejudice still persist in denying to one of the prescribed sex, no matter how great her merit or how signal her achievements. At a recent scientific congress held in Brussels, it was decided to prepare a standard of measurement of radium emanations. It was the unanimous opinion of the Congress that Madame Curie was better equipped than any other person for establishing such a standard, and she was accordingly requested to undertake the delicate and difficult task, a commission which she executed to the satisfaction of all concerned. This unit of measurement, it is gratifying to learn, will be known as the Curie, a word which will enter the same category as the volt, the ohm, the ampere, the farad, and a few others which will perpetuate the names of the world's greatest geniuses in the domain of experimental science. When, not long since, there was a vacancy among the immortals of the French Academy, there was a generally expressed desire that it should be filled by one who was universally recognized as among the foremost of living scientists. The name of Madame Curie trembled on every lip, and the hope was entertained that the Academy would honor itself by admitting the world-famed savant among its members. Considering her achievements, she had no competitor, and was, in the estimation of all outside of the Academy, the one person in France who was the most deserving of the coveted honor. But no, she was a woman, and for that reason alone she was excluded from an institution the sole object of whose establishment was the reward of merit and the advancement of learning. The age-old prejudice against women who devote themselves to the study of science, or who contribute to the progress of knowledge, was still as dominant as it was in the days of Maria Gatana Agnesi, a century and a half before. Madame Curie, like her famous sister in Italy, might win the plaudits of the world for her achievements, but she could have no recognition from the one institution, above all others, that was specially founded to foster the development of science and literature and to crown the efforts of those who had proven themselves worthy of the Academy's highest honor. The attitude of the French institution toward Madame Curie was exactly like that of the Royal Society of Great Britain 
when Mrs. Ireton's name was brought up for membership. The answer to both applicants was in effect, if not in words, no woman need apply. When one reads of the sad experiences of Madame Curie and Mrs. Ireton with the learned societies of Paris and London, one instinctively asks, when will the day come when women, in every part of the civilized world, shall enjoy all the rights and privileges in every field of intellectual effort which have so long been theirs in the favored land of Dante and Beatrice, the motherland of learned societies and universities? For not until the advent of the day when such exclusive organizations as the Royal Society and the French Academy of Sciences, such ultra-conservative universities as Oxford and Cambridge, shall admit women on the same footing as men, will these institutions be more than half-serving the best interests of humanity. Footnote. A few days before Madame Curie's name was to come before the Academy of Sciences as a candidate for membership, the French Institute, in its quarterly plenary meeting of the five academies, of which the Institute is composed, decided by a vote of ninety to fifty-two against the eligibility of women to membership, and put itself on record in favor of the immutable tradition against the election of women, which it seemed eminently wise to respect. Commenting on this decision of the immortals, a writer in the well-known English magazine Nature, under date of January 12, 1911, penned the following pertinent paragraph. It remains to be seen what the Academy of Sciences will do in the face of such an expression of opinion. Madame Curie is deservedly popular in French scientific circles. It is everywhere recognized that her work is of transcendent merit, and that it has contributed enormously to the prestige of France as a home of experimental inquiry. Indeed, it is not too much to say that the discovery and isolation of the radioactive elements are among the most striking and fruitful results of a field of investigation preeminently French. If any prophet is to have honor in his own country, even if the country be only the land of his adoption, surely that honor ought to belong to Madame Curie. At this moment, Madame Curie is without doubt, in the eyes of the world, the dominant figure in French chemistry. There is no question that any man who had contributed to the sum of human knowledge what she has made known would years ago have gained that recognition at the hands of his colleagues, which Madame Curie's friends are now desirous of securing for her. It is incomprehensible, therefore, on any ethical principles of right and justice that, because she happens to be a woman, she should be denied the laurels which her preeminent scientific achievement has earned for her. Compare this frank and honest statement with that of a contributor about the same date to La Revue de Mont of Paris. Guided by his myopic vision and diseased imagination, this writer discerns in the admittance of women into the grand old institution of Richelieu and Napoleon the imminent triumph of what Proudhon called pornography, and the eventual opening of the portals of the Palais Mazarin to representatives of the type of Laïs and Frin, on the Hellenic pretext that beauty is the supreme merit. It is gratifying, however, to the friends of woman's cause to learn that Madame Curie's candidacy was defeated by only two votes. Her competitor, Monsieur Brownlee, received thirty votes against the Polish woman's twenty-eight. She thus fared far better than did Madame Pauline Savary, who aspired to the fatule made vacant by the death of Renan, regarding whose candidature the Academy curtly declared, considering that its traditions do not permit it to examine this question, the Academy passes to the order of the day. Thus it will be seen that, in spite of the long-continued opposition to women members, the French Academy is more than likely to offer its next vacant chair to the pride and glory of Poland, the immortal discoverer of radium and polonium. End of footnote. Women, it is true, are now eligible to many literary and scientific associations from which they were formerly debarred, and are, in most countries, admitted to colleges and universities whose portals were closed to them until only a few years ago. But until they shall be welcomed to all universities and all societies whose objects are the advancement of knowledge, until they shall participate in the advantages and prestige accruing from connection with these organizations, they will have reason to feel that they are not yet in the full possession of the intellectual advantages for which they have so long yearned, that they have been but partially liberated from that educational disqualification in which they have been held during so many long centuries of deferred hopes and fruitless struggles. End of chapter 6 End of section 14
Section 15 of Woman in Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. Women in Science by John Augustine Zamm. Chapter 7, Part 1 Women in the Natural Sciences. It is reasonable to suppose that women, who are such lovers of nature, have always had a greater or less interest in the natural sciences, especially in botany and zoology. But the fact remains that the first one of their sex to write at any length on the various kingdoms of nature was that extraordinary nun of the Middle Ages, St. Hildegard, the learned abbess of the Benedictine convent of St. Rupert at Bingen on the Rhine. Of an exceptionally versatile and acquiring mind, her range of study and acquirement was truly encyclopedic. In this respect, she was the worthy forerunner of Albert the Great, the famous Doctor Universalis of Scholasticism. Although St. Hildegard has much to say about nature in several of her works, the one of chiefest interest to us as an exposition of the natural history of her time is her treatise entitled Liber Subtilitatum Diversarum Naturarum Creatarum. It is usually known by its more abbreviated name, Physica, and considering the circumstances under which it was written, is in many ways a most remarkable production. It consists of nine books treating of minerals, plants, fishes, birds, insects, and quadrupeds. The book on plants is composed of no fewer than 230 chapters, while that on birds contains 72 chapters. In reading Hildegard's descriptions of animated nature, we are often reminded of Pliny's great work on natural history but so far as known there is no positive evidence that the learned religios had any acquaintance whatever with the writings of the old roman naturalist had she had the general tenor of her work would have been quite different from what it actually is the mystery then is this what were the sources of physica some have fancied that hildegard in preparing this made use of the writings not only of pliny and virgil but also those of macer constantinus africanus wallafried strabo isidore of seville and other writers who were in great vogue during the Middle Ages. The general consensus of opinion, however, of those who have carefully studied this interesting problem is that the gentle nun was not acquainted with any of the authors named except possibly Isidore of Seville, whose works were all held in high esteem, especially during the period of Hildegard's greatest literary activity. Hildegard's Physica has a special value for philologists, as well as for students of natural history, for it contains the German names of plants still used by the people of the fatherland seven hundred years after they were penned by the painstaking abbess of St. Rupert. Referring to the saint's work entitled De Natura Hominis Elementorum Diverserumque Creatorarum, a treatise on the nature of man, the elements and divers created things, no less an authority than Dr. Charles Darmberg declares that it will always hold an important place in the history of medical art and of inanimate and animate nature insigni semper locus debititor in artis medice rerumque naturalium historia he even goes further and affirms that hildegard was familiar with numerous facts of science regarding which other medieval writers were entirely ignorant more than this she was acquainted with many of nature's secrets which were unknown to men of science until recent times and which on being disclosed by modern researches, have been proclaimed to the world as new discoveries. One reason why St. Hildegard's writings on botany, zoology, and mineralogy are not better known is that few students care to make the effort to master her voluminous works. They require long and assiduous study, and a knowledge of her peculiarities of style and expression, which is acquired only after patient and persistent labor. But the labor is not in vain, as is evidenced by the numerous monographs which have appeared in recent years, especially in Germany, on the scientific works of this marvelous nun of the twelfth century. All things considered, the Abbess of Bingen may be said to hold the same position in the natural sciences of her time as was held in the physical and mathematical sciences seven hundred years earlier by the illustrious Hypatia of Alexandria. After the death of St. Hildegard, full six centuries elapsed before any one of her sex again achieved distinction in the domain of natural science. And then, strange to relate, the first woman who won fame by her knowledge of science and by her contributions to it, did so in the field where a woman would, one would think, be least disposed to exercise her talent and least likely to find congenial work. It was in the then comparatively new science of human anatomy, a science which had been inaugurated in the famous medical schools of Salerno and which was subsequently so highly developed in the great university of bologna the name of this remarkable woman was anna morandi manzolini she was born in seventeen sixteen in bologna where after a brilliant career in her favorite branch of science she died at the age of fifty-eight 
She held the chair of anatomy in the University of Bologna for many years and is noted for a number of important discoveries made as a result of her dissections of cadavers. But she won a still greater title to fame by the marvelous skill which she exhibited in making anatomical models out of indurated wax. They were so carefully fashioned that some of them could scarcely be distinguished from the parts of the body from which they were modeled. As aids in the study of anatomy, they were most highly valued and eagerly sought for on all sides. The collection which she made for her own use was, after her death, acquired by the Medical Institute of Bologna and prized as one of its most precious possessions. Three years after her demise, Luigi Galvani, professor of anatomy at the same university in which Anna had achieved such fame, made use of these wax models for a course of lectures on the organs and structure of the human body. These famous models, first perfected by Anna Manzolini, were the archetypes of the exquisite wax models of Vassore, as well as the unrivaled paper mache creations of Dr. Ozo, and of all similar productions now so extensively used in our schools and colleges. Even during the lifetime of the gifted modeler, there were demands for specimens of her work from all parts of Italy, from many cities in Europe, even from London and St. Petersburg. She received the most flattering offers for her services. So eager was Milan to have her accept a position which had been offered her that the city authorities sent her a blank contract and begged her to name her own conditions. But she could never be induced to leave the home of her childhood in the city which had witnessed and applauded her triumphs of maturer years. Men of learning and eminence, on passing through Bologna, invariably made it a point to call on the learned professora in order to make her acquaintance and to see her wonderful anatomical collection, which was celebrated throughout Europe as Supele Manzoliniania. Among these visitors was Joseph II of Austria. So greatly was His Majesty impressed by Anna's rare intellectual attainments and by her marvelous skill in reproducing the various parts of the human form divine that he could not take leave of her without showing his appreciation of them by loading her with gifts worthy of a sovereign. A contemporary of Anna Manzolini, who also distinguished herself in the preparation of anatomical models, was a Frenchwoman, Mademoiselle Biraron. Her facsimiles of parts of the human body were, according to Madame de Genlis, so true to nature that they could not be distinguished from the originals. This led the facetious Chevalier Ringla, after examining a specimen of her handiwork, to declare, Verily, it is so perfect that it lacks only the odor of the natural object. While yet Prince Royal, Gustavus of Sweden, visited the French Academy of Sciences in Paris. Here he was entertained by a number of experiments in anatomy. The demonstrator was Mademoiselle Biron, who is said to have had a veritable passion for both anatomy and surgery. So impressed was Gustavus with the extraordinary skill and knowledge of this gifted daughter of France that he offered her the position of demonstrator of anatomy in the Royal University of Sweden. Other branches of science, apparently quite as alien as anatomy to women's taste and talent, are mineralogy and meteorology. Yet, as early as the first half of the 17th century, the Baroness de Beausoleil had achieved a great reputation by her investigations into the mineral treasures of France. Indeed, she may, strange as it may appear, be regarded as the first mining engineer of her native land. She details the qualifications of a mining engineer and tells us he must, among other things, be well versed in chemistry, mineralogy, geometry, mechanics, and hydraulics. As for herself, she assures us that she's devoted thirty years of unremitting study to these diverse branches. To Madame de Beausoleil is also attributed the glory of awakening a countryman's interest in the mineral resources of France, and of showing them how their proper exploitation would inure not only to the credit of the nation abroad, but also to its prosperity at home. She was the author of two works, which proved that she was a woman of rare attainments combined with exceptional breadth of view and political acumen. She was deeply concerned in the development of the mineral resources of her country, and foresaw how greatly they could be made to contribute to the augmentation of the nation's finances. Her work entitled La Restitution de Pluton is a report on the mines and ore deposits of France, and is a document as precious as it is curious. It is addressed to Cardinal Richelieu and shows how the French monarch could, if the subterranean treasures of the country were properly developed, become the greatest ruler in Christendom, and his subjects the happiest of all peoples. Another report by this energetic and enthusiastic woman is in the same strain. In it she proves how the king of France, by utilizing the underground riches of the country, could make himself and his people independent of all other nations. In these two productions, Madame de Beausoleil treats of the sciences of mining, the different kinds of mines, and the assaying of ores, and the diverse methods of spelting them as well as of the general principles of metallurgy, as then understood. 
but unlike the majority of her contemporaries this enlightened woman had no patience with those who believed that the earth's hidden treasures could not be discovered without recourse to magic or the aid of demons she was unsparing in her ridicule of those who had faith in the existence of gnomes and kobolds or thought that the ore deposits could be located only by divining rods or similar foolish contrivances which were relics of an ignorant and superstitious age the same century that witnessed the exploring activity of the baroness de beausoleil saw the beginnings of the notable achievements of a daughter of germany well known in the annals of science as maria sibylia marianne born in frankfurt in sixteen forty seven she died in amsterdam in seventeen seventeen after a somewhat checkered career most of which was devoted to the pursuit of natural history so fond was she of flowers and insects that it is said they told her all their secrets having familiarized herself with the fauna and flora of her native land she proceeded to investigate the collections of the principal european cabinets of natural history this only fired her ambition to see more of the world and study nature where she is seen in her greatest splendor and luxuriance she accordingly resolved to undertake a journey to the equatorial regions of south america such a voyage can now be made with comparative ease but in her days it was fraught with discomforts and dangers of all kinds and one that no woman thought to venture on unless obliged to do so by stern necessity but she was set on investigating animals and plants in their own habitats in the glorious and exuberant flora of the tropics and accompanied by her two daughters helena and dorothea she embarked for surinam here assisted by her daughters who like their mother were both skilful artists the intrepid naturalist spent two years in studying the wonders of plant and animal life that everywhere greeted her delighted vision all the time not occupied in research work was devoted to sketching and painting those superb insects that are so abundant in tropical fields and forests returning to holland with her precious scientific treasures she began the preparation of a work that will long endure as a monument to her knowledge and industry it was a magnificent volume in folio on the insects of Suriname. it appeared simultaneously in dutch and latin and was subsequently translated into french in illustrating this sumptuous work Frau Marianne was greatly assisted by her younger daughter Dorothea. The etchings and hand colored reproductions of the glorious butterflies and flowers of Suriname commanded universal admiration and marked a new epoch in bookmaking. Even today, this noble volume is eagerly sought by both book lovers and men of science, for it is not only a work of rare conception and beauty, but also one of exceptional accuracy in illustration and statement of fact. Besides etchings of multiform insects, lizards, and bactracheans indigenous to Dutch Guiana, there were in this unique volume carefully executed illustrations of plants and trees peculiar to tropical America, such as vanilla, cacao, and the species of manahot, which constitutes the staff of life of so large a population in the basins of the Amazon and the Orinoco. A new and a large edition of this work was published after Frau Marianne's death by her daughter Dorothea the same gifted daughter showed her interest in her parents work and her devotion to her memory by bringing out a beautifully illustrated edition of her mother's earliest work which treated of the wonderful life history of silkworms the century following that which had celebrated the scientific triumphs of maria marianne found in josephine kublik born in seventeen eighty seven hohenel bay bohemia a woman who was destined to prove a worthy successor as a nature student of the noted daughter of frankfurt on the main from her tenderest years she exhibited a passionate love for every form of plant life in addition to this she had while yet young the good fortune of studying under the best botanists of her time soon she became an enthusiastic collector and was in a short time the happy possessor of a herbarium which contained many new species of plants which she had discovered during her frequent botanical excursions from making collections for her private herbarium she was gradually led to make collections for the schools and colleges of her native country as well as for the museums and learned societies of various parts of europe many public institutions owed to her cordial cooperation some of the choicest treasures in their herbaria and not a few botanical writers of her day found in her an intelligent and sympathetic collaborator but frau kublik interested in nature was not confined to plants she was an assiduous student of paleontology as well as of botany and the many fossil animals and plants named in her honor testified to her success in the pursuit of her favorite branches of science there is nothing of the conventional blue stocking about this ardent votary of nature strong and healthy neither wind nor rain interfered with her field work in botany or paleontology it was her greatest pleasure to roam through dark forests and scale high mountains in search of new species of plants and fossils and the success which rewarded her efforts was such that the old and trained naturalists among her male friends had reason to envy her good fortune as an explorer but frau kablik never permitted her frequent excursions or her devotion to science to cause her to neglect the duties of her household fortunately her husband was also an ardent student of nature and while his wife was devoting her attention to botany and paleontology 
he was making investigations into zoology and mineralogy they spent fifty happy years together in the pursuit of science and their joint efforts contributed not a little towards the advancement of branches of science to which they had devoted their lives with such well-directed effort and enthusiasm as the fruitful life of josephine Koblick, who had shed such luster on her sex in bohemia was drawing to a close a young woman in germany amelie dietrich by name was preparing herself to fill the void which would be occasioned by her predecessor's death her first love as a young girl was plant life and this was subsequently accentuated by her husband who was not only a botanist himself but also one who belonged to a distinguished family of botanists a keen observer and an indefatigable collector frau dietrich soon became known throughout europe as a botanist of marked ability and daring she was wont unaccompanied to climb the highest peaks of the salzburg alps and spend entire weeks there seeking new species of alpine flora during the day she explored the deep ravines and clambered along the brambly ledges of beetling precipice and during the night she sought shelter and repose in the humble hut of some hospitable herdsman valuable however as was amelie dietrich's work in the austrian alps it was but a preparation for that which some years later she was to enter upon in far-off australia here she devoted twelve of the best years of her life to the cultivation of botany in the virgin soil of queensland here too she surprised every one by her venturesome spirit no less than by her irrepressible zeal in making collections heedless of danger she plunged quite alone into the wilderness and spent days and weeks at a time with the wild aborigines but she secured what she went in quest of a large and valuable collection of plants containing many new and interesting species besides these she was able to bring back with her to europe a large mass of zoological specimens as well as countless domestic utensils and implements of warfare and husbandry employed by the savages among whom she so frequently journeyed and with whose manners and customs she eventually became so familiar modest and trustworthy frau dietrich had a host of friends in the scientific world and the number of plants which bear her name are not only a tribute to her worth but a striking evidence of the extent of her activity in the pursuit of science which became the absorbing passion of her life of russian women who have become specially noted for their contributions to natural science a very prominent place must be assigned to sophia herrea Lozewa. after receiving the doctorate of science at the university of zurich she became director of the biological station of sebastopol a position she held with great eclat during twelve years here she made numerous important researches on manifold forms of marine life and prepared many works for the press in german and french as well as in her native russian her monographie de tubelaire de la mer noire a large and beautifully illustrated volume published at odessa in eighteen ninety two placed her at once among biologists of the first rank indeed so meritorious was this production of the talented daughter of holy russia that the congress of naturalists in eighteen ninety three did not hesitate to recognize this exceptional value by conferring on the fair authoress a special prize this gifted biologist has since rendered distinct service in the cause of science by her explorations of the gulf of naples and the coast of france her activity is prodigious and the long list of books and monographs which she has published on the lower forms of marine life in the black and mediterranean seas shows that she has a capacity for work that is truly extraordinary here is probably the place to make mention of a woman of encyclopedic mind clemence augustine royer who was born in eighteen thirty in nantes france she wrote on such a variety of subjects that it is difficult to classify her she was in no sense of the word a specialist and she seems by temperament to have been adverse to confining herself to any one branch of knowledge her first work to attract popular attention was one on a topic connected with political economy a prize had been offered for the discussion of this subject and the little frenchwoman acquitted herself so well that she had the honor of sharing the prize with the noted Proudhon she has also written many works on philosophy and physics among these are two which attracted considerable notice at the time of their publication in one of them she attacks the positivism of comte in the other she assails laplace's hypothesis regarding the origin of the material universe but the work which made her famous particularly in france was a translation to french in eighteen sixty two of darwin's origin of the species it is safe to say that this version created as much of a sensation in france as the original had caused in great britain and america her preface to the work of the english naturalist in which she indicates the results which flow from acceptance of the transformist theory created a veritable storm in both religious and scientific circles so gratified was madame royer by the impression made by this preface and so pleased was she with the controversy which she had started that she expanded her summary of the theory of evolution as therein given and published it in eighteen seventy under the title of origin de l'homme et de société this production was so revolutionary in character and so subversive of teachings long held sacred 
that it provoked an indignant protest from all quarters and the author was at once ranked with such radical exponents of the new science as Volk, Buchner, and Haeckel. After the appearance of this production, she wrote numerous other works, some of them on subjects relating to natural science, especially in its connection with anthropology and prehistoric archaeology, and so great was her breadth of view, and so exceptional was her grasp of all subjects discussed by her, that Renan declared her, Elle est presque un homme de génie. She is almost a man of genius. Madame Royer was frequently spoken of, as a candidate for the French Institute, but she was so well aware of the prejudices against the admission of women to membership in this learned body that she never allowed herself to consider the proposal seriously. She was certainly a brainy woman, and in her own department of intellectual effort she exhibited as much talent as did George Sand and Madame de Stahl in literature and history. An entirely different type of woman from the radical and disputious Madame Royer was a charming and cultured lady, Miss Eleanor Ormerod, her contemporary, who in her chosen department of science won both fame and the lasting gratitude of her fellow men. Miss Ormerod, unlike Madame Royer, was preeminently a specialist, and the branch of science in which she achieved distinction was entomology, or rather that branch of it known as economic entomology. From her childhood she manifested an unusual interest in all forms of insects, but particularly in those which are serviceable to mankind, or are destructive to farms and gardens, orchards and forests. Fortunately for the gratification of her peculiar bent of mind, nearly half of Miss Ormerod's life was spent in a locality which was specially favorable to the study of insects which are obnoxious to the gardener, the farmer, and the forester. This was at the confluence of the Wye and Severn, where her father owned a large landed estate, part of which was under cultivation, and part wood and park land. Here the young girl made her first collection of insects, and here she began her studies on the cause and nature of the parasitic attacks upon crops. Here she first realized the frightful ravages that were occasioned by the manifold insect pests that infest not only trees, shrubs, cereals, and vegetables, but also flocks and herds as well and here too she resolved to devote her life to devising preventative and remedial treatment for the evils which were robbing the husbandman of so great a part of the fruits of his toil after taking this generous resolution the life of our young heroine was like that of liebig and pasteur devoted to the welfare of her fellow men and like these noble benefactors of their race her thought was always how she might prevent the losses and increase the products of the tillers of the soil entomology with her was not mere nomenclature a knowledge of strange and fantastic names which with the ignorant constitutes a distinction but one of the most practical and useful of the sciences end of section fifteen section sixteen of woman in science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Michelle. Woman in Science by John Augustine Zahm. Chapter 7. Women in the Natural Sciences. Part 2. Miss Ormerod might, had she so elected, have won fame as a systematic entomologist and as a distinguished contributor to the already long list of genera and species of insects. She might have devoted herself to theoretical work or bent her energies towards the general advancement of the science, like Fabricius, Schwammerdam, Westwood, and Bernmeister, but she preferred to forego all the glory that might accrue from pursuing such a course and to direct her efforts in such wise as to be of most service to humanity like the great pasteur after his long and laborious experimental researches on silkworm diseases miss ormerod could at the end of her illustrious career declare with truth the results which i have obtained are perhaps less brilliant than those which i might have anticipated from researches pursued in the field of pure science but i have the satisfaction of having served my country in endeavouring to the best of my ability to discover the remedy for great misery it is to the honour of a scientific man that he values discoveries which at their birth can only obtain the esteem of his equals far above those which at once conquer the favour of the crowd by the immediate utility of their application but in the presence of misfortune it is equally an honor to sacrifice everything in the endeavor to relieve it miss ormerod's labors were not it is true instrumental in rescuing from destruction a nation's chief industries as were pasteur's in the case of his famous researches on phylloxera of the grapevine or the primarine of the silkworm nor had they to do with such frightful industrial disturbances 
as have frequently been occasioned by the rinderpest or by the potato blight in ireland in eighteen forty five this is true in so far as any one pest is concerned but when one reflects on the scope of miss ormerod's investigations and considers how far-reaching were her researches and how many and diverse industries were embraced by the remedial and prophylactic measures which she proposed one cannot but realize the immense importance of her life work the fact that her activities were confined chiefly to old and well-known pests insects from which the farmer and the gardener and the forester had suffered for centuries and which they had come to regard as necessary and inevitable evils does not detract from the merit and the value of her labors that she should have taken up a work which affected so many people and have been so successful in abating or in entirely removing evils which had so long afflicted agriculturists and stock growers shows that she was a woman of rare courage and determination as well as one of invincible persistence and of intellectual resources of a very high order during more than a quarter of a century miss ormerod devoted practically the whole of her time to the study of economic entomology and to spreading a knowledge of it among her countrymen from eighteen seventy seven to eighteen ninety eight she published annual reports on injurious insects and sent them broadcast throughout great britain and her colonies in addition to this she wrote a number of manuals and textbooks on insects injurious to food crops forest trees orchards and bush fruits nor was this all she also prepared for gratuitous distribution a large number of four-page leaflets on the most common farm pests of the leaflet for instance on the warble fly its life history methods of prevention and remedy no less than a hundred and seventy thousand copies were printed and so great was the demand for her leaflet on the gooseberry red spider that a single mail brought her an order for three thousand copies miss ormerod it is proper to state here received no remuneration whatever for her great services to the public on the contrary she gave not only all her time gratuitously but bore a great part of the expense of printing and distributing her publications the amount of good she thus did unaided and alone cannot be estimated in her leaflet on the warble fly also known as the bot fly she estimates the annual damage to the stock growers of the united kingdom from this pest at from three million pounds to four million pounds the losses due to fruit grain and vegetable insects of various kinds before she began her insect crusade were much greater in great britain and her colonies they amounted to very many millions of pounds sterling every year and most of these losses as she demonstrated were preventable by simple precautions which she eventually succeeded in inducing the people to adopt how much she was instrumental in saving annually to the farmers and gardeners of england by her writings and lectures can only be imagined but the sum must have been immense when we recollect that miss ormerod accomplished all her work before it occurred to the english board of agriculture to appoint a government entomologist we shall realize what a pioneer she was in the career in which she achieved such distinction and through which she conferred such inestimable benefits upon her fellows miss ormerod's entomological publications especially her annual reports brought her into relations with people of all classes throughout the whole world her correspondence in consequence was enormous and not infrequently amounted to from fifty to a hundred letters a day the great entomologists of europe and america held her in the highest esteem and had implicit faith in her judgment in all matters pertaining to her speciality one day she would receive a letter from an english gardener begging for a remedy against the strawberry beetle the next day she would have a similar letter regarding mite galls on black currants or pea weevil larva or clover eel worms again there would be a communication from norway requesting advice about the hessian fly or from argentina asking information concerning a certain kind of destructive grass beetle or from india appealing for help against a pernicious species of forest fly or from south africa seeking a relief from the boot beetle and still again she was consulted by her foreign correspondents about termites which were causing havoc among the young cocoa trees of ceylon or about certain peculiar species of australian larva or about the devastating action of the pine beetle in the scotch forests or about the wheat midge and antler moth in finland one day she had a communication from the austrian embassy regarding a beetle that was eating the oats about constantinople and not long afterwards she received a letter from the chinese minister in london begging for information as to how to prevent the ravages of certain noxious bugs in the lychee orchards of china in view of all these facts it is not surprising that miss ormerod became an active and valued colleague of some of england's most noted scientific men professor huxley said of her in connection with certain work performed by her as a member of one of the committees to which he belonged that she knew more about the business than all the rest put together 
Miss Ormerod's services and attainments, it is gratifying to note, were not without recognition in the highest quarters. Besides being in constant correspondence with the most eminent entomologists of the world, consulting entomologist to the Royal Agricultural Society of England, an examiner in agricultural entomology in the University of Edinburgh, she was a member of many learned societies in both the old and new world. She was also the recipient of many medals, two of which came from Russia. The honor, however, which gave her the most pleasure was the degree of Doctor of Laws, which was conferred on her by the University of Edinburgh. It is the first time this old and conservative institution thus honored a woman, but in honoring Miss Ormerod, it honored itself as well. But when one considers the magnitude of Miss Ormerod's services to her country and to the world, when one reflects on the tens of millions of pounds sterling which she saved the English Empire by her researches and writings, these honors seem trivial and unworthy of the great nation which she so signally benefited. If any of her countrymen had labored so long and so successfully and made so many sacrifices for the welfare of the nation as she had, he would have been knighted or ennobled. But age-long prejudices and traditions will not yet permit England to bestow the same honors on women as on men, no matter how brilliant their attainments or how distinguished their services to the crown and to humanity. Recognition of this kind may possibly come as one of the desirable innovations of the twentieth century. No lover of fair play can deny tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. The names of the women in the United States who have become prominent by their researches and writings in the various branches of the natural sciences would make a long list, and when one recalls the fact that it was only in the latter part of the 19th century that American women were afforded an opportunity to study science, it is a matter of surprise that the list is so extended, for practically no provision was made for the serious pursuit by them of the natural sciences until the opening of Vassar College in 1865, and it was not until the closing years of the century that the portals of many men's colleges were unlocked and thrown open to the hitherto prescribed sect. Considering all the obstacles they had to overcome, the ignorance, the prejudice, the opposition of all kinds they had combined in the United States, women have already accomplished wonders and bid fair to achieve much more in the near future. Now almost every educational institution in the land, private or state, has one or more women professors or associate professors. They teach all the branches of the natural sciences that are taught by their male colleagues botany, geology, mineralogy, zoology, anatomy, bacteriology, and all the numerous subdivisions of these sciences, and they teach them with success and eclat. They also occupy responsible scientific positions in various state and federal institutions. Thus one woman has been the principal of the Denver School of Mines, while another has been the state entomologist for Missouri. Women are also found doing important work in the National Museum, in the Smithsonian Institution, and in the Agricultural Department in Washington as well as in various museums, botanical gardens, and public laboratories of the country from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Among those who have deserved well of science in the United States by their investigations and writings are Olive Thorne Miller and Florence Merriam in Ornithology, Susanna Phelps Gage, Dr. Ida H. Hyde, Mary H. Hinckley, Cornelia M. Clapp, Edith J. and Agnes M. Claypole in Biology, Rose S. Ingemann in Ichthyology, Edith M. Patch, Elizabeth W. Peckman, Emily A. Smith, Cora H. Clark, J. M. Arm Sheldon, Mary Treat, Mary E. Murfelt, Annie T. Slossom in Entomology, Elizabeth G. Britton and Clara E. Cummings in Cryptogamic Botany, Sarah A. Plummer Lemon, Catherine E. Golden, Alice Eastman, and Almira Lincoln Phelps in General Botany. Ada D. Davidson, Ella F. Boyd, and Florence Bascom in Geology. Besides these, special mention should be made of Dr. Julia W. Snow for her work on the microscopical forms of freshwater algae, Anna Botsford Comstock for her contributions to our knowledge of microscopic insects, Catherine J. Bush for her monographs on shallow and deepwater mollusca, Harriet Randolph and Fanny E. Langdon for their studies on worms, and Catherine Foote for her papers on cellular morphology. Particularly notable, too, is the work that has been done on marine invertebrates by Mary J. Rathbun in the United States National Museum, and by Florence Wambaugh Patterson in Vegetable Physiology and Pathology in the Department of Agriculture in Washington. But much as the women just named deserve recognition for their achievements in the various branches of science to which they have severally devoted themselves, the one who will always be specially remembered not only for her valuable contributions to diverse branches of natural science, 
but also for her labors in behalf of higher female education particularly as president of radcliffe college is mrs elizabeth carey agassiz the wife of the celebrated swiss american naturalist who gave such an impetus to the study of natural science in the united states and whose influence on the general advancement of science in all its departments has proved so enduring and so far-reaching as an inspirer of and collaborator with her gifted husband mrs agassiz deserves a large page in the annals of science while as an enthusiastic student of nature and as one who communicated her enthusiasm to her students and at the same time held up before them the highest ideals of womanhood she is sure of a portion of that immortality which has been decreed to her illustrious life partner jean louis agassiz this chapter would not be complete without some reference to the large class of women travelers who directly or indirectly have contributed so much to the advancement of the natural sciences the gifted roumanian writer and traveller princess helena kozol masalski better known under her pseudonym doria diestra somewhere expresses the opinion that a woman traveller admirably supplements the scientific work of the male explorer by bringing to it aptitudes that the latter does not possess for she notes many things in nature as well as in the national life and popular customs of the countries which she traverses which escape the more hebetudinous perceptions of men and thus a vast field that would otherwise remain unknown is open to observation and critical study one of the most noted travellers of her sex in the nineteenth century was the famous ida pfeiffer of austria during the years intervening between eighteen forty two and eighteen fifty eight the date of her death she travels nearly two hundred thousand miles and in so doing visited nearly every quarter of the globe when one recalls the difficulties and discomforts of transportation in the early part of the last century as compared with our present facilities and conveniences and bears in mind the fact that her travelling expenses for an entire year were less than those of a lamartine or chateaubriand for a single week we must admit that her achievements were indeed extraordinary besides being the author of numerous works which had for many years a great vogue books which by reason of the keen observations and the absolutely truthful narratives of their author are still of special value to the student of geography and ethnology she made collections illustrative of botany mineralogy and entomology which were subsequently secured for the british museum and other similar institutions in europe no one more highly appreciated frau pfeiffer's efforts in behalf of science than the illustrious alexander von humboldt whose friendship was one of the greatest joys of this remarkable woman's life through his recommendation and that of the noted geographer karl ritter she was made an honorary member of the geographical society of berlin besides this the king of prussia conferred on her the gold medal for arts and sciences three other women all representatives of great britain likewise deserve notice for their extensive travels and the interesting and instructive accounts which they published of them these are constance gordon cumming isabella bird bishop and amelia b edwards more notable in many respects than these three distinguished women were miss mary h kingsley and madame octavie coudreau for their contributions to science and their daring adventures in savage lands they have won for themselves a unique position among women explorers miss kingsley the niece of the well-known writer and naturalist charles kingsley exhibited much of her uncle's literary ability and love of nature so complete was her intellectual grasp of the most difficult problems and so rare was her overflowing sympathy for all of god's creatures that she was well described as possessing the brain of a man and the heart of a woman in order to get at first-hand information that was necessary to complete a work which her father george kingsley had owing to his premature death left unfinished she determined to visit that part of west africa where all authorities agreed that the africans were at their wildest and worst accompanied only by the natives she travelled among cannibals pushed her way through mangrove swamps and pestilential morasses she spent months in a canoe exploring the territory watered by the calabar and the ogowe rivers often in imminent peril of death from wild animals or wilder men when not studying the manners and the customs of the native tribes she was hunting fishes and reptiles in streams and quagmires and collecting insects in the weird grim twilight of the equatorial forest with its inextricable web of creepers its great hanging tapestries of vines and flowers its myriads of bush ropes suspended from the summits of tall buttressed trees some as straight as plumb lines others coiled round and intertwined among each other until one could fancy one was looking on some mighty battle between the armies of gigantic serpents that had been arrested at its height by some mighty spell the results of miss kingsley's wanderings in this dark and uncanny wilderness and among the savage tribes visited by her were her two instructive volumes entitled travels in west africa and west african studies in addition to these two works from her pen 
there are deposited in the british museum an interesting collection of insects fishes and reptiles many of them new species and some of them named in her honor which testifies to her activity as a collector and her enthusiasm as a naturalist her brilliant and useful career was cut short in cape colony whither she had gone as an army nurse during the boer war in view of her achievements one is not surprised to learn that her countrymen regarded her premature taking off as a national misfortune the noblest monument to her memory is the mary kingsley society of west africa whose object is to carry on as far as may be the beneficent work she began in the west african coast and to accomplish for english rule in this part of the world that what the royal asiatic society has achieved for british administration in india madame coudreau is designated in kievu the french who's who as a exploratress this well characterizes her for if not the first woman explorer by profession she is certainly the most energetic and successful her first work was in french guiana under instructions from the colonial minister of france this was in eighteen ninety four the following year she began the scientific exploration of the province of para in northern brazil in collaboration with her husband henri coudreau who had previously distinguished himself by his achievements as a writer and as an explorer in french guiana the fruit of their joint work from eighteen ninety five to eighteen ninety nine was six quarto volumes profusely illustrated by photographs which they had taken and by carefully executed charts of the various rivers which they had explored while engaged in the exploration of the trombetas a tributary of the amazon henri coudreau was taken seriously ill and after a few days struggle against the disease with which he was stricken he expired in the depths of the forest primeval where he was buried by his desolate and disconsolate widow after such a calamity any other woman would have left the tropics at once and returned to her home and friends not so madame coudreau with matchless courage and determination she buried her grief in the work in which her husband had been so interested and after completing the unfinished survey published the results of this expedition under the title voyage aux trombettes having completed this work she was engaged by the states of para and the amazonas to explore a number of other rivers in the vast territory known as amazonia this commission involved the most arduous and dangerous kind of labor it was a task which few men would have been willing to undertake it is doubtful if any other woman would have ventured on such a expedition and it is quite certain that no one could have been found who was so well equipped for this herculean undertaking or who would have carried it to a more successful issue madame coudreau was in the service of amazonia in the capacity of official explorer from eighteen ninety nine to nineteen o six most of this time she spent the canoe on the affluence of the amazon or in her tent in the dense forest under the equator her only companions were negroes or indians or brazilian half-breeds who served her as porters cooks and boatmen frequently they were in the forest wilds for many months at a time and far away from every vestige of civilized life as it was impossible to take sufficient provisions with them, them during the whole of their journey they had to depend on wild fruits and such fishing game as they were able to secure often they were forced to live for weeks at a time on an unchanging diet of manioc and tapir meat but their sufferings were not confined to hunger and disagreeable often indigestible food there were the heavy steaming atmosphere and the broiling rays of a superheated sun especially when reflected from the mirror-like surface of lake or river which were so debilitating and exhausting the physical exertion of any kind was at times almost impossible there were also the torrential and incessant rains making it impossible for them to cook their food or dry their clothing which added to their miseries whether in camp or in their canoe great however as were their trials on the river they were trifling in comparison with those in the woods here locomotion was impeded by tangled undergrowth which was bound together by strands of lianas and thorny vines which constituted an impenetrable barrier until a passage was hewn through it with a machete underfoot was a yielding morass which threatened to absorb them overhead were countless chigos garapatas and the fire ants which infested the body or buried themselves in the flesh or there were clouds of mosquitoes which gave no rest day or night and worst of all was the ever-present danger of fever and dysentery not to speak of the dread diseases so common in certain sections of the equatorial regions it was then that madame coudreau had had to act the part of a physician as well as of a leader even though she was at the time such a sufferer herself and was barely able to stand to make matters still more difficult for madame coudreau her employees at times especially when under the influence of liquor which they contrived to obtain some way or other became mutinous and refused to accompany her to the end of her journey at other times the expedition was halted by their fear of wild beasts or savage indians or by imaginary evils of many kinds suggested to them by their superstitious minds 
on such occasions madame coudreau never failed to show herself a born leader of men for she invariably alone as she was with a crew who were often half savages was successful in suppressing incipient rebellion and restoring obedience and order continually confronted as she was by such trials and difficulties privations and dangers one would imagine that the delicately reared frenchwoman would have sought immediate relief from an engagement that necessitated so much exposure and suffering and sought surcease of sorrow in the distractions and gaieties of pleasure-loving paris nothing however was farther from her thoughts intrepid and resourceful she feared no danger and hesitated before no difficulty however great as an explorer she was as venturesome as Prevot and as conscientious as la condamine like them who were both her countrymen she spent many years of her life in equinoctial regions and like them she contributed immensely to our knowledge of the land of the southern cross never did the tropics have a greater fascination for any one than for madame coudreau during the twelve years she spent there exploring its rivers and traversing its interminable course the spell of amazonia was ever upon her and was never broken even for a moment i have she writes loved everything in amazonia the great majestic woodland and the mysterious virgin forest the beautiful rivers with their traitorous waters and thundering cataracts the suffocating air and the perfumed breeze the burning sun and the sweet freshness of night the impressive voice of the wind among the trees and the torrential rain and contrary to the usual custom of man of bringing everything under his domination it is i who have become a captive of this savage life which i love and have permitted it to take possession of all my soul and all my will elsewhere she declares in the solitude of the virgin forest i am calm tranquil experience no ennui and am almost merry when i am obliged to leave the great woodland the power to struggle grows less in me i become of an excessive sensibility i feel more keenly life's blows i am not armed for elbowing my way and making a place for myself in the sunshine i neither love nor understand anything except my virgin forest there indeed i suffer from the inclemency of the weather from hunger from sickness but these are only physical sufferings and are soon forgotten while moral and interior pains on the contrary are irradicable and still again she tells us the solitude of the virgin forest has become a necessity for me it attracts me by its mysterious silence and only in the great woods have i the impression of being at home can we wonder that such an ardent lover of nature and such a strenuous votary of science was able to forget herself in her work and was able notwithstanding her toils and her sufferings to produce six quattro volumes of reports in as many years on the unexplored regions which she had so carefully surveyed and charted can we be surprised that her labors received due recognition from learned societies in both the new and the old world and that she was acclaimed as an explorer who had rendered distinct service to the cause of natural science as well as to geography when we recall the labors of this lone daughter of france in the wilds of the tropics with no one to communicate with except her half-civilized servants and boatmen we instinctively hark back to days not long past and estimate the enormous progress women have made in social and intellectual freedom then but within a few decades owing to the policy of repression which so long prevailed regarding the intellectual efforts of women and the social obstacles which prevented them from publicly acknowledging the offspring of their genius women like the bronte sisters george sand and george eliot were compelled to conceal their identity under male designations because it was considered immodest for a woman to appear before the public as an author lady Narn, after burns the most popular songwriter in scotland felt obliged to keep secret the authorship of her beautiful poems similarly family honor made it incumbent on fanny mendelssohn to refrain from publishing her musical compositions under her own name accordingly they appeared along with those of her brother felix and so similar are they in color and sentiment to his own productions that they are indistinguishable from them unless the author's signature be attached to satisfy an inane public opinion they long contributed to swell the volume of her brother's fame and there is reason to believe that some of them still appear under his name at the present day yes truly when one recalls these and similar facts one cannot help exclaiming what a marvellous change in the attitude of the world towards women within the memories of those still living women like miss ormerod miss kinsley madame coudreau would have been ostracized if they had dared to attempt in the days of lady narn the bronte sisters and fanny mendelssohn what they may now do only without censure but without exciting more than passing comment the ban has been lifted from what was for ages taboo for women and the sphere of their intellectual activities is now almost coexistent with that of the sterner sex not only does society no longer point the finger of scorn at the woman naturalist or the woman explorer but it showers honors on her while living and erects monuments to her memory when dead 
a great change indeed and one long and ardently desired verily tempora mutantur nos et mutamur in illis end of chapter seven section seventeen of woman and science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by bologna times woman in science by john augustine zam chapter eight part one women in medicine and surgery as woman was the first nurse so was she also the first practitioner of the healing art among savages the world over it is the women in the great majority of cases who have the care of the sick and wounded and who by reason of their superior knowledge of simples for the cure of diseases occupy the position of doctors in certain parts of the uncivilized world there are it is true shamans or medicine men but these are conjurers or exorcists who profess to expel disease or rather the evil spirits causing the disease by sorcery or incantation rather than physicians who essay to cure ailments or relieve suffering by the use of substances which experiences showed to possess remedial properties in a word the shaman is a kind of a religious functionary who imposes on the ignorance of his tribe and who holds his position by the fear he excites and not by any knowledge he possesses of the healing art it was the same we may believe in the early history of our race women and not men were the first physicians and they were also most probably the first surgeons according to greek mythology the god of the medical art was Aesculapius, a male but his six daughters as antiquity beautifully expressed it were not only goddesses but were also medical mistresses artifices medici of suffering humanity of these hygeia was specially distinguished as the goddess of health or rather as the conserver of good health while panacea was invoked as the restorer of health after it had been impaired or lost one of the most beautiful pictures in the iliad is that representing the daughter of Aegea, king of the epi caring for the wounded and suffering greeks on the plain before troy she was his eldest born hight agamedi with golden hair a leech was she and well she knew all herbs on ground that grew nothing deterred by the den of battle around her she provided cordial potions for the disabled warrior and prepared the gentle bath and washed their gory wounds what a beautiful prototype of another ministering angel in the same land nearly thirty centuries later amid similar scenes of suffering of one who though unsung by immortal bard the world will never let die the courageous the self-sacrificing florence nightingale that there were in greece from the earliest times numerous women possessed of a high degree of medical skill is evidenced by many of the ancient writers they were what we would call medical herbalists and not a few of them exhibited a natural genius for determining the curative virtues of rare plants and a remarkable sagacity in preparing from them juices infusions and soothing anodynes others there were who in addition to evincing the cunning of leechcraft in the therapeutic art were distinguished for nimble hands in treating painful lesions and festering sores and who when occasion required were experts in quickly drawing the barb from the flesh and healing the wound of the soldier in the odyssey special mention is made of the surpassing expertness of the egyptian female leech polydamna whose name signifies the subduer of many diseases the land of the nile the poet tells us teems with drugs and there every man in skill medicinal excels for these are sons of pain all in this favored cradle of civilization to which greece owed so much of its knowledge and culture there were many women who like polydemna achieved distinction in the healing art and many too we have reason to think who communicated their knowledge to their sisters in the fair land of hellas 
but not only were there in greece women physicians like agamede who were noted for their general medicinal knowledge and practice but there were also others who made a specialty of treating ailments peculiar to their own sex this we learn from a passage in the hippolytus of euripides wherein the nurse of phaedra addressed the suffering queen in the following words if under pains thou labor such as may not be revealed to succor thee thy female friends are here but if the other sex may know thy sufferings let the physician try his healing art more positive information however is afforded us by the ancient roman author hyginus who in writing of the greek maiden agnodici tells us how the medical profession was legalized for all the free-born women of athens instead of a literal translation of hyginus the version of his story is given in the quaint language of one mrs celior a noted midwife in the reign of james the second among the subtle athenians writes mrs seller a law at one time forbade women to study or practice medicine or physic on pain of death which law continued some time during which many women perished both in child-bearing and by private diseases their modesty not permitting them to admit of men either to deliver or cure them but god finally stirred up the spirit of agnodici a noble maid to pity the miserable condition of her own sex and hazard her life to help them which to enable herself to do she apparelled her like a man and became the scholar of hierophilos the most learned physician of the time and having learnt the art she found out a woman that had long languished under private diseases and made proffer of her service to cure her which the sick person refused thinking her to be a man but when agnodici discovered that she was a maid the woman committed herself into her hands who cured her perfectly and after her many others with the like skill and industry so that in a short time she became the successful and beloved physician of the whole sex when it became known that agnodici was a woman she was like to be condemned to death for transgressing the law which coming to the ears of the noble women they ran before the areopagites and the house being encompassed by most women of the city the ladies entered before the judges and told them they would no longer account them for husbands and friends but for cruel enemies that condemned her to death who restored to them their health protesting they would all die with her if she were put to death this caused the magistrates to disannul the law and make another which gave gentlewomen leave to study and practice all parts of physic to their own sex giving large stipends to those that did it well and carefully and there were many noble women who studied that practice and taught it publicly in their schools as long as athens flourished in learning after the time of agnodici many greek women won distinction in medicine some as practitioners in the healing art others as writers on medical subjects nor were their activities confined to the land of hellas they were also found succoring the infirm and instructing the poor and ignorant in italy egypt and asia minor among these was theano the wife of pythagoras who after her husband's death assumed charge of his school of philosophy and who like her husband and teacher was distinguished for her attainments in medicine the names of many others occur in the pages of hippocrates galen and pliny and frequent references are made to the works and prescriptions of women doctors who enjoyed more than ordinary celebrity during their time of these female practitioners many confined their practice to the diseases of women and children while others excelled in surgery and pharmacy as well as in general medical practice among the medical women whom antiquity especially honored particularly during the greco-roman period were origenia aspasia not the famous wife of pericles and cleopatra who was not however as is often asserted the ill-fated queen of egypt 
likewise deserving of special mention was metrodora of whom there is still preserved in florence a manuscript work on the diseases of women and antiochus to whom her admiring countrymen erected a statue bearing the following inscription antiochus daughter of diodotus of tlos the council and the commune of the city of tlos in appreciation of her medical ability erected at their own expense the statue in her honor pliny the naturalist felicitates the romans on having been for nearly six hundred years free from the brood of doctors these he does not hesitate to berate roundly his statement regarding the non-existence of physicians it must be observed is somewhat exaggerated it is true that during the first five centuries there were no professional doctors who lived entirely on their practice there were however many men who had by long experience gained an extensive knowledge of drugs and simples and who were able to dress wounds and treat diseases with considerable success the first greek freeman to practice medicine in rome was one archegatos about two centuries b c he was soon followed by one of his countrymen named Asclepiades. these two soon built up a great reputation as successful practitioners and were held in the highest esteem by the people of rome in consequence of this and of the favorable conditions offered foreigners for the practice of the healing art there was soon a large influx of physicians and surgeons from greece not only into rome but also into other parts of italy not long after the arrival of greek doctors in the capital of the roman world we learn of certain women physicians in rome who were held in high repute among these were victoria and leoparda both mentioned by the medical writer theodorus priscianus to victoria priscianus dedicates the third book of his rerum medicarum and in the preface to this book he refers to her as one who has not only an accurate knowledge of medicine but also as one who is a keen observer and experienced practitioner the word medica which occurs in latin authors of the classical period testifies to the existence of the woman doctor as early as the age of augustus but the most important documents bearing on women physicians not only in the city of rome but also in italy gaul and the iberian peninsula are the large body of epigraphic monuments which have recently been brought to light and which prove beyond all doubt that women were not only obstetricians but that they were successful practitioners in the entire field of medical art thus a funeral tablet found in portugal tells of a woman who was a most excellent physician medica optima while another describes the deceased not only as a woman incomparable for her virtues but also as a mistress of medical science antistes discipline in medicina fui the greek word for medica Itromea, occasionally found in some of the inscriptions, seems to refer specially to women of Greek origin or birth. This is particularly true of a monument erected to one valet, who is designated as Callista Itromea, the best doctor. Among the many women who became converts to Christianity during the early ages of the church, a goodly number were physicians unfortunately our information respecting these votaries of the healing art is not as complete as we could wish one of the most noted of them is st theodosia whose name is given in the roman martyrology for the twenty ninth of may she was the mother of the martyr st procopius and was distinguished for her knowledge of medicine and surgery both of which she practised in rome with the most signal success she died a heroic death by the sword during the persecution of diocletian another woman who was as eminent for her knowledge of medicine as for her holiness of life was st nicerata who lived in constantinople during the reign of the emperor arcadius she is said to have cured st john chrysostom of an affection of the stomach from which he was a sufferer 
to the roman lady fabiola remarkable as the daughter of one of the most illustrious patrician families of rome but more remarkable for her sanctity and her boundless charity toward the poor was due the erection of the first hospital a noble structure which she founded in ostia at the mouth of the tiber which was then the port of entry to the capital of the roman empire here the noble matron received the poor and suffering from all parts and did everything in her power to afford them succor in their wants and infirmities it is difficult for us now when hospitals and charitable institutions of all kinds are so common to understand what an innovation fabiola's unheard-of institution was considered by her contemporaries for her method of treating the needy and the suffering was as different from that which had hitherto obtained as were the debasing lessons of heathendom from the elevating precepts of the gospels no wonder that the news of this godlike work was soon wafted to the uttermost bounds of the earth that in the words of st jerome summer should announce in britain what egypt and parthia had learned in the spring no wonder that the same eloquent hermit of bethlehem should proclaim the foundress of this home of the indigent and the afflicted to be the glory of the church the astonishment of the gentiles the mother of the poor and the consolation of the saints no wonder that in contemplating her countless acts of charity he should ignore the fact that fabiola was a daughter of the fabi and a descendant of the renowned quintus maximus who by his sage counsel had saved his country from her enemies and that recalling the words of virgil he should declare if i had a hundred tongues and a hundred mouths and iron lungs i should not be able to enumerate all the maladies to which fabiola gave the most prodigal care and tenderness to the extent even of making the poor who were in health envy the good fortune of those who were sick no wonder that fabiola's funeral which brought together the whole of rome was more like an apotheosis than the transfer of the remains of the deceased to their last resting-place and that jerome should declare the glory of furius and papyrus and scipio and pompey when they triumphed over the gauls the samites numantia and pontus was less than that which was spontaneously accorded to fabiola the solace of the sick and the comforter of the distressed for she had in her hospital at ostia established a type of institution that was to effect more for ameliorating the condition of suffering humanity than anything that had before been dreamed of something that was to contribute immensely to the efforts of physicians and surgeons in minimizing the sad ravages of wounds and disease something whose beneficent effects were to be felt through the centuries and in every part of the world down to the wards of the military hospital at scutari guarded by the watchful eyes of florence nightingale and to the leper tenanted lazarettos blessed by the ministrations of father damien and the sisters of charity on the desolate shores of plague-stricken molokai after the fall of the roman empire and through the long period of the middle ages when the monasteries and convents were almost the only centers of learning and culture for the greater part of europe the practice of medicine was to a great extent in the hands of monks and nuns for every religious house was then a hospital as well as a school a place where drugs and ointments were compounded and distributed as well as a place where manuscripts were transcribed and illuminated at a time when there were but few professional physicians and when these few were widely separated from one another the only places where the poor could always be sure to find free medical treatment as well as abundant alms were those sanctuaries of knowledge and charity where the love of one's neighbor was never lost sight of in the love of science and literature and during this time too the care of the sick was regarded as a duty incumbent on every one but particularly on those devoted to the service of god in religion it was considered above all as a duty devolving on women 
especially on the lady in the castle, and on the nun in the convent. The old romance of Sir Isambras gives us a charming picture of the nuns of long ago receiving the wounded knight and ministering unto him until he was made whole and strong, as witness the following verses. The nuns of him they were full fain, for that he had the Saracen slain, and those heathen hounds, and of his pains Sergain them rule, like a day they made Saul's new and laid them till his wounds they gave him metis and drinketh lithe and healed the knight wonder swithe so universally during medieval times was the healing art considered as pertaining to woman's calling that it became a part of the curriculum in convent schools and no girl's education was considered complete unless she had an elementary knowledge of medicine and of that part of surgery that deals with the treatment of wounds for during those troublous times a woman was liable to be called upon at any time to nurse the sick wayfarer, or dress the wounds of those who had been maimed in battle or in the tourney. Illustrations of these facts are found in many of the romances and fabliaux of the Middle Ages. Thus, when a sick or wounded man was given hospitality in a chateau or castle, it was not the seigneur, but his wife, and daughters, as being better versed in medicine and surgery, who acted as nurses and doctors, and took entire charge of the patient until his recovery. In the exquisite little story of Ocasin et Nicolette, the heroine is pictured as setting the dislocated shoulder of her lover in the following simple but touching language. Nicolette searched his hurt, and perceived that his shoulder was out of joint. She handled it so deftly with her white hands, and used such skilful surgery that, by the grace of God, who loveth all true lovers, the shoulder came back to its place. Then she plucked flowers and fresh grasses and green leafage, and bound them tightly about the setting, with the hem torn from her shift, and he was altogether healed. And in the medieval Latin poem, Waltharius, written by a German monk, Eckhard, Reference is made to a sanguinary contest in which one of the combatants falls to the earth seriously wounded. Seeing this, Alpharides, in a loud voice, summons a young girl, who timidly comes forward and dresses the unfortunate man's wound. Still more to our purpose is a passage from the famous epic poem Tristan and Isolde, written by Godfrey of Strasbourg, in which Isolde, accompanied by her mother and cousin is represented as administering restoratives to tristan who had fallen exhausted after his combat with the dragon it shows that women in accompanying an army to the field of battle always went provided with bandages and medicaments for dressing wounds and fractured limbs similarly angelica in orlando furioso and ermina in jerusalem delivered are portrayed as surgeons with deftness of hand and leeches with rare knowledge and skill the frequent introduction of women doctors into the poems and romances of the middle ages would of itself if other evidence were wanting suffice to show what an important role women played in medicine and surgery at a time when in many parts of europe women were far better educated and far more cultured than men when the knights and barons of france and germany were inclined to look upon reading and writing as unmanly and almost degrading accomplishments fit only for priests or monks and especially for priests or monks not too well born in the instances just quoted, as well as those mentioned by Homer and Euripides, the writers do no more than faithfully reflect conditions which then obtain, and truthfully report what were the occupations of women when their status was so different from what it is today. But fortunately, we do not have to rely on works of the imagination for our knowledge respecting the women practitioners of the healing art, either during the Homeric period or during that which intervened between the downfall of Rome and the dawn of the Renaissance. 
for the history of medicine during medieval times affords too many examples of women who became famous for their knowledge of medicine as well as for their success in surgical and medical practice to leave any doubt about the matter besides this we have still the writings of many of these women and are thus able to judge of their competency in those branches of knowledge on which they shed so great luster one of the most noted of them was the benedictine abbess st hildegard of bingen on the rhine who was eminent not only as a theologian but also as a writer whose treatises on various branches of science are justly regarded as the most important productions of the kind during the middle ages prior to the time of albertus magnus besides this she not only wrote many books on materia medica on pathology physiology and therapeutics but as a practitioner she gloriously sustained the best traditions of her sex in both theoretical and practical medicine her work entitled liber simplicis medicina which deals with what in the saint's time was called simples for the belief was then current that each plant or herb was or provided a specific for some disease contains accounts of many plants used in materia medica as well as statements of their importance in therapeutics her descriptions often indicate an observer of exceptionally keen perception and one whose knowledge of science was far in advance of her epoch the same observations may be made respecting hildegard's work liber compositae medicinae in which she treats of the causes signs and treatment of diseases still more remarkable in many respects is a treatise in nine books entitled physica or liber subtilitatum diversarum naturarum creaturarum which among other things treats of the various elements of plants trees minerals fish birds quadrupeds and of the manner in which they may be of service to man of so great importance was this book considered that several editions of it were printed as early as the sixteenth century no less an authority than the late rudolf virchow the founder of cellular pathology characterizes it as an early materia medica curiously complete considering the age to which it belongs and Hazer, in his history of medicine directs attention to the historical value of the book declaring it to be an independent german treatise based chiefly on popular experience dr f a royce of the university of Würzburg, at the conclusion of his prolegomena to the physica published in ming's patrologia expresses himself as follows regarding the writings and medical knowledge of the illustrious abbess of bingen among all the saintly religieuses who during the middle ages practiced medicine or wrote treatises on it the first without contradiction is hildegard according to the monk theodoric who was an eye-witness she had to so high a degree the gift of healing that no sick person had recourse to her without being restored to health there is among the books of this prophetic version a work which treats of physics and medicine its title is de natura nominis elementorum diversarum creaturarum and it embodies as the same theodoric fully explains the secrets of nature which were revealed to the saint by the prophetic spirit all who wish to write the history of the medical and natural sciences should read this book in which the holy virgin initiated into all the secrets of nature which were then known and having received special assistance from above thoroughly examines and scrutinizes all that which was until then buried in darkness and concealed from the eyes of mortals it is certain that hildegard was acquainted with many things of which the doctors of the middle ages were ignorant and which the investigators of our own age after rediscovering them have announced as something entirely new the life and works of st hildegard throw a flood of light on many subjects that have long been veiled in mystery it explains why the convents of the later middle ages were so famed as curative centres and why the sick flocked to them for relief from far and near 
It reveals the real agencies employed in effecting the extraordinary cures that were reported in so many religious houses, cures so extraordinary that they were usually regarded by the multitude as miraculous, and discloses the secret of the success of so many nuns in the alleviation of physical and mental sufferings. It was not because they were thaumaturges, but because they were good nurses, and because of their thorough knowledge of the healing art, that they were able to diagnose and prescribe for diseases of all kinds, with a success which, in the estimation of the multitude, savored of the supernatural. There was also another reason for the fame of convents as sanctuaries of health. They were usually situated in healthy locations where there was an abundance of pure water, fresh air, and cheerful sunshine. Then there were likewise a wholesome diet, good sanitary conditions, and above all, regularity of life. The same can be said of the hospitals connected with the convents. They were not like some of the public hospitals of the 18th and 19th centuries in many of the large cities of Europe, repulsive, prison-like structures with narrow windows and devoid of light and air and the most necessary hygienic appliances, institutions that were hospitals in name but which were, in reality, too frequently breeding places of disease and death. Unlike these, the hospitals presided over by nuns of the type of Hildegard were splendid roomy structures with large windows and abundance of light, pure air, with special provisions for the privacy of the patients, and with sanitary arrangements that not only precluded the dissemination of disease, but which contributed materially to those marvelous cures which the good people of the time attributed to supernatural agencies, rather than to the medical knowledge and skill of the devoted nuns, who were the real conquerors of disease and death. But the inmates of the cloister were not the only women who, during the Middle Ages, achieved distinction by their writings on medical subjects, and by their signal success in the practice of the healing art. In various parts of Europe, but especially in Italy and France, there were, at this time, among women, outside as well as inside convent walls, many daughters of Escalapias and sisters of Hygieia who stood in such high repute among their contemporaries that they received the same honors and emoluments as were accorded to their masculine colleagues. This was particularly the case in Salerno, which was the venerated mother of all Christian medical schools, and which, for nine centuries, was universally regarded as the unquestioned fountain and archetype of orthodox medicine. Situated on the Gulf of Salerno, and loved by the cerulean waters of the Tyrrhenian Sea, the Civitas Hippocratica, as it was called on its metals, rejoiced in a salubrious climate, and was celebrated throughout the world as the city sacred to Phoebus, the sedulous nurse of Minerva, the fountain of physic, the votary of medicine, the handmaid of nature, the destroyer of disease, and the strong adversary of death. For to this favored city flocked from all quarters the lame and the halt and those afflicted with the tortures of disease and the disabilities of advancing years. The noble and the simple, crowned heads as well as the poorest of the poor, were found there, all of them in quest of life's most precious boon, health and strength. Never did the far-famed sanctuary of the god of medicine in Epidaurus witness such an influx of invalids as gathered in the hospitals of Salerno and pressed through the streets of the Hippocratic city, seeking the aid of those doctors whose marvelous cures had given them a worldwide reputation. Small wonder, then, that the regimen Sentatus Salernitanum that famous code of health of the school of Salerno has been translated into almost all the languages of modern Europe, and that since 1480 no fewer than 250 editions of it have been published. Not to have been familiar with it from beginning to end, not to have been able to quote it orally as occasion might require, would, during the Middle Ages, have cast serious suspicion upon the professional culture of any physician but the noblest claims of the hippocratic city to the gratitude of humanity yet remain to be told 
a german traveller in the thirteenth century wrote laudibus aeternum nullum negat esse salernum eloc pro morbus totus circumfluit orbis this was because salerno was universally recognized as the day star and morning glory of the best culture in the healing art and still more because of the thorough instruction she gave in her schools of medicine and the preeminence she so long held in every department of medical lore the course of study in medicine was long and thorough and the candidate applying for a degree had to pass a rigid examination and give proof not only of his proficiency in every branch of the healing art but also of perfect acquaintance with the various branches of science and letters as well at the time of frederick II, who organized all the different schools of salerno into a single university a three years course in philosophy and literature was required before one could present himself for entrance into the school of medicine the courses in medicine lasted five years at least after which a year of practice with an old physician was required in addition to this if the candidate wished to practice surgery he was obliged to devote one year to the study of human anatomy and to the dissection of human bodies considering the progress of knowledge since the time of frederick second it must be admitted that the legal requirements enforced by the faculty of salerno compare favorably with those of the best of our medical schools of to-day still more to the credit of salerno long known as the athens of the two sicilies was her boundless liberality towards scholarship and culture regardless of sex for with a chivalrous admiration for intellect wherever found and with a sense of intellectual justice that has put to shame all medical schools outside of italy until less than fifty years ago the school of salerno was the first to throw open its portals to women as well as men and give to an admiring world a number of women those celebrated moliere's salernitane who were eminent not only as physicians but also as professors of the theory and practice of medicine for this reason if for no other it can be truly affirmed that no school of medicine in any age or country if only for this can ever overpeer her in renown and even as formerly in the universities of europe as the bare mention of the name of the learned Cujacius of Europe, every scholar instinctively uncovered himself, so at the very name of Salernum, the fount and nurse of rational medicine, every physician should recall her memory with mute thanks and secret ecstasy, as among the most spotless and venerated chapters in the history of his art. The most noted professor and successful practitioner among the women of Salerno was Trotula, wife of the distinguished physician john platerius and a member of the old noble family of the rogerio she flourished during the eleventh century and enjoyed a reputation as a physician that was not inferior to that of the most noted doctors of her time besides occupying a chair in the school of medicine and having an extensive practice she was the author of many works on medicine which had a great vogue among her contemporaries some of them especially those relating to diseases of her own sex were published several times after the invention of printing and many manuscript copies of her works are still found in various libraries of europe but she did not confine her practice to the diseases of women she was also very well versed in general medicine and exhibited besides as her works testify marked skill as a surgeon in many cases that would even now be considered as peculiarly difficult of treatment one of her books was entitled de compositione medicamentorum the compounding of medicaments and it was this work doubtless that gave her much of the fame she enjoyed beyond the confines of italy rutboff a noted french trouvere of the thirteenth century gives us a quaint picture of a scene frequently witnessed in his day crowds were frequently attracted by herbalists vendors of simples who stationed at street corners or in other public places near tables covered with a cloth of flaring colors were wont to discount somewhat after the style of certain of our patent medicine hawkers and quack solvers upon the extraordinary 
curative properties of the various drugs and panaceas which they had for sale. Good people, one of these traveling herb doctors would begin, I am not one of those poor preachers, nor one of those poor herbalists who carry boxes and sachets and spread them out on a carpet. No, I am a disciple of a great lady named Madame Trott of Salerno, who performs such marvels of every kind. And know ye that she is the wisest woman in the four quarters of the world. Ordericus Vitalis, an English Benedictine monk, in his Historia Ecclesiastica, tells of the impression made by Trotula on Rudolfo Malacorona, one of those famous itinerant scholars of the Middle Ages, who spent their lives in wandering from one university to another in pursuit of knowledge. He had been a student from his youth, and was a man of remarkable attainments in every department of learning. After visiting and conferring with the learned men of the most celebrated universities of France and Italy, he finally arrived at Salerno, where, he informs us, he found no one who could cope with him in disputation, except quantum sapientem metronum, a very learned woman. This was Trocello who, by reason of the extraordinary cures she effected, was known among her contemporaries as Magistra Operis, a consummate practitioner. When, however, we consider the thorough course of study that every one aspiring to a degree in medicine was obliged to complete, women as well as men, it is not so surprising that Trocella should be regarded both as a learned woman and as a successful physician. Among other women doctors who did honor to Salerno, and whose names have come down to us, were three who are known in history as Abella, Rebecca di Guarna, and Mercuriata. All of them achieved a great reputation by their writings on medical subjects, especially Mercuriata, who distinguished herself in surgery as well as in medicine. Still another woman deserving special mention is Francesca wife of Matteo di Romana, of Salerno. After passing a very severe examination before a board composed of physicians and surgeons, she was accorded the doctorate in surgery. An official document of the time referring to this event reads as follows. Whereas the laws permit women to practice medicine, and whereas, from the viewpoint of good morals, women are best adapted to the treatment of their own sex, we, after having received the oath of fidelity, permit the said Francesca to practice the said art of healing, etc. In view of the facts above mentioned regarding the University of Salerno, the excellence of its work, its liberality and breadth of view, its attitude toward the higher education of women, and its preeminence for so many centuries as a school of medicine, it is surprising that it was, until comparatively recent times, considered the mater e caput of medical authority in ethical matters, and that, so late as 1748, the medical faculty of Paris should address an official letter to the faculty of Salerno requesting its judgment regarding the rights of precedence as between physicians and surgeons. But what is surprising, and what too passes all understanding, is that the University of London, after being empowered by royal charter to do all things that could be done by any university, was legally advised that it could not grant degrees to women without a fresh charter, because no university had ever granted such degrees. End of chapter 8, part 1section 18 of woman and science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by bologna times woman and science by john augustine zam chapter 8 part 2 while women were winning such laurels in salerno in every department of the healing art their sisters north of the alps were not idle as early as twelve ninety two there were in paris no less than eight women doctors called miresses or medicines whose names have come down to us 
not to speak of those who practiced in other parts of france there was also a certain number of women who devoted themselves to surgery and called by the old latin authors of the time chirurgery in paris however conditions for studying and practicing medicine and surgery were far from being as favorable to women as they were in salerno as there were no schools open to them for the study of these branches they had to depend entirely for such knowledge as they were able to acquire on the aid they could get from practicing doctors the reading of medical books and their own experience the consequence was that they were not at all so well equipped for their work as were the women who enjoyed all the exceptional advantages offered the students at salerno none of them was noted for scholarship none of them was a writer of books and only one of them jacob felici about whom more presently rose above mediocrity the reason for the great difference between the conditions of the women doctors of paris and those of salerno is not far to seek the faculty of medicine in paris was from the beginning of its existence unalterably opposed to female medical practitioners as early as twelve twenty it promulgated an edict prohibiting the practice of medicine by any one who did not belong to the faculty and according to its constitutions and by-laws only unmarried men were eligible to membership for a long time the edict remained a dead letter but eventually as the faculty grew in power and influence it was able to enforce the observance of its decrees one of its first victims was jacob felici just mentioned who was hailed before court for practicing medicine in contravention of its edict issued many years before jacob felice was a woman of noble birth and had won distinction by her success in the healing art as the testimony at her trial revealed she never treated the sick for the sake of gain in nearly all cases the sick who had addressed themselves to her had been abandoned by their own physicians all the witnesses who had been called testified that they had been cured by jacob felice and all expressed their deepest gratitude to her for her care and devotion but in spite of all these facts and in spite of the brilliant defense that this worthy woman made she was condemned to pay a heavy fine condemned because as the indictment read she had presumed to put her sickle into the harvest of others falcium in messem mitir alienum and this was a crime the faculty was a close corporation and insisted that its members should have a monopoly of all the honors and emoluments that were to accrue from the treatment of the sick and suffering what a curious adumbration of similar proceedings within memory of many still living the prosecution of jacob felice recalls that of agnodici in greece long ages before and the plea urged for the necessity of a female physician that many a woman would rather die than reveal the secrets of her infirmity to a man was the same as that offered by the women of athens before the council of the areopagus it was the same agonizing cry that had been heard thousands of times before and which has been heard thousands of times since isabella of castile was not the first of the long list of victims who, for lack of a doctor of their own sex, have been sacrificed through womanly modesty, and more's the pity, she will not be the last. Unfortunately, for the women of France, the result of the prosecution of Madame Felice was the very reverse of that instituted against Agnodici, for the latter came off victorious, while the former was condemned and punished so crushing was the blow dealt to women practitioners outside of obstetrics that they did not recover from its effects for more than five hundred years for it was not until eighteen sixty eight that the ecole de medicine of paris opened its doors to women and it was not until nearly twenty years later that female physicians were able to enter the hospitals of the french capital as interns until quite recent years there is very little to be said of women physicians in england and germany their practice outside of that of certain herb doctors was confined chiefly to midwifery 
there was no provision made in either of these countries for the education of women in medicine and surgery and such a thing as a college where they could receive instruction in the healing art was unknown it is true that an ecclesiastical law of edgar king of england permitted women as well as men to practice medicine but this law was subsequently abolished by henry v during the reign of henry viii a law was again enacted in favor of women physicians for at that time an act was passed for the relief and protection of diverse honest sons as well men as women whom god hath endued with the knowledge of the nature kind and operation of certain herbs roots and waters and the using and ministering them to such as be pained with customable diseases for neighborhood and god's sake and of pity and charity because that the company and fellowship of surgeons of london minding only their own lucres and nothing the profit or case of the diseased or patient have sued vexed and troubled the aforesaid honest sons who were henceforth to be allowed to practice use and minister in and to any outward sore swelling or disease any herbs ointments baths pulses or plasters according to their cooning experience and knowledge without suit vexation penalty or loss of their goods the italicized words in this quotation prove that the women doctors of england had the same difficulties as their sisters in france and that the real reason of the opposition of the male practitioners was that they wished to monopolize the practice of medicine they like the medical faculty of paris strenuously objected to women putting the sickle into their harvest and they accordingly left nothing undone to circumvent the intrusion of those whom they always regarded as undesirable competitors it was argued by the men that women to begin with lacked the strength and capacity necessary for medical practice it was also urged that it was indelicate and unwomanly for the gentler sex to engage in the healing art and that for their own good they should be excluded from it at all costs those who were willing to waive these objections contended that women had not the knowledge necessary for the profession of medicine and should be excluded on the score of ignorance when women sought to qualify themselves for medical practice by seeking instruction under licensed practitioners or in medical schools they found a deaf ear turned to their requests the doctors declined to teach them and the medical schools one and all closed the doors against them thus it was that in england france and germany the practice of medicine and surgery was always practically in the hands of men until only a generation ago even the english midwives gradually fell from their high estate and were left far behind the female obstetricians of germany and france for these two countries can point to a number of midwives who by their knowledge successful practice and the books they wrote achieved a celebrity that still endures chief among these in germany were regina joseph von siebold her daughter carlotta and frau theresa frey all of whom in the early part of the last century enjoyed an enviable reputation in the fatherland the first named after following a course of lectures on physiology and the diseases of women and children and passing a brilliant examination in the medical college of darmstadt devoted herself to the practice of obstetrics and with so great success that the university of geisen in 1819 conferred on her the degree of doctor of obstetrics her daughter carlotta after studying obstetrics under her mother went to the university of gottingen where she devoted herself to physiology anatomy and pathology after passing an examination and successfully defending a number of theses in the university of geisen she was also proclaimed a doctor of obstetrics at a later date frau frei received a similar degree more noted as acochuses and gynecologists than the three distinguished women just mentioned were madame marie louise la chapelle and madame marie bovin who 
shortly after the french revolution entered upon those wonderful careers in their chosen specialties which have given them so unique a place in the annals of medicine madame la chapelle was particularly celebrated for the numerous improvements she effected in lying in hospitals for the large number of skilled midwives whom she furnished not only to france but also to the whole of europe and above all for the excellent treatises which she wrote on obstetrics which gave her a reputation second to none among her contemporaries men or women her pratique des accouchements in three volumes based on the immense number of fifty thousand cases at which she presided reveals an operator of rarest skill and genius this production was long regarded as a standard work on the topics discussed and for years exerted an immense influence in the medical world less skillful as an operator but of greater ability as a doctor than madame la chapelle was her illustrious contemporary madame bovin possessing extraordinary insight as an investigator and marvellous sagacity as a diagnostician madame bovin achieved the distinction of being the first really great woman doctor of modern times her marvellous success as a practitioner dupuytren said she had an eye at the tip of her finger her extended knowledge of the entire range of gynecology but above all her numerous treatises on the subject matter of her life work gave her a prestige that none of her sex had ever before enjoyed and commanded the admiration of the doctors of the world her memorial de la art des accouchements passed through many editions and was translated into several european languages and so highly were her scientific attainments valued in germany that the university of marburg recognized them by conferring on her honoris causa the degree of doctor of medicine and had its rules permitted the admission of women the royal academy of medicine would have honored her with a place among its members she was also the recipient of many other honors besides being a member of several learned societies but the greatest monument to her genius at large is a large illustrated treatise in two volumes in which she exhibits a wonderful knowledge of anatomy physiology surgery pathology and therapeutics it gave her a large following in germany as well as in france and there were not wanting distinguished german accoucheurs who followed madame bovin's teachings to the letter the remarkable german and french women just named were all practically self-made women they won fame as they had acquired knowledge chiefly by courage in spite of the countless obstacles that beset their paths they owed nothing to schools or universities nothing to government patronage or assistance nothing to the medical fraternity as a whole universities would not admit them to their lecture rooms or laboratories and the various medical faculties opposed them as intruders into their jealously guarded domain and as competitors whose aspirations were to be frustrated whatever the means employed it is true that when some of the women mentioned had won world-wide renown by their achievements they were made the recipients of belated honors by certain universities and learned societies but these societies and universities were then honoring themselves as much as the women who received their degrees and diplomas of membership how different it was in italy which since the fall of the roman empire has ever been in the van of civilization and which has always continued the best traditions of greco-roman learning and culture italy which had been the home of such supreme masters of literature science art as dante petrarch galileo leonardo da vinci raphael michelangelo brunelleschi italy the mother of universities the birthplace of the renaissance and the recognized leader of intellectual progress among the nations of the world here in the favored land of the muses and the graces women enjoyed all the rights and privileges accorded to men here the doors of schools and universities were open to all regardless of sex and art science literature law medicine jurisprudence counted 
its votaries among women as well as among men here far from encountering jealousy and opposition in the pursuit of knowledge or in the practice of the professions women never found aught but generous emulation and sympathetic cooperation for a thousand years women were welcomed into the arena of learning and culture on the same footing as men in salerno bologna padua pavia they competed for the same honors and were contestants for the same prizes that stimulated the exertions of the sterner sex position and emolument were the guerdons of merit and ability and the victor whether man or woman was equally acclaimed and showered with equal honor women asked for no favors in the intellectual arena and expected none all they desired were the same opportunities and the same privileges as were granted the men and these were never denied them from the time when trotula taught in salerno to the present when giuseppina catana is professor of general pathology in the medical faculty of bologna the women of italy always had access to the universities and were at liberty to follow any course of study they might elect we thus find them achieving distinction in civil and canon law in medicine in theology even as well as in art science literature philosophy and linguistics no department of knowledge had any terrors for them and there was none in which some of them did not win undying fame they held chairs of language jurisprudence philosophy physics mathematics medicine and anatomy and filled these positions with such marked ability that they commanded the admiration and applause of all who heard them this is not the place to tell of the triumphs of the women professors in the italian universities or to recount the achievements of those who were honored with degrees within their classic walls let it suffice to recall the names of a few of those who won renown in medicine and surgery and whose names are still in their own land pronounced with respect and veneration one of the most noted practitioners in southern italy after the death of trotula and her compeers was one margarita who had studied medicine in salerno one of her patients was no less a personage than ladislaw king of naples among those that had diplomas for the practice of surgery were maria incarnata of naples and tomasia de matteo of castro Ize. that women enjoyed in rome the same privileges in the practice of medicine and surgery as their sisters in the southern part of the peninsula is manifest from an edict issued by pope sixtus the fourth in confirmation of a law promulgated by the medical faculty of rome which reads as follows no man or woman whether christian or jew unless he be a master of or a licentiate in medicine shall presume to treat the human body either as a physician or as a surgeon in central and northern italy in florence turin padua and venice as well as in the southern part we find constantly recurring instances of women practicing medicine and surgery and winning for themselves an enviable reputation as successful practitioners but after the decline of salerno consequent on the establishment by frederick II of a school of medicine in naples the great center of medicine and surgery as of civil and canon law was bologna so renowned did it become as a teaching and intellectual center that it was as sarti informs us known throughout europe as civitas docta the learned city and major studiorum the mother of studies on its coins were stamped the words bologna docet bologna teachers and on the city seal which is still used for certain public documents were the words legum bologna mater bologna the mother of laws here more than in salerno more than in any other city in the world was for long centuries witnessed a blooming of female genius that has since the time of gratian and arnerius given the university of bologna pre-eminence in the estimation of all friends of women's education and women's culture for here within the walls of what 
was for centuries the most celebrated university in Christendom, women had, for the first time, an opportunity of devoting themselves at will to the study of any and all branches of knowledge. And it can be truthfully affirmed that no seat of learning can point to such a long list of eminent scholars and teachers among the gentler sex as is to be found on the register of Bologna's famous university. For here, to name only a few, achieve distinction, either as students or as professors, such noted women as Petitia Gozadina, Bettina and Novella Calandrini, Dorotea Bocchi, Giovanna and Maddalena Bianchetti, Virginia Malvesi, Maria Vittoria Dossi, Elisabetta Serene, Ippolita Grassi, Propersia de Rossi, Maria Mastalagri, Laura Bassi, Maddalena No Candide, Clotilda Tambroni, and Anna Manzolini. In this honor list we have a group of savants that were famed throughout Europe for their attainments in law, philosophy, science, ancient and modern languages, medicine, and surgery the rivals, and sometimes the superiors, in scholarship of the ablest men among their distinguished colleagues. It would be a pleasure to recount the achievements of these justly celebrated daughters of Italy, but lack of space precludes the mention of more than one of them. This was Maria Dalitan, who was born of poor peasants near Bologna, and who at an early age exhibited intelligence of a superior order. After pursuing her studies under the ablest masters, she obtained from the University of Bologna, maxima cum laude, the degree of doctor in philosophy and medicine. On account of her knowledge of surgery, as well as of medicine, she was soon afterward put in charge of the city's school for midwives. When Napoleon, in 1802, passed through Bologna, he was so struck by the exceptional ability of the young Dottoressa, that on the recommendation of the savant Catarzani, he had instituted for her in the university a chair of obstetrics, a position which she held until the time of her death in 1842, with the greatest credit to herself and to the institution with which she was identified. Maria del Don is a worthy link between that long line of women doctors, beginning with Trotula, who have so honored their sex in Italy and those still more numerous practitioners in the healing art who shortly after her death began to spring up in all parts of the civilized world for it was about this time that the movement which had long been agitated in behalf of the higher education of women began suddenly to assume extraordinary vitality not only throughout europe but in america as well and to no women did this movement appeal so strongly as to those who had long been looking forward to an opportunity to qualify themselves for the learned professions especially medicine no sooner did they descry their first flush of dawn on their long deferred hopes than they began to consider ways and means for putting their fondly nurtured projects into execution seven years almost to the day after the death of maria dal don Miss Elizabeth Blackwell, a young woman in America, of English birth, decided to enter college with a view of studying medicine and surgery. But, at the very outset, she encountered all kinds of unforeseen difficulties, difficulties that would have caused a less courageous and determined woman to give up her plans in despair. She was told, in the first place, that it was highly improper for a woman to study medicine, and that no decent woman would think of becoming a medical practitioner. As to a lady studying or practicing surgery, that, of course, was out of the question. But a more serious obstacle than the conventionalities in the case was the difficulty of finding a medical college that was willing to admit a woman to its lecture rooms and laboratories. Miss Blackwell applied to more than a dozen of the leading institutions of America and received a positive refusal to her request. Finally, when hope had almost vanished, she received word from a small college in Geneva, New York, announcing that her application had been favorably considered and that she would be admitted as a student whenever she presented herself. 
the truth is that the faculty of the college was opposed to the young woman's admission but wished to escape the odium incident to a direct refusal by referring the question to the class with a proviso which it was believed would necessarily exclude her but in this it was greatly surprised and disappointed for the entire medical class to the number of about one hundred and fifty decided unanimously in favor of the fair applicant's admission and they did more than this they put themselves on record regarding the equality of educational opportunities for women and men in a way that must have put their timid professors to shame their resolution accompanying an invitation to the young woman to become a member of the student body was worded as follows resolved that one of the radical principles of a republican government is the universal education of both sexes that to every branch of scientific education the door should be equally open to all that the application of elizabeth blackwell to become a member of our class meets our entire approbation and in extending our unanimous invitation we pledge ourselves that no conduct of ours shall cause her to regret her attendance at this institution the students were as good as their word their conduct as miss blackwell wrote years afterwards was always admirable and that of true christian gentlemen but the women of geneva were shocked at the female medical student they stared at her as a curious animal and the theory was fully established that she was either a bad woman whose designs would gradually become evident or that being insane an outbreak of insanity would soon be apparent in due time miss blackwell finished her course in medicine and surgery and graduated at the head of her class the orator of the day who was a member of the faculty naturally referred to the new departure that had been made the admission of a woman for the first time to a complete medical education and among other things declared that the experiment of which every member of the faculty was proud had proved that the strongest intellect and nerve and the most untiring perseverance were compatible with the softest attributes of feminine delicacy and grace the awarding of the degree of m d for the first time to a woman in america excited general comment and widespread interest not only in the united states but in europe as well the public press was not unfavorable in its opinion of the new departure and even punch could not resist writing some verses sympathetic albeit humorous in honor of the fair m d after spending some time abroad studying in the great hospitals of europe miss blackwell started the practice of medicine in new york city at first as she declares in her autobiographical sketches it was very difficult though steady uphill work i had she tells us no medical companionship the profession stood aloof and society was distrustful of the innovation the aloofness of the profession arose from a dread of successful rivalry and the men did not wish to encourage the invasion of women of their own preserves you cannot expect us one of them frankly admitted to her to furnish you with a stick to break our heads with but undeterred by opposition miss blackwell continued her work daily making converts to the new movement and receiving substantial aid as well as sympathetic cooperation from many people both men and women prominent in society and public life in eighteen fifty four she started a free dispensary for poor women three years later she founded a hospital for women and children where young women physicians as well as patients could be received these were the humble beginnings of the present flourishing institutions known as the new york infirmary and the college for women and in less than ten years after her graduation miss blackwell saw the new departure in medical practice successfully established not only in new york but also in other large cities of the united states in eighteen sixty nine the early pioneer medical work by women in america was completed during the twenty years which followed the graduation of the first woman physician the public recognition of the justice and advantage of such a measure has steadily grown throughout the northern states the free and equal entrance of women into the profession of medicine was secured 
in boston new york and philadelphia special medical schools for women were sanctioned by the legislatures and in some long established colleges women were received as students in the ordinary classes meanwhile the women in europe were not idle nor heedless of the example set by their brave sisters in america the university of zurich threw open its portals to women and was soon followed by those of Bern and geneva the first woman to obtain a degree in medicine in zurich it was in eighteen sixty seven was nadija susloa a russian she was soon followed by scores of others from europe and america who found greater advantages and more sympathy in swiss universities than elsewhere in eighteen sixty nine the medico chirurgical academy of st petersburg conferred the degree of m d upon madame kashiwaro the first female candidate for this honor when her name was mentioned by the dean it was received with an immense storm of applause which lasted several minutes the ceremony of investing her with the insignia of her dignity being over her fellow students and colleagues lifted her on a chair and carried her with triumphant shouts throughout the halls the first woman graduate from the university of france was miss elizabeth garrett of england she received her degree in medicine in eighteen seventy and the following year the same institution conferred the doctor's degree on miss mary c putnam of new york after these precedents had been established the universities of the various countries on the continent following the example set by those in the united states and switzerland opened one after the other their doors to women and in most of them accorded them all the privileges of civis academici enjoined by the men great britain held out against the new movement long after most of the continental countries had fallen into line nor did she surrender until after a protracted and bitter fight during which the men leading the opposition exhibited evidences of selfishness and obscurantism that now seem incredible the leader in great britain of pioneer medical work for women was miss sophia jacks blake whose academic pathway was beset with difficulties far sterner than had in the united states confronted her friend and colleague miss blackwell hearing much of the tolerance and liberality of the university of london she applied to it for admission as a student but was informed at once that the charter of the institution had purposely been so worded as to exclude the possibility of examining women for medical degrees after this rebuff she made application to the university of edinburgh which like the other scotch universities had also had always boasted of its broad-mindedness and freedom from educational trammels she was received provisionally and was after a while joined by six other women who had in view the same object as herself for a time notwithstanding opposition from certain quarters everything was quiet and apparently satisfactory but the gathering storms soon broke and the seven young women as they were one day entering the university gates were actually mobbed by a ruffianly band of students who had all along been opposed to the presence of women in the class and lecture rooms they pelted the helpless females with street mud and hurled at them all the vile epithets and heaped upon them all the abuse that their foul tongues could command these outrageous proceedings on the part of the rabble of rowdies were allowed to continue for several days and had it not been for a brave band of chivalrous young irishmen among the students who formed themselves into a bodyguard for the protection of their fair classmates and were in consequence known as the irish brigade the hapless women students would not have escaped bodily harm what a marked contrast between the conduct toward miss blackwell of the gallant students of the modest little american town and that of the cowardly ruffians of the vaunted athens of the north but this was not all the seven young women in question had matriculated as students of the university with the understanding that they were to have all the rights and privileges of the male students but after the disgraceful conduct of the mob just referred to they discovered that the authorities of the university were prepared to break faith with them 
and prevent them from getting their coveted degrees and thus debar them from all chance of medical practice the reason why the university was induced to annul its contract after the women on their part had fully complied with all its stipulations soon became apparent it was purely and simply to make it impossible for women to secure a license as medical practitioners both in and outside of edinburgh the conviction daily grew stronger that women doctors were a menace to the monopoly so long enjoyed by the medical fraternity and that the movement in their favor should be crushed by fair means or foul before it got beyond control the spectator made this clear by stating at the time of the controversy that every profession in this country england is more or less of a trades union and yet the members of these professions would shake their heads and prate about the necessity of stamping out trades unionism among workmen women whined one of the doctors would snatch the bread from the mouths of poor practitioners another doctor who had championed the cause of women physicians when commenting on the hypocritical objection that it was unbecoming for women to practice medicine or surgery expressed the same idea in other words it appears he declared that it is most becoming and proper for a woman to discharge all the duties which are incidental to our profession for thirty shillings a week but if she is to have three or four guineas a day for discharging the same duties then they are immoral and immodest and unsuited to the soft nature that should characterize a lady after miss jex blake and her companions learned that the university was determined to refuse them the degrees to which they were entitled they brought suit against it for breach of contract but after a long and expensive trial the judge rendered a decision against them they then appealed to parliament and after a protracted and strenuous campaign on the part of friends whom they had enlisted in their cause they saw their opponents not only dragged at the chariot wheels of progress but forced to help to turn them for in eighteen seventy eight after nearly ten years of a persistent continuous struggle such as had rarely been witnessed in woman's long battle for things of the mind a struggle in which the intrepid dauntless miss jex blake made the greatest of all the contributions to the end attained the women of great britain had the supreme satisfaction of winning what was probably the most glorious victory which their sex had ever won the war was over and henceforward they were free as were their sisters in other parts of the world as the women in italy had been for a thousand years to devote themselves at will to the study and practice of the healing art without let or hindrance what a wonderful change has taken place in the medical world almost within the space of a single generation the tiny grain of mustard that was sown by two lone women the mrs blackwell and jex blake in their chosen field of effort has grown and waxed a great tree women doctors are now found in all parts of the civilized world and are numbered by thousands and so great has been their professional success so widespread is the desire to secure their services especially in countries like america and england where opposition was in the beginning especially bitter that the proportion of women practitioners in medicine and surgery is now regarded as the best index of a nation's enlightenment the healing art of greece and rome has broadened out into the noble sciences of medicine and surgery of to-day for based as they now are on the sciences of chemistry botany biology hygiene physiology anatomy and bacteriology which have all witnessed such extraordinary developments during the last half century they both deserve a pre-eminent place in the history of the sciences and the success which has crowned woman's efforts in surgery and medicine is not only a conclusive indication of her capacity so long denied by her self-interested opponents but also the most convincing indication that she is at last properly occupied in a field of activity from which she was too long excluded her contributions as writer and investigator toward the progress of both sciences 
even during the short time in which she has been able to give proof of her ability, have been notable, and augur well for the share she will have in their future advancement. But more important still is the refining influence she has already exerted on both professions, and the relief she has been able to afford to countless thousands of her own sex, who would otherwise have been the voluntary victims of untold misery. Women doctors are, indeed, not only worthy representatives of Asculapia Victrix, and of the two sciences which they have so elevated and so ennobled, but are also ministering angels to poor, suffering humanity, comparable only with the heroic sisters of charity and the devoted nurses of the Red Cross. End of chapter 8, part 2《Section 19 of Woman in Science》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Woman in Science》by John Augustine Zahm Chapter 9, Part 1 Women in Archaeology Archaeology, in its broadest sense, is one of the most recent of the sciences, and may be said to be a creation of the nineteenth century. In its restricted sense, however, it dates back to the beginning of the Italian Renaissance, for it was at this period that the collector's zeal began to manifest itself, and that were brought together those priceless treasures of ancient art, which are today the pride of the museums of Rome and Florence. It was then that Pope Sextus IV and Julius II, his nephew, laid the foundations of the great museums of the Capitol and the Vatican, and enriched them with such famous masterpieces as the Ariadne, the Nile, the Tiber, the Leoquan, and the Apollo Belvedere. Their example was quickly followed by such cardinals as Hippolito d'Este, Fernando de' Medici, and by representatives of the leading princely houses of the Italian peninsula. In rapid succession, the palaces of the Borghese, Chigi, Pamfili, Ludovisi, Barbarini, and Aldobrandini became filled with the choicest Greek and Roman antiques. In the course of time, many of these treasures found their way to the museums of Venice, Madrid, Paris, Munich, and Dresden, while still others were purchased by wealthy art connoisseurs in various parts of Europe and Great Britain. In the beginning, these antiques in marble and bronze were used chiefly for decorative purposes. Courts, stairs, fountains, galleries, and palaces were adorned with statues, busts, reliefs, and sarcophagi, applied in such a manner as to become incorporated in contemporary art, and thereby to gain fresh life. These treasures of antiquity, statues, bas-reliefs, mosaics, coins, medals, busts, sarcophagi, and productions of ceramic art, although at first used almost exclusively for decorating palaces and villas and enriching museums, were eventually to become of inestimable value in the study of the history of art and the civilization of Greece and Rome, as well as of the various nations of antiquity with which they had come into contact. Besides this, they supplied the necessary raw material not only for classical archaeology, but also for that more comprehensive science of archaeology, which deals with the art, the architecture, the language, the literature, the inscriptions, the manners, customs, and development of our race from prehistoric times until the present day. Among the women who took a prominent part in collecting material toward the advancement of archaeologic science were those illustrious ladies, as celebrated for their knowledge and culture, as for their noble lineage and their patronage of men of letters, who presided over the brilliant courts of Urbino, Mantua, Milan, 
and Ferrara. Preeminent among these were Elisabetta Gonzaga, Duchess of Urbino, and Isabella d'Este, Marchioness of Mantua. The palace of the former, that peerless lady who excelled all others in excellence, was famous for its precious antiques in bronze and marble, but above all for its superb collection of rare old books and manuscripts in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Isabella d'Este, who was through life the most intimate friend of Elisabetta Gonzaga, was acclaimed by her contemporaries as the first lady in the world. She was a true daughter of the Renaissance, in the heart of which she was brought up, and the small passing incidents of her everyday life are to us memorials of the classic age when the gods of Parnassus walked with men. She was an even more enthusiastic collector than the Duchess of Urbino, and her magnificent palace in Mantua was filled with the choicest works of Greek and Roman art that were then procurable. She has been described as one who secured everything to which she took a fancy. She had but to hear of the discovery of a beautiful antique, a rare work in bronze or marble uncovered by the spade of the excavator, when she forthwith made an effort to procure it for her priceless collection. If that was not possible, she would not rest until she could secure something else even more precious. She aimed at supremacy in everything artistic and intellectual, and would be content with nothing short of perfection. Hence it is that her collection of antiques, like those of her friend, the Duchess of Urbino, is rightly regarded as having been of singular value in preparing the way for the foundation of scientific archaeology, a foundation that was laid by the eminent German scholar Winkelmann in the 18th century by the publication of his masterly work, History of the Art of Antiquity the first woman of eminence to take an active part in archaeologic excavation was the youngest sister of Napoleon Bonaparte, the beautiful, clever, and ambitious Caroline. When Joachim Murat became king of Naples, after his brother-in-law, Joseph Bonaparte, had, in 1808, been transferred to the throne of Spain, his wife, Queen Caroline, gave at once a new impetus to the work of the excavation of Pompeii, along the lines planned a few years before by the eminent Neapolitan scholar Michele Arditi. She exhibited the keenest interest in the work, and the notable discoveries which were made under her inspiring supervision of this important undertaking show how much classical archaeology owes to her intelligent and munificent patronage. Queen Caroline proved her interest in the excavations that were to contribute so much to our knowledge of antiquity by appearing frequently at Pompeii and stimulating the workmen to greater efforts. She frequently spent entire days during the great heat of summer at the excavations to encourage the lazy workmen and to reward them in the event of success. The funds were increased so as to make the employment of six hundred men possible. The street of tombs was next uncovered, forming a complete and solemn picture, greatly impressing the beholder even today. For the first time, a complete outline of an ancient marketplace and its surroundings could be obtained. The market, closed and inaccessible to wheeled traffic, was surrounded by a colonnade filled with monuments, with the great temple in the background, and beyond the arcades were other temples or public buildings, among the principal being the stately basilica. Constant and increased efforts were thus crowned by important results. The queen did not withhold generous assistance. The French architect, Father Mazois, received from her 1,500 francs while preparing his monumental work 
at Pompeii. It is not too much to say that Queen Caroline's archaeological work at Pompeii was as far-reaching in its results as was that of her illustrious brother in the land of the pharaohs. It drew in the most impressive manner the attention of the world to the vast treasures of art which lay concealed under the earth-covered ruins of the once noted cities of the ancient world, and stimulated scholars and learned societies to undertake similar researches in Sicily, Greece, Mesopotamia, Asia Minor, and the almost forgotten islands of the Aegean seas. While the energetic sister of the great Napoleon was occupied in bringing to light those priceless treasures of art which had for seventeen centuries lain beneath the ashes of Vesuvius, a bright, refined, spirituelle young girl, born in Dublin and bred in England, was unconsciously preparing herself for a brilliant career in the branch of archaeology, known as Christian iconography. Her name was Anna Murphy, better known to the world as Mrs. Jameson. At an early age she gave evidence of unusual intelligence, and she had hardly attained to womanhood when she was noted for her knowledge of languages and for her remarkable attainments in art and literature. Numerous journeys to France, Italy, and Germany, and a systematic study in the great museums and art galleries of these countries, but, above all, her association with the most distinguished scholars of Europe completed her education and prepared her for those splendid works on Christian art which have made her name a household word throughout the world. Mrs. Jameson was a prolific writer, but those of her works on which her fame chiefly rests are the ones which are classed under the general title Sacred and Legendary Art. They treat of God, the Father and Son, of the Madonna and the Saints, as illustrated in art from the earliest ages to modern times. So masterly and exhaustive was her treatment of the difficult subjects discussed in this chef d'oeuvre of hers, that no less an authority than the eminent German archaeologist F. X. Krauss writes of this elaborate production as follows. Quote, Neither before nor since has the subject matter of this work been handled with such skill and thoroughness. The older iconographic works were mere dilettantism. For the first time since classical archaeology had applied the principles of modern criticism to Greek and Roman iconography, and had presented an example of scientific treatment free from such reproach, was a serious iconography of our early Christian monuments possible. Mrs. Jameson was the first to attempt this on a large scale. It was clear to her, and here lay the advance which her work reveals, that in order to accomplish her colossal task, two things must be realized. She must not build on a foundation of material that is imperfect or brought together in a haphazard way. She must not only see and test everything available in the way of monuments, but she must likewise place the productions of literature and poetry beside those of the plastic arts. It was clear to her, also, that in this case one would throw light on the other, and that the investigator who would lay claim to the name of archaeologist must, moreover, study the spirit of a people in all its monumental and literary manifestations. Mrs. Jameson strove to learn the mind and the mode of early Christian times from the works of the fathers. She saw in the hymns of the Middle Ages and in the writings of the mystics the sources of the art ideas which disclose themselves in the wall and glass paintings of our cathedrals and in the entrance and creation of a fiesole. She had also the special advantage of being thoroughly imbued with Dante's ideas of the plastic arts of the Middle Ages. 
and all this is evidenced in a form which exhibits neither dry dissertation nor wearisome nomenclature. Each of her articles is a little essay. It teaches us what place the Madonna or St. Catherine or some other saint has held in the memory and in the imagination of past centuries. We behold the sainted forms flitting before our eyes in all the charm of poetic perfection which was given then by the childlike fantasy of the Middle Ages, and in all the power which they exercised over men's minds, and which, however we may view the religious side of the question, certainly had the effect of creating forms of infinite beauty and pictures of unspeakable reality. End quote. When we recollect that Mrs. Jameson achieved so much before the foundations of Christian archaeology had been fully laid, before de Rossi's monumental publications had supplied the means of interpreting early Christian sculpture, before critics and archaeologists were at one regarding the significance of early Christian and Middle Age symbolism, or agreed on the principles that were to guide to a correct understanding of the pictures of Roman and Gothic art, and while students were yet in ignorance as to the real influence of Byzantine art on that of Western Europe, we cannot but wonder at the courage and the energy of this gifted woman in undertaking and in bringing to a happy issue a work which even today, with all our increased facilities and greater array of facts, would be considered herculean task as we read her admirable volumes on sacred and legendary art we can as did a close friend of hers see the enraptured author kindle into enthusiasm amidst the gorgeous natural beauty the antique memorials and the sacred christian relics of italy and we are prepared to believe with the same friend that there was not a cypress on the roman hills or a sunny vine overhanging the southern gardens, or a picture in those vast somber galleries of foreign palaces, or a catacomb spread out, vast and dark, under the martyr churches of the city of the seven hills, which was not associated with some vivid flashes of her intellect and imagination. And we can also understand how the strange, mystic symbolism of the early mosaics was a familiar language to her, and why she should experience special delight when she found herself on the polished marble of the Lateran floor or under the gorgeously somber tribune of the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, reading off the quaint emblems or expounding the pious thoughts of more than a thousand years ago. It is gratifying to know that Queen Victoria recognized the surpassing merits of this noble woman by placing her on the civil list, and that our own Longfellow was able to say of her masterpiece, Sacred and Legendary Art, it most amply supplies the cravings of the religious sentiment of the spiritual nature within. A countrywoman of Mrs. Jameson and her contemporary, who also deserves an honorable place in the literature of archaeology, is Louise Twinning. Although inferior in intellectual attainments and literary activity to the accomplished author of sacred and legendary art, her two works on types and figures of the Bible illustrated by art, and symbols and emblems of early medieval Christian art, have given her a well-deserved reputation on the continent as well as in the British Isles. The latter volume, Mrs. Jameson herself declares in her Legends of the Madonna, to be certainly the most complete and useful book of the kind which I know of. A third woman who has won fame for her sex in the island kingdom in the domain of archaeology is Miss Margaret Stotes. Her activities, however, have been chiefly confined to the antiquities of Ireland, on which she is a recognized authority. The notable part she took in editing Lord Dunraven's great work 
notes on Irish architecture, established her reputation on a firm basis. Among her other important works are Early Christian Art in Ireland and Christian Inscriptions in the Irish Language, chiefly collected and drawn by George Petrie, one of the annual volumes of the Royal Historical and Archaeological Association of Ireland. This work has justly been described as an epoch-making contribution to Christian epigraphy and to a rapidly developing knowledge of Celtic language and literature. The learned Dr. Krauss, than whom there is no more competent judge, in referring to this splendid performance does not hesitate to affirm, no man could have done better than this brave college girl, whom I would wish to greet across the channel with a cordial Macte Virtute. The women archaeologists, so far mentioned, with the exception of Queen Caroline Murat, were conspicuous as writers rather than active investigators in the field. There have been, however, quite a number who have won distinction as archaeologists of the spade, women who, either alone or with their husbands, have superintended excavations in different lands which have yielded results of untold scientific value. Among the most conspicuous of these are Madame Sophia Schliemann, Madame de la Foy, and the enterprising Yankee girl, Miss Harriet A. Boyd. Of these, the first named is the wife of the late Dr. Henry Schliemann, who immortalized himself by his famous excavations at Troy, Tiryns, and Mycenae, enterprises which solved for us the great problem of nearly thirty centuries, and demonstrated, in the most startling manner, the truth of the foundations on which was framed the poetical conception that has for thousands of years called forth the enchanted delight of the educated world. During his meteoric career as an archaeologist, Schliemann was able to realize the dreams of his youth, and succeeded in unveiling the mystery that had so long hung over sacred Ilios, and to give the heroes of the Iliad a local habitation on the rediscovered plain of Troy. And his glorious achievements we must credit largely to that brave and devoted woman, his wife, who was ever at his side to share in his trials and labors, and to raise his drooping spirits in hours of depression, or when hostile criticism treated him as a visionary in the pursuit of a chimera. Mrs. Schliemann is a Greek lady who was born and bred under the shadow of the Acropolis, and a worthy descendant of those proud Athenian women who wore the golden grasshopper in their hair as a sign that they were natives of the city of the Violet Crown. She was not only dowered with intellectual gifts of a high order, but she was also her husband's most congenial companion and sympathetic friend in all his literary work, while she was his very right hand in those glorious enterprises at Hisarle and Missane, which secured for both of them undying fame. Dr. Schliemann was the first to attest the never-failing assistant which he received from this noble woman, who, as he informs us, was a warm admirer of Homer, and with glad enthusiasm joined her husband in executing the great work which he had conceived in his early boyhood. Usually they worked together, but at times Mrs. Schliemann superintended a gang of laborers at one spot, while the doctor was occupied at another in the immediate vicinity. Thus it was she who excavated the heroic tumulus of Batieia in the Troad, that Batieia, who, according to Homer, was a queen of the Amazons and undertook a campaign against Troy. Madame Jane de la Foy is noted as the collaborator of her husband, Marcel de la Foy, in the important archaeological mission to Persia that was entrusted to him by the French government. The results of this mission, in which Madame de la Foy had a conspicuous part, were published in Paris in 1884 in five octavo volumes. 
It was during this expedition to the ancient empire of Cyrus and Artaxerxes that this indefatigable couple became interested in the ruins of Susa, the ancient capital of the Persian kings. On their return to France, they succeeded in securing money and supplies for conducting excavations among these ruins, which, in the end, yielded results which were, in some respects, as important as those which rewarded the labors of the Schliemanns in Greece and Asia Minor. So completely had Susa, the city of the lilies, been buried and forgotten for nearly two thousand years, that even its site was almost as much a matter of dispute as was that of ancient Troy. And yet, it was one of the greatest and richest cities of antiquity, the city of Esther and Daniel, the city of the mighty Asuerus, who reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and twenty-seven provinces, the city where the great Alexander celebrated his nuptials with Statyra, the daughter of Darius, with a magnificent festival, at which, according to Plutarch, there were no fewer than nine thousand guests, to each of which he gave a golden cup for the libations. In December 1884, the two brave and venturesome explorers were on their way to Susa with high hopes, but not without a full knowledge of the difficulties and dangers that they would have to confront among the fanatical nomads of Arabistan, where the very name of Christian inspires rage and horror. It meant, as Madame de la Foy herself tells us, to cross the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, and the deserts of Elam three times in less than a year, to pass whole weeks without undressing, to sleep on the bare ground, to struggle nights and days against robbers and thieves, to cross rivers without a bridge, to suffer heat, rain, cold, mists, fever, fatigue, hunger, thirst, the stings of divers insects, to lead this hard and perilous existence without being guided by any interest other than the glory of one's country. In spite, however, of all the opposition which they encountered among the fanatical Muslims of Arabistan, and of the dreadful sufferings incident to living in a desert, where it was at times impossible to secure the necessaries of life, their mission was successful and their account of their finds in the ancient capital of Elam was as thrilling in its way as anything reported of the excavations at Troy or Pompeii. Their splendid collection of specimens of ancient Persian art and architecture, now on exhibition in the Museum of the Louvre, testifies to the successful issue of their expedition, and to their indomitable energy in conducting researches under the most untoward conditions. So highly did the French government value the part Madame de la Foy had taken in this arduous enterprise, that it conferred on her a distinction rarely awarded to a woman for scientific work, that of Chevalier of the Legion of Honor. As an archaeologist, the gifted and energetic American woman, Miss Harriet Boyd, now Mrs. C. H. Halls, has achieved an international reputation for her remarkable excavations in the island of Crete. She is a frequent contributor to archaeological journals, but it is upon her splendid work in the field that her fame will ultimately rest. Her first work of importance was undertaken as fellow of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, this was in 1900, and the field of her investigations was the Isthmus of Hierapetra in Crete. Here she excavated numerous tombs and houses of the early geometric period, circa 900 BC, and paved the way for those brilliant discoveries which rewarded her labors during the following three years. The investigations conducted during these three years under Miss Boyd's directions yielded results of transcendent value. 
assisted by three young American women, the Mrs. V. E. Wheeler, Blanche E. Williams, and Edith H. Hall. She superintended the work of more than a hundred native employees whom she had on her payroll. By good fortune, in the choice of a site for excavation, and by well-directed efforts, she was soon able to unearth one of the oldest Cretan cities and to expose to view the ruins of what was probably one of the ninety cities which Homer tells us in his Odyssey grace the land of Crete, a fair land in a rich in the midst of a wine-dark sea. So remarkable were the finds in this long-buried Minoan town, and so well preserved are its general features, that it has justly been called the Cretan Pompeii. It antedates by long centuries the oldest cities of Greece, and was a flourishing center of commerce, ages before the heroes of the Iliad battled on the plains of Troy. It is not too much to say that the extraordinary discoveries made by this enterprising Yankee girl at Gornia, no less than those made by British and Italian archaeologists at Knossos and Festus, have completely revolutionized our ideas respecting the state of culture of the inhabitants of Crete during the second and third millennia before the Christian era. They have thrown a flood of light on the origins of Mediterranean culture, and have, at the same time, supplied material for a study of European civilization that was before entirely wanting. An enduring monument to Miss Boyd's ability as an archaeologist is her notable volume containing an account of her excavations at Gornia, Vasilik, and other prehistoric cities on the isthmus of Hierapetra. It will bear comparison with any similar productions by the Schliemanns or the Dielafois. A later work on Crete, the forerunner of Greece, which she wrote in collaboration with her husband, Mr. C. H. Hawes, is also a production of recognized merit. As a study on the origin of Greek civilization, it opens up many new vistas in prehistory and illumines many questions that were before involved in mystery. End of chapter 9, part 1section 20 of woman in science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org woman in science by john augustine zahm chapter 9 part 2 besides mrs hawes three other american women have achieved marked distinction by their archaeological researches these are Mrs. Sarah York Stevenson, Miss Alice C. Fletcher, and Mrs. Zelia Nuttall. Mrs. Stevenson has long been identified with the progress of archaeological research, especially with that in Egypt and the Mediterranean. A prominent member of many learned societies, she is likewise a writer and lecturer of note. She enjoys the distinction of being the first woman whose name appears as a lecturer on the calendar of the University of Harvard. In acknowledgment of her scholarly ability and eminent services in the development of its Department of Archaeology, the University of Pennsylvania has conferred upon her the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. That American women have not been behind their sisters in Europe in their enthusiasm for archaeological investigation, is evinced by the researches and writings of Miss Alice C. Fletcher and Mrs. Zillian Nuttall, both of whom enjoy an international reputation in the learned world. Miss Fletcher's chosen field of labor has been in ethnology and anthropology. Her studies of the folklore and the manners and customs of various tribes of North American Indians have a distinct and permanent value, while those of her contributions, which have been published by the Smithsonian Institution and the Bureau of Ethnology, contributions based on personal knowledge 
of a long residence among the tribes she writes about, show that she has exceptional talent for the branches of archaeology to which she has devoted many years of earnest and successful study. Mrs. Nuttall is the daughter of an American mother and an English father. Thanks to the care that was bestowed on her education by her parents, and to her long residence in the different countries of Europe, she is proficient in seven languages. This knowledge of tongues has been of inestimable advantage to her in her researches in European libraries and in those historical and archaeological investigations which have rendered her famous. She has devoted special attention to the early history, languages, religions, and calendar systems of the primitive inhabitants of Mexico and Central America, in all of which she is a recognized authority. When, some years ago, the mysterious ruins of Mexico began to attract the special attention of archaeologists, Mrs. Nuttall was selected by the University of California as the field director of the commission which it sent to pursue archaeological researches in this Egypt of the New World. A more competent or a more enthusiastic director could not have been chosen. Her finds in the pyramids of the sun and moon at Teotihuacan and elsewhere in our sister republic were especially important. In recognition of her achievements, President Porfirio Diaz nominated Mrs. Nuttall honorary professor in the Mexican National Museum. She was also offered the position of curator of the Archaeological Museum of Mexico, but this office she declined. She holds membership in a large number of learned societies in America and Europe, and is a frequent contributor to numerous magazines on historical and archaeological subjects. She has had the good fortune to discover a number of important manuscripts illustrating the early history of Mexico. Chief among these are a Hispano-American manuscript, which she dug out of one of the libraries of Madrid, and another, which was found in a private collection in England and reproduced in facsimile in this country. In honor of its fair discoverer, it is now known as the Codex Nuttall, and is regarded by experts as one of the most precious records of ancient Mexico. What is probably Mrs. Nuttall's most valuable contribution to archaeological science is her erudite work, entitled The Fundamental Principles of Old and New World Civilizations. It is a comparative research based on a study of the ancient Mexican religious, sociological, and calendar systems, and represents thirteen years of assiduous labor. It is a worthy monument of the scientific ability of this gifted Americanist, and one which brilliantly illumines some of the most controverted points of comparative archaeology. The nester of women archaeologists is Donna Ercilia Caetani Bovatelli, the daughter of the famous Dante scholar, the late Duke Don Michelangelo Caetani Sermoneta. Since the days of Boniface the Eighth, whom Dante scornfully denounced as Lo Principe de Farisei, the family of the Caetani has been one of the most illustrious of the Roman nobility, and is today ranked with those of the Colonna and Orsini. Besides his thorough knowledge of Dante, whose Divina Commedia he regarded as the great artistic production of the human mind, a work which he knew by heart, the Duke of Sermoneta was deeply versed in philology and archaeology. No one was more familiar with the history and antiquities of Rome than he was, nor a greater friend and patron of scholars of every nationality. The Palazzo Caetani was the resort of not only the savants of Rome, but also and especially of those who gathered from all quarters of the world to study the rich collections of antiquities for which the Eternal City is so famous. Here, the ablest authorities in history and archaeology discuss the latest discoveries among the ruins of Greece and Asia Minor, and the most recent finds in the Forum, or amidst the crumbling ruins of the palaces of the Caesars. Having such a father, and brought up in such an environment, 
it is not surprising that Dona Ercilia acquired at an early age that taste for archaeology, which was, as events proved, to constitute the chief occupation of her long and busy life, having enjoyed and studied literature and the languages under the best masters in Rome, she was thoroughly prepared for the work of deciphering Greek and Latin inscriptions, and for an intelligent study of the ancient monuments of Italy and Hellas. Her learned countryman, A. de Gubernatis, assures us that she has such a thorough knowledge of Latin and Greek that she writes both with ease and elegance, and that she is endowed with an admirable memory for philology and archaeology. Besides being the mistress of several modern languages, she is also familiar with Sanskrit. Since the death of her husband in 1879, she has devoted all her time, outside of that given to the care and education of her children, to the pursuit of classical archaeology, in which she has long been regarded as an authority of the first order. Her salon, unlike those of the frivolous leaders of high life, has for many years been the favorite rendezvous in Rome of learned men and women from every clime. Here were seen the noted historians Gregorovius, Theodore Mommsen, and Giovanni Battista de Rossi, the illustrious founder of Christian archaeology. Here the representatives of the French, German, and American schools of archaeology meet to exchange views on their favorite science and to find inspiration in the knowledge and enthusiasm of their gifted hostess, who always takes an active part in their recondite discussions never fails to contribute her share to these meetings, which have contributed so much toward the advancement of science and the history of antiquity. Whether the discussion turn on the deciphering of an ancient text, the inscription of a monument, or a recently excavated sarcophagus, Dona Ercilia's opinion is eagerly sought, and her judgment is generally unerring. This cultured and erudite daughter of sunny Italy has been a prolific writer on her favorite branch of research. Besides contributing to such publications as the Nuova Antologia and the bulletins of the archaeological commissions in Rome, she has found time to prepare for the press a number of volumes of the highest value on diverse questions of Roman and Greek archaeology. It is interesting in this connection to note the fact that, after Madame Curie had been refused admittance into the French Academy, one of the members of this institution, who had voted against her on the ground that she was a woman, had occasion to attend a meeting of the Academy of the Lincei in Rome, an association which plays the same role in Italy as does the French Academy in France, and found, to his astonishment, that the dean of the department of archaeology as well as the presiding officer of some of the most important meetings of the academy was a woman she was no other than dona ercilia caetani bovatelli the learned and gracious scion of an honored race so taken aback was the gallic opponent of feminism that he could but exclaim diablo they order things differently in italy from what we do in la belle france Considering their attainments and achievements, the two women who occupy the highest place as archaeologists in the English-speaking world are Mrs. Agnes Smith Lewis and Margaret Dunlop Gibson. They are the twin daughters of the Reverend John Smith, an English clergyman, and have long enjoyed an enviable reputation among scriptural scholars and Orientalists. During their youth, they had the advantage of instruction under the best masters, and among other things, acquired a wide knowledge of the modern and classical languages. Subsequent study and frequent visits to Greece and the Orient made them proficient in modern Greek, Arabic, Hebrew, and Syriac. Becoming interested in the search for ancient manuscripts, they resolved to make the long and arduous journey to the Greek convent of St. Catherine, on Mount Sinai. In the latter part of January, 1892, these two brave and enterprising women left Suez for their destination in the heart of the Arabian desert. 
they were accompanied only by their dragoman and Bedouin servants. Eleven camels carried the two travelers, their baggage, tents, and provisions for fifty days. They had laid in supplies, not only for the two or three weeks they were to spend on the way to and from Sinai, but also for the month they expected to remain at the convent of St. Catherine. Arriving at the end of their journey, they were most cordially received by the monks, who afforded them every facility for examining the treasures of their unique and venerable library. They immediately set to work, and before they left the room in which the manuscripts were preserved, they had made one of the most remarkable finds of the century. For, in closely inspecting a dirty, forbidding old manuscript, whose leaves had probably not been turned for centuries, they discovered a palimpsest of which the upper writing contained the biographies of women saints, while that beneath proved to be one of the earliest copies of the Syriac Gospels, if not the very earliest in existence. No find since the celebrated discovery by Tischendorf of the Sinaitic Codex in the same convent nearly fifty years before ever excited such interest among scriptural scholars or was hailed with greater rejoicings. It was by all biblical students regarded as an invaluable contribution to scriptural literature and as a find which has doubled our sources of knowledge of the darkest corner of New Testament criticism. To distinguish it from the Codex Sinaiticus, the precious manuscript brought to light by Mrs. Lewis has been very appropriately named after the fortunate discoverer, and will hereafter be known as the Codex Ludovicus. Another find of rare importance made by the gifted twin sisters was a Palestinian Syriac lectionary similar to the hitherto unique copy in the library of the Vatican. A special interest attaches to this lectionary from the fact that it is written in the language that was most probably spoken by our Lord. Among other notable discoveries of Mrs. Luce and her sister during the four visits which they made to Mount Sinai and Palestine between the years 1892 and 1897, were a number of manuscripts in Arabic, and a portion of the original Hebrew manuscript of Ecclesiastes, which was written about 200 B.C. Previously, the oldest copy of this book of the Old Testament were the Greek and Syriac versions. What is especially remarkable about the discoveries made by Mrs. Lewis and Mrs. Gibson is that they were able to make so many valuable finds after the convent library at Mount Sinai had been so frequently examined by previous scholars. The indefatigable Tischendorf made three visits to this library and had but one phenomenal success. But neither he nor any of the other wandering scholars who have visited the convent attained, as has been well said, to a tithe of the acquaintance with its treasures which these energetic ladies possess. But more remarkable than the mere discovery of so many invaluable manuscripts, which was, of course, an extraordinary achievement, is the fact that these manuscripts, whether in Syriac, Arabic, or Hebrew, have been translated, annotated, and edited by these same scholarly women. Already more than a score of volumes have come from their prolific pens, all evincing the keenest critical acumen and the highest order of biblical and archaeological scholarship. The reader who desires a popular account of their famous discoveries should, by all means, read Mrs. Gibson's entertaining volume, How the Codex Was Found, and Mrs. Liu's charming little work entitled In the Shadow of Sinai. As to those men, and the species is yet far from extinct, who still doubt the capacity of women for the higher kinds of intellectual effort, let them glance at the pages of the numerous volumes given to the press by these richly dowered women, under the captions of Studia Sinaitica and Horae Semiticae, and if they are able to comprehend the evidence before them, they will be forced to admit that the long-imagined difference between the intellectual powers of men and women is one of fancy 
and not one of reality. And yet, strange to relate, while Mrs. Luce and Mrs. Gibson were electrifying the learned world by their achievements in the highest form of scholarship, the slow-moving University of Cambridge was gravely debating whether it was a proper thing to confer degrees upon women, and preparing to answer the question in the negative. The fact that there were representatives of the unenfranchised sex at their gates who had gathered more laurels in the field of scholarship than most of those who belonged to the privileged sex did not appeal to the university dons or prevent them from putting themselves on record as favoring a condition of things which, at this late age of the world, should be expected only among the women enslaving followers of Muhammad. The saying that a prophet hath no honor in his own country was fulfilled to the letter in the case of the two women who had shed such luster on the land of their birth. While foreign institutions were vying with one another in showering honors on the two brilliant English women with whose praises the whole world was resounding, the University of Cambridge was silent. The University of St. Andrews conferred on them the degree of LLD, while conservative old Heidelberg, casting aside its age-old traditions, made haste to honor them with the degree of Doctor of Divinity. In addition to this, Hale made Mrs. Lewis a Doctor of Philosophy. One would have thought that sheer shame, if not patriotic spirit, would have compelled the university in whose shadows the two women had their home, and in which Mrs. Lew's husband had held for years an official appointment, to show itself equally appreciative of superlative merit, and equally ready to reward rare scholarship, regardless of the sex of the beneficiaries. But no, the illustrious archaeologists and biblical scholars were women, and this fact alone was in the estimation of the Cambridge authorities, enough to withhold from them that recognition which was so spontaneously accorded them by the great universities of the continent. Nor was this the only instance of the kind, while the celebrated twin sisters just referred to were so materially contributing to a knowledge of biblical lore, another Englishwoman, Jane E. Harrison, who lived within hearing of the church bells of Cambridge, was lecturing to delighted audiences in Newnham College on the history, mythology, and monuments of ancient Athens, and writing those learned works on the religion and antiquities of Greece, which have given her so conspicuous a place among modern archaeologists. But, as in the case of her distinguished neighbors, the discoverers of the Codex Ludovicus, the degrees she was honored with came not from Cambridge, with which, through her fellowship in Newnham, she was so closely connected. And while this gifted lady was deserving so well of science and literature, the undergraduate students of Cambridge, following the cue given by the 2,400 graduates who had just rejected the proposal to give honorary degrees to women who could pass the required examinations, were given an exhibition of Rhodism which far surpassed that which a few years before had so disgraced the University of Edinburgh when the same question of degrees for women was under consideration. According to the report of an eyewitness of the turbulent scene at Cambridge, the undergraduate students appeared to be, as a body, viciously opposed to the proposal to give degrees to women, and became fairly riotous. They hooted those who supported the reform, and fired crackers even in the Senate House, and made the night lurid with bonfires and powder. They put up insulting effigies of girl students, and such mottoes as, Get you to Girton, Beatrice, get you to Noonham, here's no place for maids. Verily, when such scenes are possible in one of the world's great intellectual centers, a place where, above all others, women should receive due recognition for their contributions towards the progress of knowledge, one is constrained to declare that what we call civilization is still far from the ideal, 
and when one witnesses the total indifference of institutions like Cambridge and the French Academy to the splendid achievements of women like Mrs. Lewes, Mrs. Gibson, and Madame Curie, one cannot but exclaim in words apocalyptic, How long, O oh Lord, holy and true, is this iniquitous discrimination against one half of our race to endure? O oh Lord, how long? End of chapter 9, part 2《Section 21 of Woman in Science》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Woman in Science by John Augustine Zahm》Chapter 10, Part 1 Women as Inventors there have been very learned women, as there have been women warriors, but there have never been women inventors. Thus wrote Voltaire, with that flippancy and cocksureness which was so characteristic of the author of the Dictionnaire Philosophique, a man who was ever ready to give, offhand, a categorical answer to any question that came before him for discussion. His countryman, Proudhon, expressed the same opinion in other words, when he wrote, Les femmes n'ont rien inventé, pas même le quenoï. Women have invented nothing, not even their distaff. Had these two writers thoroughly sifted the evidence available, even in their day, for a proper consideration of this interesting subject, they would, both of them, have reached a very different conclusion from that which is expressed in the sentences just quoted. Had they consulted the records of antiquity, they would have learned that most of the earliest and most important inventions were attributed to women, and, had they studied the reports of explorers among the savage tribes of the modern world, they would have found that these early legends and traditions regarding the inventions of women were fully confirmed by what was being done in their own time. Man's first needs were food, shelter, and clothing— and tradition in all parts of the world is unanimous in ascribing to woman the invention, in essentially their present forms, of all the arts most conducive to the preservation and well-being of our race. In Egypt, as Diodorus Siculus informs us, the inventors of specially useful things were, as a reward of their deserts, enrolled among the gods, as were certain heroes among the ancient Greeks and Romans. Foremost among these was Isis, who laid the foundation of agriculture by the introduction of the culture of wheat and other cereals. Before her time the Egyptians lived on roots and herbs. In lieu of these crude articles of food, Isis gave them bread and other more wholesome aliments. She invented the process of making linen, and was the first to apply a sail to the propulsion of a boat. To her also was attributed the art of embalming, the discovery of many medicines, and the beginnings of Egyptian literature. Even more prominent was Pallas Athena, one of the greatest divinities of the Greeks. Virgil, in his Georgics, invokes her as, Inventor, Pallas, of the fattening oil, thou founder of the plough and the ploughman's toil. But not only was she regarded as the Oliae Inventrix, inventress of the olive, as Virgil phrases it, but also as the inventor of all handicrafts, whether of women or men. Like Isis, she was deemed the originator of agriculture, and many of the mechanic arts. But above all, she was the inventor of musical instruments, and those plastic and graphic arts which have for ages placed Greece in the forefront of civilization and culture. From the beginning it was woman who first made use of wool and flax for textile fabrics, and of this prehistoric woman one can affirm what Solomon, in his book of Proverbs, said of the virtuous woman of his day. She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh diligently with her hands. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She was also the first one to weave cotton and silk. It was Mama Oklo, the wife of Manco Capac, as the Inca historian Garcilaso de la Vega tells us, who taught the women of ancient Peru to sew and weave cotton and wool, and to make clothes for themselves, their husbands, and children. And it was a woman, 
Se Ling Shi, the wife of the Emperor Huang Te, who lived nearly three thousand years before Christ, to whom the most ancient Chinese writers assign the discovery of silk. Her name is perpetuated in the name China, the goddess of silkworms, and under this appellation she still receives divine honours. The preparation and weaving of silk were introduced into Japan by four Chinese girls, and the new industry soon became there, as in China, one of the chief sources, as it is today, of the country's wealth. To perpetuate the memory of these four pioneer silk weavers, the grateful Japanese erected a temple in their honor in the province of Setsu. According to tradition, the eggs of the silk moth and the seed of the mulberry tree were conveyed to India, concealed in the lining of her headdress by a Chinese princess. She was thus instrumental in establishing in the region watered by the Indus and the Ganges the same industry which her countrywomen had introduced into the land of the rising sun. Cashmere shawls and attar of roses, the costliest of perfumes, are attributed to an Indian empress, Nur Mahal, whom her husband, in view of her achievements as well as on account of his passionate love for her, called the light of the world. And what shall we say of those exquisite creations of woman's brain and hand, needlepoint and pillow lace? These two inventions, like the manufacture of silk, have given employment to tens of thousands of women throughout the world, and in such countries as Italy, Belgium, and France, where lace-making has received special attention, they have for centuries been most prolific sources of revenue. Silk fabrics in ancient Rome were worth their weight in gold. The finest specimens of point lace are, even today, as highly prized as precious stones, and, like the great masterpieces of plastic art, are handed down as heirlooms from generation to generation. In no other instance, except possibly in the hairspring of a watch, is there such an extraordinary difference in value between the raw material and the finished product as there is in the case of the finest thread lace. A great sensation was caused in Italy a few decades ago when a humble workwoman, Signora Bassani, succeeded in rediscovering the peculiar stitch of the celebrated Venetian point, which had been lost for centuries. She was at once granted a patent for her invention, which was by her countrymen regarded as an event of national importance. After painting and sculpture, probably no art has contributed more to the development of the aesthetic sense among the nations of the world than has the art whose chief tools are the needle and the bobbin, in the deft hands of a beauty-loving woman. If the name of the first lace-maker had not been lost in the mists of antiquity, it is reasonable to suppose that she, too, would long since have had a monument erected to her memory, as well as the weavers of silk and makers of attar of roses and cashmere shawls. She was surely as deserving of such an honour. More conclusive information respecting woman as an inventor is, strange as it may appear, afforded by a systemic study of the various races of mankind which are still in a state of savagery. Such a study discloses the interesting fact that woman, contrary to the declaration of Proudhon, has not only been the inventor of the distaff, but that she has furthermore, pace Voltaire, been the inventor of all the peaceful arts of life, and the inventor, too, of the earliest forms of nearly all the mechanical devices now in use in the world of industry. Architecture, as well as many other things, was credited by the ancient Greeks to Minerva. This was a poetical way of stating the fact, now generally accepted by men of science, that women were the first homemakers. But the first home was a very simple and a very humble structure. When not a cave, it was a simple shelter made of bark or skins, sufficient to afford protection to the mother and her child. Subsequently it was a lodge made of earth, of stone, or wattlework, or adobe. Women were, in the light of anthropology as well as in that of mythology and tradition, the first to discover the nutritive and medicinal values of fruits, seeds, nuts, roots, and vegetables. They were consequently the first gardeners and agriculturalists, and the first to build up a materia medica. While men were engaged in the chase or in warfare, 
women were gradually perfecting those diverse domestic arts which, in the course of time, became their recognized specialties. They soon found that it was better to cultivate certain food plants and trees than to depend on them for nourishment in the wild state. This was particularly true in the case of such useful and widely distributed species as wheat, rice, maize, the yam, potato, banana, and cassava. At first most of these food products were used in the raw state, but woman's quick inventive genius was not long in making one of the most important and far-reaching discoveries, a method for producing fire. In a certain sense this was the greatest discovery ever made, and the Greeks showed their appreciation of the value of it by asserting that fire was stolen from heaven. Considering its multifarious uses in heating and cooking, thereby immensely adding to the comfort and well-being of primitive man, we are not surprised that in certain parts of the world fire has always been considered something sacred, and that the old Romans instituted vestal virgins, and the ancient Peruvians, virgins of the sun, to preserve this precious element, and have it ever ready, when required for sacrifice, or for any of their various liturgical functions. If any one ever deserved a monument more durable than bronze, it was the woman who, on the edge of time, first drew the Promethean spark from a piece of pyrites, by striking it with flint, or produced it by the friction of two pieces of wood. After building a home, and establishing in it a fireplace for the preparation of food, woman's next concern was to secure more raiment than was afforded by the traditional fig-leaf. This she found in the bark of certain trees, in the fibre of hemp and cotton, and in the wool of sheep and goats. With these and her distaff she spun thread, and from the thread thus obtained she was by means of her primitive loom, likewise her invention, able to provide all kinds of textile fabrics for clothing for herself and family. But there was much more to invent before the home of primitive man, or rather primitive woman, could be considered as fairly equipped. Furniture and culinary utensils were required, and these too were provided by the deft and cunning fingers of woman. She was the first potter, and the first basket-maker, and any one who has lived among the savages of any land, especially among the aborigines in the interior of South America, knows what an important part is played in domestic economy by native basketry and ceramic ware. Both of these articles were at first of the simplest character, but woman's innate aesthetic sense soon enabled her to produce those highly ornate specimens of pottery and basketry that are so highly prized in the public and private collections of this country and Europe. The first device for converting grain into flour was, like the many other articles already named, the invention of woman. Whether the simple mortar and pestle of the North American Indian, or the Mexican metate and muller, or the Irish quern, it was, in every case, the product of woman's brain and handiwork, as it was also the basal prototype of our most important types of flouring mills. And so was the soapstone pot, the predecessor of the iron or brass kettle, a woman's invention, as well as many similar contrivances for preparing food. But what is probably the most remarkable culinary invention of woman in the state of savagery is her unique contrivance for converting the poisonous root of the manihot utilissima, the staple food of tropical America, into a wholesome and nutritious aliment. It is a bag, called matapi, which serves both as a press and as a sieve. For the inhabitants of the vast basins of the Amazon and the Orinoco, where the chief articles of diet are derived from the manihot and the plantain, this invention of woman is the most important ever made, and ranks in importance with the discovery by the same skilled food purveyor of the dietetic value of manihot itself. The first knife was a woman's invention, as the arrowhead and the spear-point were the inventions of her hunter-husband. It was in the beginning a most primitive implement, but, whether in the form of a simple flake of flint of obsidian, or in that of an Eskimo ulu, the woman's knife, it was the archetype of all the forms of cutlery now in use. With this rude knife the primitive housewife skinned and carved the game brought to her by her male companion. 
With it she scraped the interior of the hide, and cut it up into articles of clothing. She was thus the first furrier and tailor. With it she made the first sandals and moccasins, and, in doing so, became the first shoemaker, and the original St. Crispin. To woman, the originator of the first home, is due also the invention of the oven and the chimney. She was also the first maker of salt, that all-important condiment and sanitary agent, and the first to obtain nitre from wood ashes. She was the first engineer, as is evinced in her invention of the parbuckle and in the bamboo conduit, which was the predecessor of the great canals of Babylonia, and the imposing aqueducts of ancient Rome. Footnote. The inventor of canals, as well as of bridges over rivers and causeways over morasses, was, according to Greek historians, the famous Assyrian queen, Semiramis, the builder of Babylon, with its wonderful hanging gardens. End footnote. Important, however, as are all the foregoing inventions, we must not forget what was an equally important contribution by woman to the welfare and progress of our race, the domestication of animals. No discovery after that of artificially producing fire has contributed more toward the development of our race than the taming of milk and fleece-bearing animals, like the cow, the sheep, the goat, and the llama, or of burden-bearing animals, like the horse, the ass, the camel, and the reindeer, or of hunting and watching animals, like the faithful ubiquitous dog. For, in the first place, the domestication of these supremely useful animals diminished man's labor as burden-bearers. It likewise supplemented the fecundity of women, and facilitated the multiplication of the race, because it supplied to the child a nourishment that previously could be obtained only from the mother, who had been obliged to suckle her young several years longer than was necessary, after the friendly goat and cow came to her aid. Still another consequence of the domestication of animals was that it immensely diminished the amount of woman's care and labor, afforded her the necessary leisure to develop the arts of refinement, and stimulated intellectual growth in a way that otherwise would have been impossible. It is often stated by certain writers who love to indulge in fanciful speculations that women inventors got their ideas as home-builders and weavers and potters, from nest-building birds, from web-weaving spiders, and from clay-workers like termites and mud-wasps. Be this as it may, the fact remains in all its inspiring truth that, in the matter of industrialism, as opposed to the militancy of man, we can unhesitatingly declare, with Virgil, dux femina facti, woman was the leader in all the arts of peace, arts which have been slowly perfected through the ages until they present the extraordinary development which we now witness. When we contemplate the splendid porcelain wares of Meissen and Sèvres, or the countless varieties of cutlery produced in the factories of Sheffield, or the beautiful textile fabrics from the looms of Lowell and Manchester, or the delicate silks woven in the famous establishments of Lombardy and southern France, or the countless forms of footwear made in Lynn and Chicago, or the exquisite furs brought from Siberia and the Pribilof Islands, and dyed in Leipzig and London, or the astonishing output of food products from the factories of Pittsburgh and the immense roller mills of Minneapolis, we little think that the colossal wheels of these vast and varied industries were set in motion by the inventive genius of woman in the dim and distant prehistoric past. And yet such is the case. Her handiwork from the earliest pottery may be traced through its manifold stages from its first rude beginnings to the most gorgeous creations of ceramic art. The primeval knife of flint or obsidian has become the keen tool of tempered steel. The simple distaff has issued in the intricate jacquard loom. The metate and pestle actuated by a woman's arm have, by a long process of evolution, developed into our mammoth roller mills, impelled by water-power, steam, or electricity. But these extraordinary changes from the rude implements of prehistoric time to the complicated machinery of the present is but a change of kind, not one of principle. It is a change due to specialization of work, which became possible only when men, 
liberated from the avocations of hunting and warfare, were able to take up the occupations of women, and develop them in the manner with which we are now familiar. Why men, rather than women, should have achieved this work of specialization, whether it was due to social causes, or to woman's physical and mental organization, or to these various factors combined, we need not inquire, but such is the fact. Whereas in primitive times every woman having a home was a cook, a butcher, a baker, a potter, a weaver, a cutler, a miller, a tanner, a furrier, an engineer, man, in assuming the work which was originally exclusively feminine, and performed by one and the same person, has subdivided and specialized by improved forms of machinery and otherwise, so that what is now done is accomplished more rapidly and to better purpose, and with correspondingly greater results in the development of industry and in the progress of civilization. And the remarkable fact is that many of the most important of these improvements, due to specialization, have been made within the memory of those yet living, while still others have been originated in quite recent years. Nevertheless, great as has been the work of specialization and coordination in every department of human industry during the last few decades, it is, to judge by the reports of the Patent Office, as yet in little more than its initial stage. End of chapter 10, part 1. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in San Diego, California, in March 2011. Section 22 of Woman in Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman in Science by John Augustine Zamm Chapter 10, Part 2 We are now prepared for the consideration of the part woman has taken in this specializing movement, and for a discussion of her share in modern inventions, and in the improvements of those manifold inventions which were due to her genius and industry untold ages ago. Considering the short time during which her inventive mind has been specially active, and the many handicaps which have been imposed on her, the wonder is not that she has achieved so little in comparison with man, but rather that she has accomplished so much. The first woman to receive a patent in the United States was Mary Keyes. It was issued May 5, 1809, for a process of straw weaving with silk or thread. Six years later, Mary Brush was granted a patent for a corset. It seems to have been quite satisfactory, for no other patent of this article of feminine attire was issued to a woman until 1841, when one was granted to Elizabeth Adams. During the thirty-two years which elapsed between the issuing of a patent to Mary Keyes and Elizabeth Adams, but twenty other patents were granted to women. The chief of these were for weaving hats from grass, manufacturing moccasins, whitening leghorn straw, for a sheet-iron shovel, a cook-stove, and a machine for cutting straw and fodder. During the decade following 1841, fourteen patents were issued to as many different women. Among the articles patented by them were an ice-cream freezer, a weighing scale, and a fan attachment for a rocking-chair. It was not recorded, however, that this last invention, valuable as it was, apparently, ever became particularly popular. But by far the most remarkable of woman's inventions during this period was a submarine telescope and lamp, for which a patent was awarded in 1845 to Sarah Mather. From 1851 to 1861, twenty-eight patents were issued to women, just twice the number awarded them during the preceding decade. Most of these patents were for articles of domestic use or feminine apparel. Four of them, however, comprised a scale for instrumental music, for mounting fluid lenses, a fountain pen, and an improvement in reaping and mowing machines. The following decade is remarkable for the wonderful increase in the number of inventions due to women, for there was a sudden jump from twenty-eight 
to 441 patents awarded them between the years 1861 and 1871. Women now began to have confidence in their inventive faculties, and, no longer content with exercising their genius on articles of clothing and culinary utensils, sewing, washing, and churning machines, they began to devote their attention to objects that were entirely foreign to their ordinary home activities. This is clearly evinced by the patents they obtained for such inventions as improvements in locomotive wheels, devices for reducing straw and other fibrous substances for the manufacture of paper pulp, improvements in corn huskers, low water indicators, steam and other whistles, corn ploughs, a method of constructing screw propellers, improvements in materials for packing journals and bearings, in fire alarms, thermometers, railroad car heaters, improvements in lubricating railway journals, in conveyors of smoke and cinders for locomotives, in pyrotechnic night signals, burglar alarms, railway car safety apparatus, in apparatus for punching corrugated metals, desulfurizing ores and other similar inventions in the domain of mechanical engineering, inventions that, at first blush, would seem to be quite alien to the genius and capacity of woman. From now on, women's inventions in the United States increased at an extraordinary rate, for from 1871 until July 1, 1888, when the first government report was made on the patents issued to women inventors, she had to her credit nearly 2,000 inventions, many of which were of prime importance. During the seven years following 1888, she was awarded 2,526 patents, more than the total number that had been granted her during the preceding 79 years. Between 1895 and 1910, 3,615 more patents were placed to her credit, making a grand total for her first century of inventive achievement of 8,596 patents. No patent office reports are available since 1910, but the number of inventions for which women have received patents since Mary Keyes was awarded hers on May 5, 1809, for straw weaving with silk or thread, cannot be far from 10,000. This fact will, doubtless, be a revelation to that large class of men who still seem to share the views of Voltaire and Proudhon that women are incapable of inventing even the simplest article of domestic use. The following story well illustrates the prevailing ignorance regarding the part women have taken in the invention of certain articles that are so common that most people think they were never patented. I was out driving once with an old farmer in Vermont, writes Mrs. Ada C. Bowles, and he told me, You women may talk about your rights, but why don't you invent something? I answered, Your horse's feed bag and the shade over his head were both of them invented by women. The old fellow was so taken aback that he was barely able to gasp, Do tell! Had he investigated further, he would have found that the fly-net on the horse's back, the tugs and other harness trimmings, the shoes on his horse's feet, and the buggy-seat he then occupied, were all the inventions of women. Footnote. To one woman, Mary E. Poupard, of London, England, were granted in a single year no less than three patents for horseshoes, two of the patents being for sectional and segmental horseshoes. End footnote. He would, doubtless, also have discovered that the curry-comb he had used before starting out on his drive, as well as the snap-hook of the halter and the check-rein, and the stall-unhitching device, were likewise the inventions of members of that sex whose capacity he was so disposed to depreciate. For women have been awarded patents— in some instances several of them, for all the articles that have been mentioned. He might furthermore have learned that the fellies in his buggy-wheels and his daughter's side-saddle had been made under women's patents, and that, to complete his surprise and confusion, the leather used in his harness had been sewn by a machine patented by a woman who was not only an inventor, but who was also, for many years, the manager and proprietor of a large harness factory 
in New York City. What particularly arrests one's attention in reading the patent office reports is not only the large number of inventions by women, but also the very wide range of the devices which they embrace. It is not surprising to find them inventing and improving culinary utensils, house furniture and furnishings, toilet articles, wearing apparel and stationery, trunks and bags, toys and games, designs for printed and textile fabrics, for boxes and baskets, screens, awnings, baby carriers, musical instruments, appliances for washing and cleaning, attachments for bicycles and typewriting machines, art, educational and medical appliances, for these things are in keeping with their proper métier. But it is surprising for those who are not familiar with the history of modern inventions to learn of the share women have had in inventing and improving agricultural implements, building appurtenances, motors of various kinds, plumbing apparatus, theatrical stage mechanisms, and, above all, countless railway appliances, from a coupling or fender to an apparatus for sanding railroad tracks, or a device for unloading boxcars. Those who are still of the opinion of Voltaire and Proudhon, and their name is Legion, respecting woman's inventive powers, might be willing to accord her the capacity to design a new form of clothes-pin, or hair-crimper, or rouge-pad, or complexion-mask, or powder-puff, or baby-jumper, but they would limit her ability to contrivances of this character. But what would these same people say if they were told that, over and above the things just mentioned for which many women have actually received patents, the much depreciated female sex had been granted patents for locomotive wheels, stuffing boxes, railway car safety apparatus, life rafts, cut-offs for hydraulic and other engines, street cars, mining machines, furnaces for smelting ores, sound-deadening attachments for railway cars, feed pumps and transfer apparatus for traction cars, machines for driving hoops onto barrels, apparatus for destroying vegetation on and removing snow from railroads, coke crushers, artificial stone compositions, elevated railways, new forms of cattle cars, dams and reservoirs, welding seams of pipes and hardening iron, alloys for bell metal and alloys to resemble silver, methods of refining and hardening copper, processes for concentrating ores, improvement in elevators, and designs for raising sunken vessels. And yet, incredible as it may appear to these scoffers at woman's genius, patents for all these inventions, methods, and processes, many of them of exceeding value, and for hundreds of others of a similar nature, have been issued to women during recent years. And the activity of the fair inventors, far from abating, is becoming daily more pronounced, and promises to reward their efforts with far greater triumphs. Indeed, women are becoming so active in the numerous fields of invention, even in such unlikely ones as metallurgy and civil, mechanical, and electrical engineering, that they bid fair to rival men in what they have long regarded as their peculiar specialty. In 1892, a woman in New York was granted two patents, one for a process of malting beer, and the other for hooping malt liquors. These inventions, however, are not so foreign to the avocation of woman as they at first appear. For if we may believe the teachings of ethnology and prehistoric archaeology in this matter, women were the first brewers. The one, therefore, who two decades ago secured the two patents just mentioned, was but taking up anew an occupation in which her sex furnished the first invention many thousand years ago. An instructive fact touching woman's inventive achievements is that her fullest success is coincident with her enlarged opportunities for education, and began with the breaking down of the prejudices which so long existed against her having anything to do with the development of the mechanical or industrial arts. When one recollects that the public schools of Boston, established in 1642, were not open to girls until a century and a half later, and then only for the most elementary branches, and for but one half the year, and that girls did not have the benefit of a high school education in the centre of New England culture until 1852, 
and when one furthermore recalls the attitude of the general public toward women and girls extending their activities beyond the nursery and the kitchen it is easy to understand that there was not much encouragement for them to exercise their inventive talent even if they had felt an inclination to do so the experience of miss margaret knight of boston who in eighteen seventy one was awarded a valuable patent for making a paper bag machine is a case in point and well illustrates some of the difficulties that women inventors had to contend with only a few decades ago as a child she writes to a friend i never cared for the things that girls usually do dolls never had any charms for me i couldn't see the sense of coddling bits of porcelain with senseless faces the only things i wanted were a jackknife a gimlet and pieces of wood my friends were horrified i was called a tomboy but that made very little impression on me i sighed sometimes because i was not like other girls but wisely concluded that i couldn't help it and sought further consolation from my tools i was always making things for my brothers did they want anything in the line of playthings they always said matty will make them for us i was famous for my kites and my sleds were the envy and admiration of all the boys in town i'm not surprised at what i've done i'm only sorry i couldn't have had as good a chance as a boy and have put to my trade regularly even after she had demonstrated her skill as an inventor miss knight had to encounter the skepticism of the workmen to whom she entrusted the manufacture of her machines they questioned her ability to superintend her own work and it was only her persistency and remarkable competency that ultimately converted their incredulity into respect and admiration since women have come into the possession of greater freedom than they formerly enjoyed and have been afforded better opportunities of developing their inventive faculties many of them have taken to invention as an occupation and with marked success they find it the easiest and most congenial way of earning a livelihood and not a few of them have been able thereby to accumulate comfortable fortunes besides developing industries that have given employment to thousands of both sexes thus the straw industry in the united states is due to miss betsy metcalf who more than a century ago produced the first straw bonnet ever manufactured in this country since then the industry which this woman originated has assumed immense proportions the number of straw hats now made in massachusetts alone not to speak of those annually manufactured elsewhere runs into the millions scarcely less wonderful is the industry developed by miss knight already mentioned through her marvellous invention for manufacturing satchel bottom paper bags many men had previously essayed to solve the problem which she attacked with such signal success but all to no purpose so valuable was her invention considered by experts that she refused fifty thousand dollars for it shortly after taking out her patent often what are apparently the most trivial inventions prove the most lucrative thus a chicago woman receives a handsome income for her invention of a paper pail a woman in san francisco invented a baby carriage and received fourteen thousand dollars for her patent the gimlet pointed screw which was the idea of a little girl has realized to its patentee an independent fortune still more remarkable is the burden horseshoe machine the invention of a woman which turns out a complete horseshoe every three seconds and which is said to have effected a saving to the public of tens of millions of dollars the cotton gin one of the most useful and important of american inventions a machine that effected a complete revolution in the cotton industry throughout the world is due to a woman catherine l green the wife of general nathaniel green of revolutionary fame after she had fully developed in her own mind a method for separating the cotton from its seed which was after her husband's death she entrusted the making of the machine to eli whitney who was then boarding with her and who had a yankee skill in the use of tools 
Whitney was several times on the point of abandoning as impossible the task which had been assigned to him, but Mrs. Green's faith in ultimate success never wavered, and thanks to her persistence in the work and the putting into execution of her ideas, her great undertaking was finally crowned with success. She did not apply for a patent for her invention in her own name, because so opposed was public opinion to woman's having part in mechanical occupation, that she would have exposed herself to general ridicule, and to a loss of position in society. The consequence was that Whitney, her employee, got credit for an invention which, in reality, belonged to her. She was, however, subsequently able to retain a subordinate interest in it through her second husband, Mr. Miller. This is only one of many instances in which patents taken out in the name of some man are really due to women. The earliest development of the mower and reaper, as well as the clover cleaner, belongs to Mrs. A. H. Manning of Plainfield, New Jersey. The patent on the clover cleaner was issued in the name of her husband, but as he failed to apply for a patent for the mower and reaper, his wife was, after his death, robbed of the fruit of her brain by a neighbor, whose name appears on the list of patentees of an invention which originated with Mrs. Manning. A few years ago men of science awoke to the startling fact that the earth's supply of nitrates was being rapidly exhausted. It was then realized that, unless some new store of this essential fertilizer could be found, it would soon be impossible to provide the food requisite for the world's teeming millions. What was to be done? Never was a more important problem presented to science for solution, and never did science more quickly and efficaciously respond. It was soon recognized that the Earth's atmosphere was the only available storehouse for the much-needed nitrogen. Forthwith, scientists and inventors the world over proceeded to tap this source of supply and to convert its vast stores of nitrogen into the nitrates, which are so indispensable to vegetable life. To form some idea of the importance of the problem and the urgency of its solution, it may be stated that the amount of fertilizer required for the cotton crop alone in the southern states in 1911 was no less than three million tons. What, then, must have been the total amount used through the world for cereals and other crops that need constant fertilizing? The famous nitrate deposits of Chile could supply only a small fraction of the stupendous amount required, and they— according to recent calculations, cannot continue to meet the present demands on them for more than a hundred years longer at most. The process involved, when once conceived, was simple enough, for it merely required the conversion of the nitrogen of the air into nitric acid, which in turn was employed in the production of nitrate of lime. But, simple as it was, mankind had to wait a long time for its origination, and action was taken only when necessity compelled. At present there are numerous nitrate factories in France, Germany, Austria, Sweden, Norway, and the United States, and the output is already enormous and constantly increasing. Electricity, that mysterious force which has so frequently come to man's assistance during the last few decades, is the agent employed. But who was the originator of the idea of utilizing the atmosphere for the production of nitrates? Who took out the first patent for a process for making nitrates by using the nitrogen of the air? It was a Frenchwoman, Madame Lefebvre of Paris, long since forgotten. As early as 1859 she obtained a patent in England for her invention, but, as the need of fertilizers was not so urgent then as it is now, it was allowed to drop into oblivion, and the matter was not again taken up until a half-century later, when others secured the credit for an idea which was first conceived by a woman who happened to have the misfortune to live fifty years in advance of her time. It were easy to extend the list of important inventions due to women, and of patents which were issued in the name of their husbands or other men to tell of inventions, too, of whose fruits, because they happened to be helpless or inexperienced women, the real patentees were often robbed. But the foregoing instances are quite sufficient to show what woman's keen inventive genius is capable of achieving, in spite of all the restrictions put on her sex, 
and in spite of her lack of training in the mechanical arts. Had women, since the organization of our patent office, enjoyed all the educational opportunities possessed by men, had they received the same encouragement as the lordly sex to develop their inventive faculties, had the laws of the country accorded them the rewards to which their labor and genius entitled them, they would now have far more inventions to their credit than those indicated in our government reports, and they would furthermore be able to point to far more brilliant achievements than have heretofore, under the unfavorable conditions under which they were obliged to work, been possible. But when we recall all the obstacles they have had to overcome, and remember also the fact that most of the patents referred to in the preceding pages have been secured by women living in the United States, little being said of the modern inventions of women in foreign countries, we can see that their record is indeed a splendid one, that their achievements are not only worthy of all praise, but also a happy augury for the future. When they shall have the same freedom of action as men in all departments of activity in which they exhibit special aptitude, when they shall have the same advantages of training and equipment, and the prospect of the same emoluments as the sterner sex for the products of their brainwork and craftsmanship, then may we expect them to achieve the same distinction in the mechanic arts as has rewarded their efforts in science and literature. And then, too, may we hope to see them once more regain something of that supremacy in invention which was theirs in the early history of our race. End of chapter 10. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in March 2011, in San Diego, California. Section 23 of Woman in Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Woman in Science by John Augustine Zahm. Chapter 11, Part 1. Women as Inspirers and Collaborators in Science. One of the most interesting literary figures of the 5th century was Caius Apollinaris Sidonius, who, after holding a number of important civil offices, became the Bishop of Clermont. The most valuable of his extant works are his nine books of letters, which are a mine of information respecting the history of his age and the manners, customs and ideals of his contemporaries. In one of these letters, addressed to Hesperius, a young friend of his who exhibited special talent in polite literature, he expresses a sentiment which applies as well to the votary of science as to the man of letters. Referring to the assistance which women had given to their husbands and friends in their studies, he conjures him to remember that in days of old it was the want of Martia, Terentia, Calpurnia, Pudentilla, and Rusticana to hold the lamp, while their husbands Hortensius, Cicero, Pliny, Apuleius, and Symmachus were reading and meditating. This picture of women as light-bearers to the great orators and philosophers just named is symbolic of them as the helpmates and inspirers of men in every field of human activity, and in every age of the world's history. Always and everywhere, when permitted to occupy the same social plane as men, women have been not only as lamps unto the feet, and light unto the paths of their male compares in the ordinary affairs of life, but have also been their guiding stars and ministering angels in the highest spheres of intellectual effort. For nearly eighteen centuries, St. Jerome has had the gratitude of the Church for his masterly translation, known as the Vulgate, of the Hebrew Scriptures. But, had it not been for his two noble friends, Paula and Istotium, who were as eminent for their intellectual attainments as they were for their descent from the most distinguished families of Rome and Greece, there would have been no Vulgate. For they were not only his inspirers in this colossal undertaking, but they were his active and zealous collaborators as well. Dante and Petrarch are acclaimed as the morning stars of modern literature, but both of them owe their immortality to the inspiration of two pure-minded and noble-hearted women. In the concluding paragraph of his Vita Nuova, the most beautiful love story ever written, Dante records his purpose to say of his inspirer, the gentle, gracious Beatrice Portinari, what was never said of any woman. The outcome of this exalted purpose was the Divina Commedia, the world's greatest literary masterpiece. Petrarch, the father of humanism, is the first to give Laura de Noves credit for his attainments as a poet. In one of his poems he sings, Blessed be the year, the month, the hour, the day, 
the season and the time and point of space and blessed the beauteous country and the place where first of two eyes i felt the sway elsewhere in one of his prose dialogues with st augustine he declares whatever you see in me be it little or much is due to her nor would i ever have attained to this measure of name and fame unless she had cherished by those most noble influences that my feeble implanting of virtues which nature had placed in this breast a no less remarkable inspirer but in an entirely different sphere of activity was a devout and spotless italian maiden chiara schiffi better known as st clara she was as is well known the ardent cooperator of st francis assisi in his great work of social and religious reform which has contributed so much towards the welfare of humanity but it is not generally known what an important part she had in this great undertaking and how she sustained the poverello during the long hours of trial and hardship it was during these periods of care and struggle that we see how courageous and intrepid was this woman who has always been represented as frail emaciated blanched like a flower of the cloister she defended francis not only against others but also against himself in those dark hours of discouragement which so often and so profoundly disturb the noblest souls and sterilize the grandest efforts she was beside him to show the way when he doubted his mission and thought of fleeing to the heights of repose and solitary prayer it was she who showed him the ripening harvest with no reapers to gather it in men going astray with no shepherd to herd them and drew him once again into the train of the galilean into the number of those who give their lives as a ransom for many it is under the shade of the olive trees of st damien with his sister friend clara caring for him that he composes his finest work that which ernest renan called the most perfect utterance of modern religious sentiment the canticle of the sun this canticle however beautiful as it is lacks as has well been remarked one strophe if it was not upon francis's lips it was surely in his heart be praised lord for sister clara thou hast made her silent active and sagacious and by her thy light shines in our hearts it was through the inspiration and influence of theodora that the famous church of st sophia that matchless poem in marble and gold that imperishable monument to the glory of the true god came into existence it was through her that justinian conceived the idea of those pandects and institutes which constitute the greatest glory of his reign and which are the basis of the code napoleon and of all modern jurisprudence it was to the vittoria colonna that michelangelo dedicated many of the most exquisite productions of his peerless genius he saw as has been said with her eyes and acted by her inspiration almost every one of chopin's compositions was inspired by women and a large proportion of them are dedicated to them the same may be said of mozart mendelssohn schubert beethoven weber schumann and other illustrious composers all of these sons of genius believed with castiglione that all inspiration must come from woman that she had been expressly created and sent into the world to inspire them with intelligence and creative power monsieur clavier declares that there is hardly a philosopher or a poet of the sixteenth century whose pages are not illuminated or gladdened by the smile of some high-born lady what the brilliant frenchman says of the influence of women on the poets and philosophers of a single century could with equal truth be said of the poets and philosophers of every century from anacreon and plato to the present day and still more it can be predicated of women's inspiration and influence in every department of intellectual effort in art and architecture in music and literature in science in all its departments whether deductive or inductive it has been well said were history to be rewritten with due regard to women's share in it many small causes heretofore disregarded would be found fully to explain great and unlooked-for results for it is not in outward facts nor in great names nor noisy deeds nor genealogies of crowned heads nor in tragic loves nor ambitious or striking heroism nor crime that we find proofs of the constant and secret working whereby woman most effectually asserts herself certainly she has played her part in the outward and visible history of the world but in that history which is told and written which is buried in archives and revivified in books women's part is always small when set beside that of her companion man she contributes but little and at this she may surely rejoice to the tales of battles and treaties of successions and alliances of fraud violence suspicions and hatreds but if the inward history of human affairs could be described as fully as the outward facts if the story of the family could be told together with the story of the nation if human thoughts could with certainty be divined from human deeds then the chief figure in this history of sentiment and morals would certainly be that of woman the inspirer this same statement would hold equally good if applied to the part taken by women in the history of science
their achievements have in most cases been so overshadowed by those of men that their work has been usually regarded of negligible quantity but when one considers the main springs of actions and examines the silent undercurrents which escape the notice of the superficial observer one finds as in social and political history that the most important scientific investigations are often conducted and the most momentous discoveries are made in consequence of the promptings of some devoted woman friend or in virtue of the still small voice of a cherished wife or sister who prefers to remain in the background in order that all the glory of achievement may redound to the man there have been it may safely be asserted few really eminent men in science as there have been few really eminent men in art or letters or in the great reform and religious movements of the world who have not been assisted by some woman light-bearer as were hortensius by martia tully by terentia and pliny by calpurnia there have been few that have not during hours of doubt and discouragement been sustained and stimulated as was francis by clara jerome by paula and eustochium and there have been still fewer who have not had, like Petrarch and Dante, their Laura or their Beatrice, of whom each could say, This is the beacon guides to deeds of worth, and urges me to see the glorious goal. This bids me leave behind the vulgar throng. In the preceding chapters, we have had notable examples of women whose beneficent influence and cooperation have enabled distinguished men of science to achieve results that would otherwise have been impossible among these to mention only a few were madame lavoisier madame curie in chemistry madame laput and miss herschel in astronomy mrs agassiz and madame coudreau in national science and exploration madame schliemann and madame dulafoy in archaeology one of the most illustrious women inspirers of france was catherine de parthenay who after attaining womanhood became the brilliant princess de rohan and was recognized as one of the most learned and most remarkable women of the sixteenth century as a young girl she exhibited rare intelligence and displayed a special aptitude for the exact sciences for this reason her mother saw to it that her child had the benefit of instruction under the ablest masters that could be secured the most noticed of these was Françoise viette the learned french mathematician who is justly regarded as the father of modern algebra in his day especially in the higher classes of society the education given to women was often more thorough than that afforded to men for this reason too women not infrequently became distinguished in astronomy which was then usually known under the name of astrology viette in initiating his gifted pupil into the principles of this science became himself so enthusiastic a student of astronomy that he determined to prepare an elaborate work on the subject something on the plan of the alma guest of ptolemy a work which he designated harmonicum celeste in order that the instruction given his pupil might not be lacking in precision, Viette wrote out with the most scrupulous care the lessons designed for her benefit. The manuscripts containing these lessons were long preserved among the family archives, but nearly all of them were unfortunately consigned to the flames during the French Revolution in 1793. No one was more interested in Viette's mathematical researches, those researches which have rendered him so famous in the history of science, than was the Princess de Rohan the former pupil was the first to receive notice of her distinguished master's discoveries and the first to congratulate him on his success it was to this cherished pupil who always remained his friend and benefactress that viete dedicated his important work on mathematical analysis entitled in artem analyticum isagoge the words of dedication are a tribute to the learning and the genius of the pupil as well as the expression of gratitude of the teacher it reads as follows it is to you especially august daughter of melusine that i am indebted for my proficiency in mathematics to attain which i was encouraged by your love of this science as well as your great knowledge of it and by your mastery of all other sciences which one cannot too much admire in a person of your noble lineage more interesting and at the same time more pathetic were the relations of an italian nun sister maria celeste and the man whom byron so happily designates as the starry galileo with his woes sister celeste who was a franciscan nun in the convent of st matthew in arquetri was the great astronomer's eldest and favourite daughter they were greatly attached to each other and the gentle religious was not only her father's confidant and consoler in the hours of trial and affliction but was also his inspirer and ever vigilant guardian angel she watched over him not as a daughter over a father but as a mother watches over her only son all this is beautifully exhibited in her one hundred and twenty-four letters which were published in 1891 for the first time. A few of these letters, it is true, were published as early as 1852 by Alberi in his edition of the Complete Works of Galileo, and others were given to the press at subsequent dates, but the world had to wait more than two and a half centuries for a complete collection of all the known letters of this remarkable daughter of an illustrious sire. 
These documents are precious for the insight they give into the sterling character of a noble woman, but they are beyond price as sources of information respecting the tenderly affectionate relations which existed between her and one of the foremost men of science, not only of his own age, but of all time. They show how he made her his confidant in all his undertakings, and how she was his amanuensis, his counsellor, his inspirer, how her love was an incentive to the work that won for him undying fame how she was his support and comfort when suffering from the jealousy of rivals or the enmity of those who were opposed to his teachings those letters cover a period of nearly eleven years the most momentous years of her father's busy and troubled life now playful quaint elfish then serious vivid and confidential they show that the writer's intelligence was as rare as her nature was loyal and affectionate at times she half apologizes for the length of a letter but you must remember she adds in excuse that i must put into this paper everything that i should chatter to you in a week no daughter was ever prouder of her father or loved him with a more abounding love i pride myself she says that i love and revere my dearest father more by far than others love their fathers and i clearly perceive that in return he far surpasses the greater part of other fathers in the love which he has for me his loved daughter when he was ill she prepared dishes and confections that she knew would tempt his appetite but she was not satisfied with looking after the welfare of his body for she took occasion to send with the cakes and preserved fruits a sermonette for the benefit of his soul an extract from one of her letters gives an insight into the character of this devoted daughter who galileo says in a letter to his friend elia Dadati, was a woman of exquisite mind singular goodness and most tenderly attached to me of the preserved citron you ordered she writes him on the nineteenth of december sixteen twenty five i have only been able to do a small quantity i feared the citrons were too shrivelled for preserving and so they proved i send two baked pears for these days of vigil but in the greatest treat of all i send you a rose which ought to please you extremely seeing what a rarity it is at this season and with the rose you must accept its thorns which represent the bitter passion of our lord while the green leaves represent the hope we may entertain through the same sacred passion we having passed through the darkness of this short winter of our mortal life may attain to the brightness and felicity of an eternal spring in heaven which may our gracious god grant us through his mercy she always insists upon his keeping her fully informed about his studies and discoveries she is particular also about receiving without delay copies of his latest publications i beg you she writes in one of her letters to be so kind as to send me that book of yours which has just been published el sagiatore so that i may read it for have a great desire to see it on another occasion after his difficulties with the holy office when she fancies her father is not keeping her fully informed about the subject matter of his writings she implores him to tell her on what topic he is engaged if she archly adds it be something i can understand and you are not afraid that i will blab and on still another occasion sister celeste reminds her father of a promise of his to send her a small telescope from this we should infer that she desired to repeat the observations on the heavenly bodies that had created such a sensation in the learned world and which had given occasion for such acrimonious controversy in one of her earlier letters sister celeste called her father's attention to a promise of his to spend an afternoon with her and her sister archangela also a nun in the same convent and referring to one of the regulations of the franciscan cloister she playfully observes you will be able to sup in the parlour since the excommunication is for the tablecloth o sister celeste and not for the meats thereon what would one not give for a stenographic report of the conversations held that afternoon in that convent guard of our setry as father and daughters leisurely strolled through the peaceful enclosure all quite oblivious of the fleeting hours how interesting would be a faithful record of the confidences exchanged at the frugal meal in the evening in the humble parlour of st matteo we would willingly exchange many of the famous dialoghi de galileo de galilei for a verbatim report of what passed between sister celeste and the father whom she so idolized an english writer when discussing this subject pertinently observes for after all is it not the personal incidents and commonplaces of life that gather interest as the centuries roll on while its more pretentious events often drop into mere literary lumber how much more interesting dr johnson's incidental admission i have a strong inclination sir to do nothing to-day is to us now than many of his more formal utterances and in reality is it the personal element alone that is in the long run perennial the wise may prate as they will about the importance of maintaining the continuity of history and of handing on the torch of science the world cares for none of these things they interest only some few political economists and laborious men what does the crowd and poor little tom jones and his nestful for instance care about the fact that cheops was at any rate by a courteous tradition a mighty man of valour of such an era and land 
but little tom jones and the rest of us would become mightily interested in this misty monster of many traditions could we learn in some magical way all he thought hated and loved in his innermost heart of hearts judging from her letters she had many questions to ask him about his studies his experiments his discoveries his books as well as about more personal and domestic matters although there is no documentary proof of the fact yet there is every reason to believe that galileo had taken personal charge of the education of this his favourite daughter she shared his taste for science and inherited not a little of his genius such being the case we may well believe that a faithful account of their conversations of that day would not only be of surpassing interest but would also throw a flood of light on many questions now ill understood they would certainly tend to fill up the numerous lacunae caused by the disappearance of the letters of galileo which he wrote in answer to those of his ever cherished daughter the duke of peresque in a letter to gassendi regarding galileo refers to certain letters of the great philosopher this shows that sister celeste was kept fully informed of her father by respecting the nature and contents of his various works while he was preparing them for the press it implies likewise that she was not only interested in them in a general way but that she was able to read them intelligently and appreciate them as well they would also show more clearly than any facts now available what an unbounded influence the gentle nun had over the greatest intellect of his time and would more clearly than anything else in her correspondence exhibit sister celeste as the efficient co-worker and the abiding inspirer of the father of modern physics and astronomy but although we have no record of this sole communion between father and daughter on the occasion in question although we are deprived of the invaluable letters which he wrote in reply to hers we are nevertheless from the evidence at hand justified in regarding this unique pair as being ever one in heart aspiration and ideals and comparable in their mutual influence on each other with any of those famous men and women who through achievement on the one side and inspiration and collaboration on the other have ever been recognized as the greatest benefactors of their race one of galileo's countrymen clemente de nelli was right when he declared that had it not been for the assistance and consolation which he received from sister celeste galileo would have succumbed to the blows that were showered upon him during the most trying part of his career an indication of this is given in one of the letters written by sister celeste in the last year of her life when in a fit of despondency and imagining his friends had forgotten him galileo in a moment of bitterness wrote in a letter to his daughter my name is erased from the book of the living nay came at once sister celeste during reply say not that your name is struck de libro viventium for it is not so neither in the greater part of the world nor in your own country indeed it seems to me that if for a brief moment your name and fame were clouded they are now restored to greater brightness at which i am much astonished for i know that generally nemo propheta acceptus est in patria sua a prophet is not accepted in his own country i am afraid however if i begin quoting latin i shall fall into some barbarism but of a truth you are loved and esteemed here more than ever how much sister celeste was to her father in every way was not known until her premature death in her thirty-fourth year he was never the same man afterward disconsolate and broken he fancied he had heard the voice of the daughter he so fondly loved resounding through the house brooding over his great loss the heartbroken old man writes to a friend in words of infinite pathos i continually hear myself called by my dearly beloved daughter the eighth of january sixteen forty two who answered her call and went to join her in a better world two other noted investigators one of them a contemporary of galileo owed much to the inspiration and encouragement which they received from women these were descartes and leibniz and the women that had the most influence on them were representatives of royal families who were famous in their day for their love and knowledge and the extent of their intellectual attainments one of the most noted of these was elizabeth of bohemia princess palatine she was the favourite pupil of descartes and it was to her that he dedicated his great work principia philosophae she he declared understood him better than any one else he had ever met for in her alone were united those generally separated talents for metaphysics and for mathematics which are so characteristically operative in the cartesian system to this earnest student who was always absorbed in the mysteries of metaphysics and the problems of geometry descartes could refuse nothing when distance separated them he continued his instructions by correspondence one of the results of this correspondence was his treatise on passions de l'âme in which he developed certain ethical views suggested by the vita beata of seneca another distinguished pupil of descartes who exercised a marked influence over him was the celebrated daughter of gustavus adolphus queen christine of sweden a mistress of many languages and an ardent votary of science she was a munificent patron of scientific men a great number of whom she attracted to her court 
The most distinguished of these was Descartes, to whom she was deeply attached, and with whom she planned great things for science in Sweden, when his career was cut short by a premature death. Not the least influence on the intellectual life of Leibniz was Sophia Charlotte, Queen of Prussia, and the mother of Frederick the Great. She was the niece of Descartes' illustrious friend, Elizabeth of Bohemia, and as the pupil of Leibniz, quite as gloriously associated as had been her aunt with the father of Cartesianism. Leibniz was as distinguished by genius as his royal pupil was by birth. Besides being eminent as a philosopher and a statesman, he shared with Newton the honour of discovering the calculus. Huxley pronounced him a man of science in the modern sense of the first rank, while the King of Prussia declared him, he represents in himself a whole academy. Through the cooperation of Sophia Charlotte, he founded the Berlin Academy of Sciences. For her he wrote one of the most notable of his productions, his famed Theodicy. It would be difficult to estimate the influence of this learned queen on Leibniz, but it was undoubtedly greater than any other influence whatever. Her death was the greatest loss he ever suffered, and when she was no more, the beautiful Berlin suburb Charlottenburg, named after her, where he had been so happy in reading and philosophizing with his illustrious pupil, lost all attraction for him. A more striking illustration of woman's helpfulness is afforded in the case of Francois Huber, the celebrated Swiss naturalist. Although blind from his seventeenth year, he was able to carry on researches requiring the keenest eyesight and the closest observation. This he was able to do through the affectionate cooperation of his devoted wife, Mary Aimé. When her friends tried to dissuade her from marrying Huber, to whom she had been engaged for some time, saying that he had become blind, her reply was worthy of her generous and noble nature. He needs me now more than ever. During the forty years of their married life, her tenderness and devotion to her husband were as unfailing as they were inspiring. He worked through the eyes and hands of his wife as if they were his own. She was his reader, his observer, his secretary, his enthusiastic collaborator in all those investigations that have rendered him so famous. The blind man devised experiments to be made, and the quick-witted wife executed them and recorded the observations which supplied the material for his epoch-making work on bees, entitled New Observations on Bees. So accurate are his descriptions of the habits of the winged creatures, to the study of which he devoted the best years of his life, that one would think his great work was the production not of a man who had been blind for a quarter of a century when he wrote it, but of one who was gifted with exceptional keenness of vision and powers of observation. "'As long as she lived,' exclaimed the great naturalist after his trusty Aimé's death, "'I was not sensible of the misfortune of being blind.' nay more during her lifetime when though sightless he was always so happy in his work he went so far as to aver that he would be miserable were he to recover his eyesight i should not know he declared to what an extent a person in my condition should be beloved besides to me my wife is always young fresh and pretty which is no light matter he could truly say of her as wordworth said of his sister dorothy she gave me eyes she gave me ears and love and thought and joy End of chapter 11, part 1. Section 24 of Woman in Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Woman in Science by John Augustine Zahm. Chapter 11, part 2. We hear much of the achievements of Galvani and Faraday in the domain of electricity and electromagnetism, but little is said of the women to whom they were so greatly indebted for their success and fame. It was Galvani's wife who first directed his attention to the convulsions of a frog's leg when placed near an electrical machine. This induced him to make those celebrated investigations which led to the foundation of a new science which has ever since been identified with his name. It was Mrs. Marseille's work on science, especially her Conversations on Chemistry, that inspired Faraday with a love of science and blazed for him that road in chemical and physical experimentation which led to such marvellous results. He was always proud to call her his first teacher, and never hesitated to attribute to her that taste for scientific research for which he became so preeminent. And it was his devoted wife, who was not only a helpmate, but a soulmate as well for nearly half a century, that had very much to do with the splendid development of the germ which had been placed in his youthful mind by Mrs. Marseille. The same may likewise be asserted of the wives of two distinguished geologists, Charles Lyell and Xavier Homonaire de Hell. Mrs. Lyell was intimately associated with her husband in all of his scientific undertakings, and her ready intellect contributed immensely towards securing for him that enviable position which he attained of being the premier geologist of his century. 
Madame Homonet de Hell deserves special mention in the history of geology for the invaluable assistance which she gave her husband in the scientific exploration of the basin of the Caspian Sea. Not only did she share his labours and perils in this then wild part of the world, and collaborate with him in the preparation of the report for which the French government conferred on him the cross of the Legion of Honour, but she also wrote unaided the two descriptive volumes of their great work, Steps de la Mer Caspienne. Her part of this great undertaking received the special commendation of Monsieur Villemain, who was the Minister of Public Instruction, and had she not belonged to the disenfranchised sex, she too would have been decorated with the cross of the Legion of Honour all the world has heard of the daring explorations of baker and livingstone in the dark continent but how few are aware of the important part taken in their great enterprises by their devoted and heroic wives sir samuel baker immortalized himself by discovering lake albert nyanza one of the main sources of the nile but in attaining this goal which other explorers in vain had essayed to reach he was not alone the companion of his triumph as of his trials and hardships was lady baker a woman who though delicately reared was as brave in presence of danger as she was resourceful in trials and difficulties more than once her husband owed his life to her intrepidity and presence of mind when confronted by the treacherous savages of equatorial africa and if he achieved success where others failed it was in no slight measure due to her tact her energy and perseverance in what seemed at times a forlorn hope she had learned arabic with him in a year of necessary but wearisome delay her mind travelled with his mind as her feet had followed his footsteps and when after the preliminary toils without number after braving dangers from climate disease and ruthless savages they finally stood on the shore of that unknown sea which was then first beheld by english eyes she could in contemplating their achievements of which albert nyanza was the crowning glory exclaim with exultation and truth quorum pars magna fui when livingstone lost in the unexplored valley of the zambezi the faithful wife who had been his inspiring companion in his wanderings in darkest africa he lost completely that enthusiasm for deeds of high enterprise that had before been one of his leading characteristics writing to his distinguished friend sir roderick murchison he mournfully declares i must confess this heavy stroke quite takes the heart out of me everything that has happened only made me more determined to overcome all difficulties but after this sad stroke i feel crushed and void of strength i shall do my duty still but it is with a darkened horizon that i again set about it the noted english naturalist frank buckland in speaking of the aid afforded by his gifted mother to her distinguished husband dr buckland writes as follows during the long period that dr buckland was engaged in writing the book which i now have the honour of editing my mother sat up night after night for weeks and months consecutively writing to my father's dictation and this often until the sun's rays shining through the shutters at early morn warned the husband to cease from thinking and the wife to rest her weary head not only with the pen did she render material assistance but her natural talent in the use of her pencil enabled her to give accurate illustrations and finished drawings many of which are perpetuated in dr buckland's works she was also particularly clever and neat in mending broken fossils there are many specimens in the oxford museum now exhibiting their natural forms and beauty which were restored by her perseverance to shape from a mass of broken and almost comminuted fragments it was her occupation also to label the specimens which she did in a particularly neat way and there is hardly a fossil or a bone in the oxford museum which has not her handwriting upon it notwithstanding her devotion to her husband's pursuits she did not neglect the education of her children but occupied her mornings in superintending their instruction in sound and useful knowledge the sterling value of her labours they now in after life fully appreciate and feel most thankful that they were blessed with so good a mother what has been said of the influence and cooperation of the women already named may with equal truth be affirmed of numberless others of recent as well as of earlier date it is particularly true of the wife of the naturalist heller and of the great astronomer kepler it is true of the wife of the illustrious mathematician the marquis de l'hôpital she not only shared her husband's talent for mathematics but was of special assistance to him in preparing for the press his important analyse de infinimi petit it is true of the wife of asaph hall the illustrious discoverer of the satellites of mars often he was on the point of abandoning the quest of these diminutive moons which no one else had ever seen but which his calculations led him to believe really existed but he was encouraged by mrs hall to continue his observations with the result that his labours and vigils were at last rewarded by the startling discovery of deimos and phobos and there is madame pasteur who in her way was quite as important a factor in the scientific career of her immortal husband as were the women just mentioned in the lives of their husbands to whose triumph they so materially contributed 
one of the great frenchman's biographers has truly declared that it is impossible rightly to appreciate pasteur's life without some understanding of the immense assistance which he received in his home whether in discussing forms of crystals watching over experiments shielding her husband from all the daily fret of life or busy at the customary evening task of writing to his dictation madame pasteur was at once his most devoted assistant and incomparable companion his surroundings at home were entirely subordinated to his scientific life and his family shared with him both his trials and his triumphs at the time when pasteur was engrossed in the study of anthrax and after many difficulties and disappointments had at length succeeded in preparing a vaccine against it he at once hurried from the laboratory to communicate his great discovery first to his wife and daughter it was particularly during his long and arduous researches on the disease of silkworms that pasteur found his wife's aid of incalculable value for madame pasteur and her daughter then constituted themselves veritable silkworm rearers they collected mulberry leaves sorted larvae and were unremitting in their labours during the continuance of this memorable investigation and not only in the silk producing districts of southern france were they thus occupied but also in a special laboratory in ecole normale after their return to paris and when in the midst of these researches on the successful outcome of which hinged one of the greatest sources of national wealth the indefatigable savant was stricken with paralysis and his life was for a while despaired of it was again his devoted helpmate that afforded him solace in suffering and exercised a supervision over those experiments which the great man was still conducting almost in the presence of death that pasteur's life was prolonged for a quarter of a century after the terrible attack of hemiplegia in eighteen sixty eight that he was able to unravel the deep mysteries of microbian life that he was able to make discoveries whose economic value to france was in the estimation of professor huxley more than sufficient to liquidate the immense indemnity of five billion francs exacted from his country by germany at the termination of the franco-prussian war that he was able especially during these fruitful twenty-five years to render his scientific life like a luminous trail in the great night of the infinitely little in those ultimate abysses of being where life is born was in great measure due to the unceasing care the untiring vigilance and the sympathetic collaboration of one of the most devoted of wives and the most noble and whole-souled of women what has been said of the influence and helpfulness of madame pasteur can be asserted with even greater truth of elizabeth agassiz and of caroline herschel for these two women apart from the assistance they gave to a loved husband and an idolized brother in the labors that made them so famous both achieved distinction for their contributions to the sciences which they individually cultivated with such splendid results and had they elected to devote all their time to scientific research instead of giving the greater part of it to those to whom they were so devotedly attached who can tell how much more brilliant they would have been in their achievements and how much greater would have been the fame they would have won for themselves both of them were dowered in an eminent degree with taste and talent for science and had they chosen to make it the sole object of their life work there can be no doubt that their personal contributions to natural history and astronomy would have been far greater than they were as it was they were so overshadowed by those for whom they laboured with such unselfishness and loyalty that the real value of their work is too often forgotten when there is a question of the scientific triumphs of louise agassiz and sir william herschel but they willed it so they gladly effaced themselves that those whom they loved with such a deep and abiding love might shine the more brightly in the firmament of science they preferred to spend and be spent in strengthening the great workers and leaders with whose lives their own were so thoroughly identified inspiring them with courage keeping faith in their own ideas alive in the days of darkness when all the world seems adverse to desert both of these noble women had the same quality in common absolute devotion and unswerving faith in those to whose success and happiness they had dedicated their lives they sought nothing for themselves they thought nothing of themselves they both had to borrow the idea of another an intense power of sympathy a generous love of giving themselves in the service of others which enabled them to transfuse the force of their own personality into the objects to which they dedicated their powers in the preface of the joint work of mr and mrs agassiz entitled a journey in brazil that delightful volume which throws such a flood of light on the flora and fauna of the amazon valley occur the following significant words regarding the share each had in producing the book our separate contributions have become so closely interwoven that we should hardly know how to disconnect them so was it with all their undertakings there was the same common interest the same unity of purpose the same unselfish devotion to the cause of science during these long years of toil which were so prolific in results of supreme importance reading between the lines in a journey in brazil and in louis agassiz his life and correspondence written by mrs agassiz we can easily fancy that the great naturalist owed as much if not more to his wife's never-failing sympathy and inspiration as to her active cooperation in his work
and we are ready to apply to her the words of Longfellow when he sings, and whenever the way seemed long or his heart began to fail, she would sing a more wonderful song or tell a more wonderful tale. As to Carolyn Herschel as a helper and sustainer of her illustrious brother, too much cannot be said. In the days when he gave up a lucrative career that he might devote himself to astronomy, it was owing to her thrift and care that he was not harassed by the rankling vexations of money matters. She had been his helper and assistant when he was a leading musician. She became his helper and assistant when he gave himself up to astronomy. By sheer force of will and devoted affection she learned enough of mathematics and of methods of calculation, which to these unlearned seem mysteries, to be able to commit to writing his researches. She became his assistant in the workshop, she helped him to grind and polish his mirrors, she stood beside his telescope in the nights of midwinter to write down his observations when the very ink was frozen in the bottle. She kept him alive by her care, thinking nothing of herself she lived for him. She loved him and believed in him, and helped him with all her heart and with all her strength. She might have become a distinguished woman on her own account, for with the seven-foot Newtonian sweeper given her by her brother she discovered eight comets first and last but the pleasure of seeking and finding for herself was scarcely tested she minded the heavens for her brother she worked for him not for herself and the unconscious self-denial with which she gave up her own pleasure in the use of her sweeper is not the least beautiful picture in her life while recounting the achievements of women who directly or indirectly contributed to our knowledge of the earth and what it contains we cannot forget what the world owes to the gracious and glorious isabella of castile for it is to her probably as much as to columbus that a new continent was discovered at the close of the fifteenth century for while the doctors of salamanca most of whom were what galileo called paper philosophers men who fancied that a correct knowledge of the physical universe was to be obtained by a collation of ancient texts were denouncing the great navigator as an idle dreamer and quoting the ill-founded notions of pliny and aristotle to prove the impossibility of his carrying out his project isabella was quietly revolving in her own mind the reasons which columbus had adduced in favour of his great enterprise having satisfied herself that his views were sufficiently probable to justify action she was prepared to make any sacrifices to have his plans executed the result of her decision is but another illustration of the value of women's quick intuition as against the slow reasoning processes of philosophers and men of science again while considering what women have accomplished for the advancement of science by inspiration and collaboration we must not lose sight of what they have done by suggestion for as john stuart mill well observes it no doubt often happens that a person who has not widely and accurately studied the thoughts of others on a subject has by natural sagacity a happy intuition which he can suggest but cannot prove which yet when matured may be an important addition to knowledge but even then no justice can be done to it until some other person who does possess the previous acquirements takes it in hand tests it gives it a scientific or practical form and fits it into its place among the existing truths of philosophy or science is it supposed that such felicitous thoughts do not occur to women they occur by hundreds to every woman of intellect but they are mostly lost for want of a husband or friend who has the other knowledge which can enable him to estimate them properly and bring them before the world and even when they are brought before it they usually appear as his ideas not their real authors who can tell how many of the original thoughts put forth by male writers belong to a woman by suggestion to themselves only by verifying and working out if i may judge by my own case a very large proportion indeed footnote the idea herein expressed is beautifully accentuated in the touching dedication to the author's work on liberty which reads as follows to the beloved and deplored memory of her who was the inspirer and in part the author of all that is best in my writings the friend and wife whose exalted sense of truth and right was my strongest incitement and whose approbation was my chief reward i dedicate this volume like all that i have written for many years it belongs as much to her as to me but the work as it stands has had in a very insufficient degree the inestimable advantage of her revision and some of the most important portions having been reserved for a more careful re-examination which they are now never destined to receive were i but capable of interpreting into the world one half of the great thoughts and noble feelings which are buried in her grave i should be the medium of a greater benefit to it than it is ever likely to arise from anything that i can write unprompted and unassisted by her all but unrivalled wisdom the chivalrous sentiments expressed in this generous tribute by one of the deepest thinkers of his time to the memory of his noble and gifted life companion extravagant as they may seem are but echoes of a similar sentiment often voiced before by the world's greatest leaders of thought and science 
nor should we forget those active and energetic women, and their number is much greater than is ordinarily supposed, whose husbands, although often endowed with genius of the highest order, were indolent by temperament and disorderly and unmethodical by nature. Such men would, in the majority of cases, had run to seed had not their genius been given special force and impulse by their vigorous and methodical helpmates. Sir William Hamilton, the most learned philosopher of the Scottish school, is a striking instance in point for it was due almost entirely to the stimulation he received from his ever-active wife that he was always kept keyed up to the fullest working capacity as a philosopher and became recognised the world over as one of the commanding intellects of his age lady hamilton writes professor veitch in his memoir of sir william hamilton had a power of keeping her husband up to what he had to do she contended wisely against a sort of energetic indolence which characterised him and which while he was always labouring made him apt to put aside the task actually before him sometimes diverted by subjects of inquiry suggested in the course of study on the matter at hand sometimes discouraged by the difficulty of reducing to order the immense mass of materials he had accumulated in connection with it then her resolution and cheerful disposition sustained and refreshed him and never more so than when during the last twelve years of his life his bodily strength was broken and his spirit though languid yet ceased not from mental toil the truth is that sir william's marriage his comparatively limited circumstances and the character of his wife supplied to a nature that would have been contented to spend its mighty energies in work that brought no reward but in the doing of it and that might never have been made publicly known or available the practical force and impulse which enabled him to accomplish what he actually did in literature and philosophy it was this influence without doubt which saved him from utter absorption in his world of rare noble and elevated but ever increasingly unattainable ideas but for it the serene sea of abstract thought might have held him become for life and in the absence of all utterance of definite knowledge of his conclusions the world might have been left to an ignorant and mysterious wonder about the unprofitable scholar it is frequently said that women unlike men are indifferent to fame this may be true so far as they are personally concerned but it is certainly not true of them in regard to their husbands or the men for whom they have a genuine affection this is abundantly proved by the lives of madame huber madame pasteur caroline herschel and lady hamilton not to mention others who have been named in the foregoing pages after sir william hamilton at the age of fifty-six had been stricken by hemiplegia on the right side as a result of overwork his faithful wife became for twelve years hands eyes and even mind for him she read and consulted books for him and helped him to prepare his lectures and the works which have given him such celebrity everything that was sent to the press and all the courses of lectures were written by her either to dictation or from copy and when we remember that the lectures and books were of the most abstruse character and that lady hamilton was associated with her husband in his recondite work throughout his long and brilliant career we must confess that her conduct was not only heroic to a degree but also that the fame of the one she loved was to her a matter of deepest concern what has been so far said, important as it is, does not tell the whole story of woman's influence on men of science, and consequently on the progress of science. We should not have an adequate conception of women as inspirers and collaborators if we did not advert to certain faculties which they usually possess in a more eminent degree than the most of men. It is a well-known fact that in many of the affairs of life women are more practical, have more tact, and possess keener and quicker perceptions than men. They are, too, more ideal, more romantic, and more enthusiastic men of science in their investigations usually proceed by the slow and laborious process of collecting facts and collating phenomena either by observation or experiment or both and from the observed facts and phenomena they formulate a law which explains and correlates them this is known as induction a method which proceeds from facts to ideas women on the contrary are rather disposed to proceed from ideas to facts to explain phenomena from ideas which already exist in the mind without having recourse to the slow process of induction this is the deductive method and is the very reverse of that employed by the average man of science it would however be a mistake to maintain that the inductive method is always employed for such is not the case more than half a century ago the historian buckle in a notable lecture delivered in the royal institution of great britain directed attention to the fact that some of the greatest scientific discoveries had been made by the deductive method one of these was newton's epoch-making discovery of universal gravitation while sitting in a garden he saw an apple fall and this simple fact caused him to advance from idea to idea and to be carried by what tyndall loved to call the scientific use of the imagination into the distant realms of space and heedless of the operations of nature neither observing nor experimenting the great philosopher by pure a priori reasoning completed the most sublime and majestic speculation that had ever entered into the heart of man to conceive 
It was, as Buckle well observes, the triumph of an idea. It was the audacity of genius. It was also the triumph of the deductive method in the solution of a problem that no one not a genius could have worked out, only by the long and toilsome process of induction. Similarly, the great law of metamorphosis in plants, according to which the stamens, pistils, corollas, bracts, petals, and so forth, of every plant are simply modified leaves, was discovered not by an inductive investigator, but by a poet. Guided by his brilliant imagination, his passion for beauty, and his exquisite conception of form which supplied him with ideas, Germany's greatest poet, Goethe, by reasoning deductively, was able to generalize a law which lesser minds could never have arrived at except through the application of the inductive method. So also was it in the science of crystallography. Its foundations were laid not by a mineralogist nor a mathematician, as one would suppose, but by one of strong imagination and marked poetic temperament. Like Goethe, Huey was led by his ideas of beauty and symmetry to work deductively on the problem before him. Descending from ideas to facts, he finally succeeded, after a long series of subsequent labours, in reading the riddle which had baffled his able but unimaginative predecessors. It is the possession of this deductive faculty, so characteristic of men of genius, their ability to reach conclusions directly, as great mathematicians perceive inferences which those less gifted reach only after pages of elaborate calculations, which enable women not indeed to make scientific discoveries, but to exercise the most momentous and salutary influence over the method by which scientific discoveries are made. For, as Buckle points out, men of science are too inclined to employ the inductive method to the exclusion of the deductive. Footnote. Induction is indeed a mighty weapon laid up in the armoury of the human mind, and by its aid great deeds have been accomplished and noble conquests have been won. But in that armoury there is another weapon, I will not say of stronger make, but certainly of keener edge. And if that weapon had been oftener used during the present and preceding century, our knowledge would be far more advanced than it actually is. If the imagination had been more cultivated, if there had been a closer union between the spirit of poetry and the spirit of science, natural philosophy would have made greater progress, because natural philosophers would have taken a higher and more successful aim, and would have enlisted on their side a wider range of human sympathies. They have become slaves to the tyranny of facts, and as such are incompetent to further the progress of science as they would by using both methods instead of one and their slavery would be still more complete and ignominious were it not for the great though unconscious service to science rendered by women who have kept alive the deductive habit of thought their turn of thought their habits of mind their conversation their influence insensibly extending over the whole surface of society and frequently penetrating its intimate structure have more than all other things put together tended to raise us up into an ideal world lift us from the dust in which we are too prone to grovel and develop in us those germs of imagination which even the most sluggish and apathetic understandings in some degree possess from the foregoing observations it is manifest that the best results to science are secured when men and women work together men supplying the slow logical reasoning power women the vivid far-reaching imagination men generalizing from facts women from ideas men working chiefly by induction women principally by deduction for thus collaborating, each with his or her predominant faculties, the two combined possess in a measure the elements which go to make up a man or woman of genius, and which enable them to achieve far more for the advancement of science than would otherwise be possible. No one has ever given a more eloquent expression to this truth than John Stuart Mill, who was as keen as an observer as he was profound as a thinker. Writing on the subject under discussion, he does not hesitate to say, hardly anything can be of greater value to a man of theory and speculation who employs himself not in collecting materials of knowledge by observation but in working them up by processes of thought into comprehensive truths of science and laws of conduct than to carry on his speculations in the companionship and under the criticism of a really superior woman there is nothing comparable to it for keeping his thoughts within the limits of real things and the actual facts of nature a woman seldom runs wild after an abstraction women's thoughts are thus as useful in giving reality to those of thinking men as men's thoughts in giving width and largeness to those of women in depth as distinguished from breadth i greatly doubt if even now women compared with men are at any disadvantage we have already learned from his own avowal how much mill was beholden to his wife for her active cooperation in the production of those works of his which have exerted so profound an influence on many phases of modern thought a more striking illustration of the value of woman's assistance but in the domain of biology is found in the biography of the late professor huxley by those who know this distinguished man of science so remarkable for his intellectual vigour only from his writings the impression would be gleaned that he was one of the most independent thinkers 
that his utterances on all subjects were absolutely personal and entirely unmodified by suggestion or criticism from any quarter how far this view is from being correct is found in the statement by his son that his father invariably submitted his writings to the criticism of his wife before they were seen by any other eye to her judgment was due the toning down of many a passage which erred by excess of vigour and the clearing up of phrases which would be obscure to the public in fact if any essay met with her approval he felt sure it would not fail of its effect when published she was not only his help and stay for forty years in his struggles ready to counsel in adversity to comfort but over and above this she was the critic whose judgment he valued above almost any and whose praise he cared most to win the other self who made his life work possible an intelligent sympathetic pair of this kind and this as we have seen is but one of a multitude which illuminates and beautifies the history of science are competent to achieve wonders they are like the two-celled heart beating with one full stroke two plummets dropped for one to sound the abyss of science and the secrets of the mind the woman is then truly as de laminace in scriptural phrases has it man's companion man's assistant bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and in her sublime and enduring character so complete in every relation of life she fully answers to the beautiful characterization which adam in paradise lost gives of his beloved eve so absolute she seems and in herself complete so well to know her own that what she wills to do or say seems wisest virtuousest discreetest best authority and reason on her weight and to consummate all greatness of mind and nobleness their seat build in her loveliest and create an awe about her as a guard angelic placed end of chapter eleven part two section twenty five of woman in science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Woman in Science by John Augustine Zahm Chapter 12, Part 1 The Future of Women in Science, Summary and Epilogue St. Evremond, the first great master of the genteel style in French literature, who was equally noted as a brilliant courtier, a graceful wit, a professed epicurean, and who exerted so marked an influence on the writings of Voltaire and the essayists of Queen Anne's time, gives us in one of his desultory productions an entertaining disquisition on la femme qui ne se trouve point et ne se trouvera jamais, the woman who is not and never will be found. The caption of this singular essay admirably expresses the idea that the majority of mankind has, even until the present day, held respecting woman in science for them she was non-existent nature in their view had disqualified her for serious and above all for abstract science never therefore in the opinion of these solemn wiseacres had been found or could be found a woman who had achieved distinction in science the foregoing chapters show how ill-founded is such a view regarding woman in times past for that half of humanity which has produced such scientific luminaries as Aspasia, Laura Brasi, Maria Gaetana Agnesi, Sophie Germain, Mary Somerville, Caroline Herschel, Sonia Kovaleski, Agnes S. Lewis, Margaret Dunlop Gibson, Eleanor Ormerod, and Madame Curie, to mention no others, is far from exhibiting any evidence of intellectual disqualification, and still farther from warranting any one from declaring that the successful pursuit of science is entirely beyond the mental powers of womankind. The preceding pages likewise afford an answer to those who insist on woman's incapacity for scientific pursuits, and point to the small number of those that have attained eminence in any of the branches of science who continue to assert that the women named are but exceptions to the rule of the hopeless inferiority of their sex and that no conclusions can be deduced from the paucity of women who have risen above the intellectual level of their less fortunate or less highly dowered sisters they further show that until the last few decades woman's environment was rarely if ever favourable to her pursuit of science from the days of Aspasia until the latter half of the nineteenth century, she was discriminated against by law, custom, and public opinion. 
save only in Italy, she was excluded from the universities and from learned societies in which she might have had an opportunity of developing her intellect. In other countries, her social ostracism in all that pertained to mental development was so complete and universal that she rarely had an opportunity of making a trial of her powers or exhibiting her innate capacity. The consequence was that her mind remained in a condition of comparative atrophy, a condition that gave rise to that long prevalent belief in woman's intellectual inferiority to man and her natural incapacity for everything that is not light or frivolous. Practically all that women have achieved in science, until very recent years, has been accomplished in defiance of that conventional code which compelled them to confine their activities to the ordinary duties of the household. The lives and achievements of the eminent mathematicians, Sophie Germain and Mary Somerville, are good illustrations of the truth of this assertion. It was only their persistence in the study of their favorite branch of science, in spite of the opposition of their family and friends, and in spite of what was considered taboo for their sex by the usages and ordinances of society, that they were able to attain that eminence in the most abstruse of the sciences, which won for them the plaudits of the world. Both were virtually self-made women, deprived of the advantages of a college or university education, and denied the stimulus afforded by membership in learned scientific associations, they nevertheless succeeded by their own unaided efforts in winning a place of highest honor in the Wahala of men of science. Monsieur Alphonse de Candolle, in his great work, History des Sciences et des Savants depuis du siècles, devotes only two pages to the consideration of woman in science. She is to him a negligible quantity, and, although a professed man of science, he repeats, without any scientific warrant whatever, all the gratuitous statements of his predecessors regarding the superficial character of the female mind. A mind, he will have it, which, quote, takes pleasure in ideas that are readily seized by a kind of intuition, end quote, a mind, quote, to which the slow methods of observation and calculation by which truth is surely arrived at are not pleasing. Truths themselves, the Swiss savant continues, quote, independent of their nature and possible consequences, especially general truths which have no relation to a particular person, are of small moment to most women. Add to this a feeble independence of opinion, a reasoning faculty less intense than in man, and finally the horror of doubt, that is, a state of mind in which all research in the sciences of observation must begin and often end. These reasons are, according to de Candolle, more than sufficient to explain the position of women in scientific pursuits. End quote. They certainly are more than sufficient to explain their position if we choose to accept the author's method of determining one's attainments in the realm of science. His chief test of one's eminence in science is the number of learned societies to which one belongs. For de Candolle, membership in one or more such bodies is prima facie evidence of special distinction in some branch of science. But we, he declares, quote, do not see the name of any women on the lists of learned men connected with the principal academies. This is not due entirely to the fact that the customs and regulations have made no provision for their admission, for it is easy to assure oneself that no person of the feminine sex has ever produced an original scientific work which has made its mark in any science, and commended the attention of specialists in science. I do not think it has ever been considered desirable to elect a woman a member of any of the great scientific academies with restricted membership. End quote. When de Candolle insisted on membership in learned societies as a necessary indication of scientific eminence, he must have known what everybody knew that such exclusive societies as the French Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society of Great Britain have always been dead set against the admission of women members. It is difficult to imagine that the learned author of the history of science and scientists was entirely ignorant of the exclusion from the French Academy of Maria Gaetana Agnesi solely because she was a woman, 
and he must have been aware that, had it not been for her sex, Sophie Germain would have been accorded a fatuile in the same society, for her remarkable investigations in one of the difficult departments of mathematical physics. He must likewise have been cognizant of the attitude of such organizations as the Royal Society toward women, no matter how meritorious their achievements in science. According to de Candolle's criterion, such women as Madame Curie, Sonia Kovalevsky, Eleanor Omerod, Agnes S. Lewis, Margaret Dunlop Gibson, have accomplished nothing worthy of note because, forsooth, their names are not found on the rolls of membership of the Royal Society or the French Academy of Sciences, associations whose constitutions have been purposely so framed as to exclude women from membership. It would indeed be difficult to instance a more unfair or a more unscientific test of women's eminence in science, and that, too, proposed by one who is supposed to be actuated in his judgments by rigorously scientific methods. Had any of the women named belonged to the male sex, there never would have been any question of their fitness to become members of the societies in question. This is particularly true of Madame Curie, who, in the estimation of the world, has done more to enhance the prestige of French science than any man of the present generation a statement that is sufficiently justified by the fact that she is the only one so far who has twice, in competition with the greatest of the world's men of science, succeeded in carrying away the great Nobel Prize. Footnote. A writer in the English magazine Nature, under date of January 12, 1911, when the European press was discussing Madame Curie's claims to membership in the French Academy of Sciences, makes the following sane observations on the admission of women to the various academies of the French Institute. Quote, there may be room for difference of opinion as to the wisdom or expediency of permitting women to embark on the troubled sea of politics, or of allowing them a determinate voice in the settlement of questions which may affect the existence or the destiny of a nation but surely there ought to be no question that in the peaceful walks of art literature and science there should be the freest possible scope extended to them and that as human beings every avenue to distinction and success should unreservedly be open to them all academies tend to be conservative and to move slowly they are the homes of privilege and of vested interest some of them incline to be reactionary they were created by men for men, and for the most part at a time when women played little or no part in those occupations which such societies were intended to foster and develop. But the times have changed. Women have gradually won for themselves their rightful position as human beings. We have now to recognize that academies, as seats of learning, were made for humanity, and that, as members of the human race, women have the right to look upon their heritage and property no less than men. This consummation may not at once be reached, but, as it is based upon reason and justice, it is certain to be attained eventually. End quote. A fortnight later, the same magazine contained a second article, in which the matter is treated in an equally manly fashion. Quote, as scientific work, the writer pertinently observes, must ultimately be judged by its merits and not by the nationality or sex of its author, we believe that the opposition to the election of women into scientific societies will soon be seen to be unjust and detrimental to the progress of natural knowledge. By no pedantic reasoning can the rejection of a candidate for membership of a scientific society be justified if the work done places the candidate in the leading position among other competitors. Science knows no nationality, and should recognize no distinction of sex, color, or creed among those who are contributing to its advancement. Believing that this is the conclusion to which consideration of the question must inevitably lead, we have confidence that the doors of all scientific societies will eventually be open to women on equal terms with men. End quote. End footnote. Not only have men, from time immemorial, been wont to point to woman's incapacity for science, as evidenced by the small number of those who have achieved distinction in any way of its branches, 
but they have also taken a special pleasure in directing attention to the fact that no woman has ever given to the world any of the great creations of genius, or been the prime mover in any of the far-reaching discoveries which have so greatly contributed to the weal, the advancement, and the happiness of our race. No one probably has expressed himself on this subject in a more positive or characteristic fashion than the noted literateur and philosopher, Count Joseph de Maistre. Writing from St. Petersburg to his daughter Constance, he says, quote, Voltaire, according to what you affirm, for as to me I know nothing, as I have not read all his works, and have not read a line of them during the last thirty years, says that women are capable of doing all that men do, etc. This is merely a compliment paid to some pretty woman, or rather it is one of the hundred thousand and thousand silly things which he said during his lifetime. The very contrary is the truth. Women have produced no chef d'oeuvre of any kind whatsoever. They have been the authors neither of the Iliad, nor the Aeneid, nor the Jerusalem Delivered, nor Phaedre, nor Atalier, nor Rodagoon, nor the Misanthrope, nor Tartuffe, nor the Joer, nor the Pantheon, nor the Church of St. Peter's, nor the Venus de Medici, nor the Apollo Belvedere, nor the Principia, nor the Discourse on Universal History, nor Telemachus. They have invented neither algebra, nor the telescope, nor achromatic glasses, nor the fire engine, nor hose machines, etc. End quote. Footnote. It was this same brusque and original writer who asserted that, quote, science was a most dangerous thing for women, that no woman should study science under penalty of becoming ridiculous and unhappy, that a coquette can more readily get married than a savant, end quote. And he it was who declared that women who attempted to emulate men in the pursuit of science are monkeys and donne barbute, bearded women, and who designated Madame de Stael as la science en jupon, una impertinente femelette. Science in petticoats, a silly impertinent female. He, however, met an opponent worthy of his steel in the person of the eloquent bishop of Orleans, Monsignor Dupenloup. In a lengthy and brilliant critique of de Maistre's views, he shows them to be untenable if not ridiculous. Quote, I by no means, he writes, agree with Monsieur de Maistre that, la science in jupon as he calls it or talents of any kind whatsoever militates in the slightest against a woman being a good wife or a good mother quite the contrary end quote. and considering women as the companion and aid of man socia et adjutorium he expresses a view which is quite the opposite of that championed by his distinguished adversary for in words precise and pregnant he asserts that the education of women cannot be too consistent, too serious, and too solid. End footnote. All this is true, but what does it prove? It does not prove, as is so frequently assumed, woman's lesser brain power or inferior intelligence. It does not prove, as the learned Frenchman and those who are similarly minded would have us believe, her incapacity for the highest flights of genius in every sphere of intellectual effort. Such assumptions are entirely negatived by woman's past achievements in all departments of art, literature, and science. Far from making the inference that de Maistre wished his daughter to draw from his letter, we should, from what we know of woman's ability, as disclosed in the foregoing chapters, hesitate to set a limit to her powers, or to declare apodictically that she could not have been the author of works of as great merit as most of those, if not all of them, mentioned as among men's supreme achievements. The simple fact that Madame Curie and Sonia Kovaleski were able, in sciences usually considered beyond female intelligence, to wrest from their male competitors the most coveted prizes within the gift of the Nobel Prize Commission and the French Academy of Sciences, demonstrates completely that woman's assumed capacity for even the most recondite scientific pursuits is a mere figment of the masculine imagination. Quote, what women have done, that at least, if nothing else, end quote, as John Stuart Mill aptly observes, quote, it is proved they can do. When we consider how sedulously they are all trained away from, instead of being trained toward, any of the occupations or objects reserved for men, 
it is evident that I am taking very humble ground for them, when I rest their case on what they have actually achieved. For, in this case, negative evidence is worth while, while any positive evidence is conclusive. It cannot be inferred to be impossible that a woman should be a Homer, or an Aristotle, or a Michelangelo, or a Beethoven, because no woman has yet actually produced works comparable to theirs in any of those lines of excellence. This negative fact at most leaves the question uncertain, and open to psychological discussion. But it is quite certain that a woman can be a Queen Elizabeth, or a Deborah, or a Joan of Arc, since this is not inference but a fact. End quote. In like manner, it is quite certain that, in spite of all kinds of disabilities and prejudices and adverse legislation, there have been a large number of women who, in every department of intellectual activity, have achieved marked distinction and won imperishable renown for their prescribed sex. It is a fact which admits of no question that, notwithstanding their being debarred from all the educational advantages so generously lavished upon the dominant sex, women have, since the days of Sappho and Hypatia, shown themselves the equals and often the superiors of men in the highest and noblest spheres of mental achievement. Such being the case, what, we may ask, would have been the result had women, from that splendid heroic period of which Homer sings, until the present, enjoyed all the opportunities of mental development of which men have systematically claimed the exclusive privilege. Footnote. The late Mr. Gladstone asserts that, quote, it would be hard to discover any period of history or country of the world, not being Christian, in which they, women, stood so high as with the Greeks of the heroic age, end quote, when the position of the Greek woman was so remarkable, and quote, so elevated, both absolutely and in comparison with what it became in the historic ages of Greece and Rome amidst their elaborate civilization. End quote. End footnote. What would now be their condition if, from the days of the Muses, who were but learned women apotheosized, women had never been deprived of their intellectual birthright and had been permitted to continue in the path so auspiciously blazed by Corinna, the victor over Pindar? and Aridi, the splendor of Greece, and the possessor of the mind of Socrates, and the tongue of Homer. What would not now be their intellectual efflorescence, if Plato's dream of twenty-three centuries ago of giving women equal rights with men in all things of the mind, could have been realized? If those ardent female disciples of his, who so lovingly followed him through the streets of Athens, the home of the intellectual and the beautiful, and hung on his lips during his matchless discourses in the groves of the academy and on the banks of the Ilyssus, could have continued that race of intellect and genius which was the admiration and the inspiration of all Hellas during the most brilliant period of its marvellous history. Speculating only on what the gifted daughters of Greece might have achieved, we may easily believe that they would have kept pace with their most highly gifted countrymen, and that, following in the footsteps of Sappho and the other muses of the terrestrial nine, they would have been worthy rivals of Homer, Pindar, and Aeschylus, and would have occupied a prominent place in that brilliant galaxy of genius composed of such luminaries as Anaxagoras, Sophocles, Euclid, Archimedes, Theophastus, Polygnatus, Diophantus, Pausanias, and Thucydides. To those who base their opinions on what so long has been the absurdly anomalous condition of women, and who, in formulating their theories of human progress, completely ignore the fundamental laws of heredity, such conjectures will seem extravagant, if not chimerical. But, when one bears in mind the universal fact that offspring, whatever the sex, inherits its characteristics and its powers from both parents alike, that the soul, unlike the body, has no sex, and that so far as legitimate indications from the teachings of biology and psychology can serve as a guide, there is no valid reason for asserting the mental superiority of man over woman, one will be obliged to confess that these surmises are far from being either fanciful or preposterous. It is then the veriest sophism to predicate women's incapacity for science and for intellectual achievements of the highest order, 
on what she has not accomplished in the past, or on the comparatively limited number of her contributions to the advancement of knowledge. For up till the present she has, for the most part, been but a dwarf of the gynaceum, cramped under worse than South Sea Isle taboo. Had men been compelled to labor under similar conditions, it is doubtful if they would have accomplished any more than women have now to their credit. Considering women's past achievements in science, as well as in other departments of knowledge, considering her present opportunities for developing her long-hampered faculties, and considering especially the many new social and economic adjustments which have been made within the last half-century, in consequence of the greatly changed conditions of modern life, it requires no prophetic vision to forecast what share the gentler sex will have in the future advancement of science. That it will be far greater than it has been hitherto, there can be no reasonable doubt. That the number of savants of the type of Maria Gatana Agnesi, Sonia Kovaleski, and Madame Curie will be greatly enlarged, there is every reason to believe that among these coming votaries of science there will be more than one woman who, even in the most abstruse sciences, will stand, quote, upon an even pedestal with man, end quote, seems to be assured by the achievements of many who are now so materially adding to the sum of human knowledge. Is it probable that the future will bring forth women whose achievements in science will rank with those of Euler, Faraday, Liebig, Leverrier, Champollion, and Geoffrey St. Hilaire? It would be a rash man who would answer in the negative. We cannot, as Dimestre seems to do, reason from what they have not done, when everything was against them, to what they may do when conditions shall, in every way, be as favorable to them as they always have been to the dominant sex. Still rasher would be the man who would attempt to prove the negative of this question, mere a priori arguments based on preconceived bias or on the vague and groundless impression that woman is essentially and hopelessly the intellectual inferior of man, have no more value than gratuitous opinions. The unprejudiced seeker after truth will insist on a demonstration based on incontrovertible facts. He will appeal to history to learn what the sex has already accomplished, and to science to inquire if there be anything in the female brain to differentiate it from that of the male, or to preclude woman from attaining the highest rank in the activities of the intellect. The result of such an investigation will, I think, cause even the most biased person to suspend judgment, if it does not induce him to align himself with those who, finding no differences in the mental endowments of the sexes, have reached the conclusion that the day will come, and may hap in the near future, when the achievements of woman will be on a par with those of man. The facts stated in the preceding chapters seem, not unreasonably, to point to such a conclusion, if indeed they do not warrant it as a necessary inference. A few considerations germane to this discussion will illustrate the danger of forming hasty judgments regarding questions like the one under discussion. During the last hundred years no country in the world has done more for the education of the masses than the United States. Everything that money could purchase and ingenuity suggest has been adopted to develop the minds and stimulate the latent talents and genius of our youth. From the primary schools to the highest and best equipped universities, a special premium has been put on success in study, and the highest rewards have awaited those who should make any notable contribution towards the advancement of knowledge. But, notwithstanding all the educational advantages our people have enjoyed, and all the encouragement they have received to achieve something of supreme excellence, our great country, with its teeming millions, attracted from the most gifted nations of the old world, has not yet produced a single man who has attained the highest rank in either literature or art or science. Far from having a preeminent master of song like Homer or Dante, we have not even a poet approaching Goethe, or Tasso, or Camoen. We have no Cervantes, no Milton, no Racine, no Moliere. America has produced no Raphael or Michelangelo, no Mozart or Wagner or Tchaikovsky. Nor has it given us a Descartes, a Leibniz, a Newton, or a Darwin. 
Would any one, from this complete absence in America of representatives of the highest order in literature, art, and science, ever dream of concluding that we shall never have such favorite sons of genius and such sons of intellect? Does our comparative intellectual sterility in the past, and in a country which seemed especially adapted to foster genius and attainments of the highest order, justify any one in inferring that the days of great geniuses, like the days of demigods, are gone never to return? And yet the number of men in our broad commonwealth who, during the past hundred years, have enjoyed such signal opportunities for attaining distinction in every domain of intellectual effort is incomparably greater than that of all the women so favored since the earliest days of human history. If, from the first flowering of Greek culture to the present day, as many millions of women had enjoyed all the transcendent advantages of education as have been in the United States so lavishly accorded to the same number of millions of men, who will say that very many of them would not have attained a much higher rank in science, as well as in art and literature, than has yet been reached by any man that America has yet produced? Who even, on the evidence now available, would be warranted in denying that at least some of these millions of women might have attained the very highest rank in every department of intellectual achievement? Gray, in his Elegy Written on a Country Churchyard, muses on the potential statesmen and the, quote, mute, inglorious Miltons, end quote, of those countless multitudes who, for lack of opportunity to develop their inborn gifts, were condemned to pass their lives in obscurity and die, quote, to fortune and to fame unknown, end quote. But how much more truthfully could his words have been applied to that much larger number of women of rare mental powers, to whose eyes knowledge, quote, her ample page, rich with the spoils of time, did ne'er unroll, end quote, and whose God-given genius was ruthlessly suppressed from the cradle to the grave. We are still in ignorance as to many of the conditions which are essential to the development of genius, and which contribute to its loftiest flights. We have yet to learn how far the efflorescence of the human mind is aided and modified by heredity, environment, atmosphere, as well as by education, encouragement, and other stimuli equally potent. But we do know that Germany, in spite of its famed universities and its feverish intellectual activity in many departments of knowledge, had to wait many long dreary centuries before it could point to a Gotha, a Schiller, a Humboldt, a Bach, or a Beethoven. We know that France, so long the reputed centre of culture, has so far produced no great epic poet, no Cervantes, no Murillo. But shall we affirm that she will never give to the world imperishable works like Paradise Lost, Don Quixote, or The Immaculate Conception? We know that Athens, which during the most brilliant period of its history counted only 5,400 free-born citizens, less than the population of a small modern town, was able to produce within a very brief epoch more men of supreme distinction than all the rest of Europe from the age of Pericles until the dawn of the Renaissance. Hers is still the art of the world, the literature of the world, the philosophy of the world, the culture of the world. For twenty-five centuries her canons of taste and beauty have guided poets, orators, artists, and her matchless productions have been the inspiration, as they have been the despair, of the greatest geniuses of our modern world. Had the women of Greece not been put under constraint just as they were beginning to exhibit the splendid results of their intellectual activities, had they been encouraged to develop to the utmost their richly dowered minds, as were the men, a far larger number of them, no doubt, would have been as successful in carrying off coveted prizes in the intellectual arena as was Corinna in her contests with Pindar. And they would, likewise, as we may easily conceive, have greatly added to the number of masterpieces of Greek intellect in science as well as in art and letters. But the opportunity for women to test their powers, which was so wantonly snatched from their sisters in the Hellenic world, seems again to be offered to their sex. This opportunity, as has been stated, is due chiefly to their persistence in claiming the same right as men to intellectual development, as well as to the countless proofs they have given that their demands are founded on reason and justice. 
what shall be the outcome of the new opportunity for woman to prove her capacity as compared with man's in things of the intellect remains to be seen but from indications she has during recent years given of her powers in every branch of scientific inquiry there can be little doubt that it will be of such character as to place woman on a higher intellectual plane than she has yet occupied in physical strength and in the rougher conflicts with the world she will doubtless always remain the lesser man but once she feels in full possession of liberty quote, to burgeon out of all within her end quote, she will duly justify her advocates who throughout the centuries have been quote, maintaining that with equal husbandry the woman were an equal to the man end, quote. end of chapter twelve part one Section twenty six of Woman and Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Lee. Woman and Science by John Augustine Zahm. Chapter twelve, part two. Not the least of the contributing factors to woman's intellectual growth, and especially to her future achievements in science, are the recent adjustments for women in social and economic conditions brought about chiefly by far-reaching changes in the industrial world even so late as the last half of the nineteenth century the energies of women when they were not engaged in the kitchen or the nursery were spent on the domestic loom spinning wheel and the knitting needle all the various processes from carding the wool to making it into clothing for all the members of the family were in the hands of the housewife foods and cereals which do away with so much of the drudgery of the kitchen were unknown electricity which has proved to be such a remarkable aid in every modern home was little more than a mysterious force that was utilized in the electric telegraph most of the domestic labor-saving machines were still in their infancy and possessed by but few people large fortunes were confined to only a favored few in our great metropolises the mass of the people was preoccupied with the struggle for existence but science the spirit of invention and the advent of the age of machinery have completely changed the conditions of life which obtained but a generation ago they have not only opened up for women countless occupations that were undreamed of in their mother's time but have also given to tens of thousands of them the necessary means and leisure to indulge their tastes for study and research and enabled an ever-increasing number of them to realize their aspirations for achieving distinction in the divers departments of scientific research as an instance of this marked change in the intellectual activity of women we need only consider what an important part they now take in our present prodigious literary output as compared with their share in similar work but a few decades ago as authors as writers and readers in the editorial rooms of our leading periodicals as contributors to learned journals and reviews dealing with every branch of science even the most obtruse they now occupy a conspicuous place and are doing work that is quite as creditable as that of men and it is no longer necessary in deference to public sentiment for them to write under a pseudonym for it is no longer considered unfeminine as it was in the time of the bronte sisters for women to acknowledge themselves the authors of books or of articles in magazines if they elect to devote their lives to literary or scientific work they will not be deterred from so doing by what mrs grundy may say or by the fear that some feeble imitator of moliere may dub them as precious ridicule the value of their productions like those of men is gauged solely by merit and not by any narrow-minded considerations of the author's sex so also will it be in all other occupations where women choose to gain their livelihood by devoting themselves to scientific pursuits rather than to manual labor or to secretarial work in the counting-room there are positions open for them in colleges universities and the government service where as professors or experts in every branch of science their talents have full liberty of action and where they have the same opportunity of achieving distinction in their chosen life work as have their male colleagues in germany there are today a million more women than men it is the same in england in france the number of women who are widows or unmarried or divorcees or mothers with full-grown children aggregates no less than four and a half million a similar condition obtains in other parts of europe 
A large percentage of this number is without home ties, and, as the old fields of labor are no longer open to women, they are forced to find new ones. They naturally demand the privilege of exercising their talents in occupations which are more congenial to them. Many have no inclination for any of the avocations in the industrial or commercial world, but have a very decided inclination as well as talent for scientific pursuits. Hence the ever-increasing number of women who seek employment in chemical and biological laboratories in museums and astronomical observatories, as well as aspire to professorships of science in schools and colleges. From this large number of votaries of science some are sure to achieve distinction in their calling and to contribute materially to the advancement of knowledge. In the course of time the number of those, like Madame Curie, Madame Coudreau, Mary Kingsley, Sonia Kovalevsky, Eleanor Ormerod, Caroline Herschel, Zelia Nuttall, Harriet Boyd Hawes, Donna Ercilia Borvatio, Sophia perez Lawewa, to name only a few, who will become prominent as chemists, explorers, naturalists, mathematicians, entomologists, astronomers, archaeologists, biologists, will be vastly increased, for women will find a greater stimulus for such work and more numerous demands for their service in the constantly expanding sphere of scientific research. Many women will, doubtless, become specialists in some specific branch of science, particularly if they have a genuine love for it, or be fired by an ambition to achieve fame as discoverers. But it is not probable that they will ever specialize to the same extent as men do. For men, scientific work has to a large extent become a métier, and success, as in industry, depends on a division of labor. Hence it is that their field of investigation is daily becoming more and more circumscribed. This is observable in all the sciences, but especially in such all-embracing sciences as chemistry, biology, and archaeology. A man now does well if he master a single branch of any of these sciences, and is hailed as exceptionally fortunate if he succeed in making some notable discovery in his limited field of research. So great, indeed, has been the activity of scientific men in every department of science during the last half-century, and so thoroughly have they explored the most hidden recesses of nature, that it, at times seems as if there were but little left to discover. A prominent scientist recently well expressed the difficulty of making any striking additions to our knowledge of nature by asserting that all great discoveries would hereafter be made in the sixth place of decimals. This statement is well illustrated by the delicate instruments that were required to isolate such rare elements as radium, polonium, helium, and neon, which occur only in infinitesimal quantities. While men of science will be forced to continue as specialists as long as the love of fame, to consider no other motives of research, continues to be a potent influence in their investigations, it is probable that women will have less love for the long and tedious processes involved in the more difficult kinds of specialization. They will, it seems likely, be more inclined to acquire general knowledge of the whole circle of the sciences, a knowledge that will enable them to take a comprehensive survey of nature and it will be fortunate for themselves as well as for the men who must perforce remain specialists if they elect to do so. For nothing gives falser views of nature as a whole, nothing more unfits the mind for a proper apprehension of higher and more important truths, nothing more incapacitates one for the enjoyment of the masterpieces of literature or the sweeter amenities of life than the narrow occupation of a specialist who sees nothing in the universe but electrons, microbes, and protozoa. But just at the critical moment, when men of science would rather discover a process than a law, when they are so preoccupied with the infinitely little that they lose sight of the cosmos as a whole, when their attention is so riveted on particular phenomena that they will no longer have aptitude for rising from effects to causes, when they cease to have any interest in general ideas and stray away from the guidance of the true philosophic spirit, when, like Plato's cavemen, they have so long groped in darkness that their powers of vision are impaired, then it is that woman, the herald of a brighter race, comes to the rescue and holds up to their astonished gaze the picture of an ideal world whose existence they had almost forgotten. For women, as a rule, love science for its own sake, and, unlike the specialists in question, they are, in its pursuit, rarely actuated by any selfish or mercenary interests, or by the hope of financial reward. Precise and never-ending observations with a microscope and spectroscope, which at best give them but a superficial knowledge of certain details of science, while it leaves them in ignorance of the greater and better part of it, do not appeal to them. 
they prefer general ideas to particular facts and love to roam over the whole realm of science rather than confine themselves to one of its isolated corners women writes monsieur etienne lamy the distinguished french academician group themselves at the center of human knowledge whereas men disperse themselves towards its outer boundaries while men are always pushing analysis to its utmost limits women are seeking a synthesis while men are becoming more technical women are becoming more intellectual they are better placed to observe the correlations of the different sciences and to subordinate them to the common and unique source of truth from which they all descend we seem indeed to be approaching a time when women will become the conservers of general ideas in the preceding chapter reference was made to the fact that women are naturally inclined to adopt the deductive method in their search for truth when men would employ only the inductive method this disposition of theirs to arrive at conclusions by a kind of intuition coupled with their more pronounced idealism is sure to react favorably on men and prevent them from becoming so involved in mere facts and phenomena as to cause them to forget that it is as important to reason well as to observe well that the fundamental principles of a true philosophy are quite as necessary for the eminent man of science as they are to the trustworthy historian or commanding statesman from what has been said it is clear that man's ideal the woman of the future will be quite different from what it was but a little more than a century ago when dr johnson could say that any acquaintance with books among women was distinguished only to be censured it will be quite different from the ideal woman as portrayed by poets and novelists for centuries past for among the thousands of women painted by our leading writers of fiction poets and dramatists there are few if any outside of those sketched by tennyson in the princess who are distinguished for their learning or for their love in intellectual pursuits even portia shakespeare's most learned woman was according to her own confession but an unlessoned girl unschooled unpracticed and the heroines of the novelist far from being women who had a thirst for knowledge or were eager to sound the abyss of science and the secrets of the mind were those only whose chief attractions were physical graces and charms affectionate natures brilliant wit together with sweet laughs for bird notes and blue eyes for a heaven now however that women after ages of struggle are beginning to experience a sense of intellectual freedom before unknown and to exult in the fact that knowledge is now no more a fountain sealed now that they are for the first time beginning in every civilized nation to realize their age-long aspirations for unimpeded opportunity in all the activities of the intellect now that they are no longer dismissed in shame to live no wiser than their mothers household stuff live chattels laughing stocks of time we may expect soon to see a marked change in the character of the ideal woman as depicted in literature and as desired by the intelligent portion of mankind but woman's liberation from intellectual bondage and her freedom to devote herself to scientific pursuits mean for the future of humanity is difficult at present to adequately forecast that it will contribute immensely to the betterment of social conditions and to the elevation of the masses of humanity there can be no doubt setting free the imprisoned energies of one half of our race means more than doubling mankind's capacity for advancement for the failure to utilize woman's vast energies pining for an outlet acted as a drag on man's own potentialities and thus retarded to an untold extent the world's advancement in times past as has aptly been said an enormous part of the brain power of mankind has been spent or wasted in smiting the philistines hip and thigh an enormous part of the brain power of womankind has been spent in conjoling samson it will mean that the women of the future will be more suitable companions for the rapidly increasing number of highly educated men of science that having their intellects developed peri passu with those of men they will be able to sympathize with the noblest aims of their husbands and assist them in their most important undertakings as did the wives of huber lavoisier pasteur huxley louis agassiz and others scarcely less renowned in the annals of science it will mean that they will not only share in the joys and the sorrows of their life companions but that they will also have a part in their thoughts their studies their labors their achievements for one should bear in mind that the first essential to a perfect union of hearts is a perfect harmony of minds where neither husband nor wife is educated the virtues may suffice for companionship but where the man is educated and the woman is ignorant there are sooner or later estrangements and the wife becomes little better than an old japanese conception of her a cook without pay 
or a pasha's toy for an idle hour. Crisald in Molière's Les Côtes des Femmes declares, qu'il est assez ennuyeux que je crois de voir toute sa vie en bête avec soi. A briefer and truer statement of the evils of unequal intellectual mating was never penned. Men of intelligence are no longer, like Rousseau, satisfied with an ignorant domestic for a wife, and still less are they disposed with Schopenhauer to regard women as an incurable Philistine, and as a mere intermediary between a child and a man. They have learned by sad experience that it is contrary both to justice and public policy to impose artificial restrictions on the acquisition of knowledge by women, or to close to the vigorous and capable representatives of their sex careers which are open to the weakest and most incompetent men. History has taught them that the fall of Greece and Rome was owing to the failure of these nations to make due provision for the mental development of women and women know that it was because of the inability of the wives of the athenians to enter into the thoughts of their highly educated husbands and to sympathize with their aims and appreciate their achievements that caused the men to leave them in their solitude and seek in the companionship of the hetere the intellectual atmosphere which was wanting in their own homes they know too that the lack of knowledge in the wife and the absence of virtue in the hetere which brought such disasters on the most learned and most cultured of nations are still evils to be guarded against that one of the means over and above moral rule and revealed truth of safeguarding their own interests and preserving the sanctity of the home is to make themselves by knowledge and culture the intellectual equals of their consorts they realize also that if they are to attain the highest measure of success as wives and mothers a broad and thorough education a knowledge of science as well as familiarity with art and literature and the teachings of religion is essential to them for their children's sake it is said that the hands that rock the cradle rules the world but how much truer is it that the domestic earth is the first of schools and the best of lecture rooms for here the heart will cooperate with the mind the affections with the reasoning power it is only when the mothers of this the woman's century shall dispute with men the primacy of erudition when they shall prove their mastery of those newer sciences by which our age set such great store when they shall possess seraphic intellect and force to seize and throw the doubts of man that their grown-up sons will have the same confidence in their intelligence as they now have in their hearts then only will mothers be properly equipped for developing the character of their children for inspiring them with the love of the truth the beautiful and the good for stimulating their talents and aiding them to attain all the sublimities of knowledge for assisting them in doubt and despondency and firing them with an ambition to strive for supreme excellence in all that makes for the nobility of manhood and the glory of womanhood for making them as beatrice made dante after he was renewed and purified in the waters of unoy fit to mount up to the stars puro e disposto a salere alle stile the romantic idea of treating woman as a clinging vine and thus eliminating half the energies of humanity is rapidly disappearing and giving place to the idea that the strong are for the strong the intellectually strong that the evolution of the race will be complete only when men and women shall be associated in perfect unity of purpose and shall in fullest sympathy collaborate for the attainment of the highest and the best then indeed will man's helpmate become to him and to his children more rich than the pearls of ind or gold of ophir and in her sex more wonderful and rare then will men and women for the first time fully supplement each other in their aspirations and endeavors and realize somewhat of that oneness of heart and mind which was so beautifully adumbrated in plato's androgen then will the world witness the return of another golden age the golden age of science the golden age of cultured noble perfect womanhood then to all who really think and love will be manifest the clearness and power of vision of england's great poet laureate when in matchless numbers he sings the woman's cause is man's they rise or sink together dwarfed or godlike bond or free for woman is not undeveloped man but diverse could we make her as the man sweet love were slain his dearest bond is this not like to like but like indifference yet in the long years liker must they grow the man be more of woman she of man he gain in sweetness and in moral height nor lose the wrestling thews that throw the world. She mental breadth, nor fail in childward care, nor lose the childlike in the larger mind, till at the last she set herself to man, 
like perfect music unto noble words and as these twain upon the skirts of time sit side by side full summed in all their powers dispensing harvest sowing the to be self-reverent each and reverencing each distinct in individualities but like each other even as those who love then comes the statelier eden back to men then reign the world's great bridles chaste and calm then springs the crowning race of humankind may these things be end of woman in science by john augustine zom